Prior to qualification for the 1966 FIFA World Cup in England, FIFA found itself in the middle of a controversy and a headache. In 1964, 31 African nations threatened to boycott the tournament to protest a 1964 FIFA ruling that required the three second round winners from the African zone to enter a playoff round against the winners of the Asian zone in order to even qualify for the World Cup. CAF felt that winning their zone was enough in and of itself to merit qualification and wished for the tournament to be expanded. African nations returned for the World Cups in the 1970s with one representative in each tournament, Morocco in 1970, Zaire in 1974 and Tunisia in 1978. They were all eliminated at the group stage before the World Cup was finally expanded to 24 teams in 1982, allowing for a guaranteed two African nations. With the 32 team era beginning in 1998, the world's biggest continent has been afforded five nations, as the likes of Cameroon in 1990, Senegal in 2002, and Ghana in 2010 have equaled Africa's best showing, a quarter final finish. FIFA president Stanley Rue attempted to prove to the world that the World Cup wasn't a European. South American affair. After wrangling with UA for the tournament was expanded to 24 teams with a guaranteed 14 European nations admitted. Five nations made their World Cup debut in England, two of which from Africa in Ghana and Tunisia, who became the first African nation to qualify for a World Cup since Egypt in 1934. Much was expected of Ghana's golden generation whilst Tunisia were expected to bow out at the first possible opportunity. In the tournament's second day, the North Africans met France in only the 10th anniversary of Tunisia's independence from the country. Tunisia won the hearts and minds of Europe, holding France to a nil-nil draw. It was the first time an African side had avoided defeat in a World Cup match, but Tunisia were promptly thrashed in the following contest against hosts England. As predicted, Tunisia bowed out at the first round, losing their final game to Mexico but did so with their heads held high. In Group B, North Korea stunned the world by qualifying from the first group phase ahead of Czechoslovakia, while Scotland's golden generation qualified alongside them. Joining them in the final 12 second group phase from Group C were West Germany and Italy prevailing over Chile and Costa Rica, as did Soviet Union and Hungary in Group D, and Pelé led Brazil into the second phase, joining Portugal ahead of George Best's Northern Ireland and Spain. The second African nation, Ghana, opened the scoring against Argentina, giving the South Americans an almighty scare in the first round. Argentina would roll back to win comfortably, however, and that trend continued into their next game with fellow debutants Norway leading, but unfortunately falling to defeat. Ghana would finish with three defeats from three, as Wales controversially won out 3-2 courtesy of two dodgy penalty decisions. The second phase featured four groups of three, with the winner gaining access to the semi-finals. Those sides would be hosts England, who pipped Italy on goal difference, Scotland, as they defeated a Pelé-less Brazil, courtesy of a Dennis Law fantastic performance, Argentina on goal difference from West Germany, and Portugal, who came back to defeat North Korea 5-3. In a fiery encounter, hosts England vanquished Argentina to ensure that the Wembley final would be an all-British affair after Dennis Law outscored Eusebio at Old Trafford. Martin Peters looked to have scored the vital winner on 78 minutes until Dennis Law levelled the final up with 7 minutes to play. And then on the counter-attack, Jeff Hurst funded in an effort into the top corner. England 2, Scotland 1, some people were on the pitch they knew it was all over. The 1970 World Cup in Mexico would be considered the greatest tournament of all time, in spite of the continued fears that 24 teams would dilute the quality. From Africa, Morocco conquered all to make their first World Cup, whilst via a playoff with South Korea, Nigeria made their World Cup debut. Morocco had a glorious chance of progression, lumped in with Bulgaria and Paraguay. However, the tournament would begin with a draw against the South Americans. West Germany, considered among the favourites to win the whole thing, romped to first, whilst Morocco's fate hinged on a final group match with Bulgaria. The Europeans won out to qualify in less than stellar fashion. 
the luck of the draw wasn't handed to Nigeria either, as they were gifted pre-tournament favourites Brazil, as well as tough outfit Yugoslavia. Nigeria, like Morocco, had an advantageous opener, but unfortunately fell to Greece, whilst Yugoslavia confirmed their progression alongside Brazil with a 3-2 win over their European counterparts. Throughout the 1970s, many began to question Africa's place on the world stage, considering that their five representatives failed to qualify through the first stage. 1974's sole representation came from Zaire, and after shipping 14 goals in a group of death with the Netherlands, Brazil and Portugal, the matter worsened. However, FIFA would not budge, with both Egypt and Tunisia qualifying for the 1978 World Cup, which late on in the day transferred its hosting rights from Argentina to Brazil, following the former host's troubles. Whilst Egypt lost all three group contests, Tunisia became the first African nation to qualify for a new 16-team knockout phase, thanks to a 3-0 thrashing of Bulgaria. Unfortunately, they were fed the West Germans in the last 16 and shipped three goals of their own. They would miss out on the first ever 32-team World Cup in 1982, which was hosted by Spain, but in Africa, they would continue to have a representative in the knockout stage forevermore. Algeria shocked the world with Africa's greatest result at a World Cup in their 1982 opening match with West Germany, winning 2-1 on the way to top in their group. They would unfortunately fall at the quarter-final stage to England as Tony Woodcock bagged a double. Regardless, they had become the first African nation to make a World Cup quarter-final. That would not be repeated in the following tournament. However, both 1986 and 1990 were significant, for multiple African sides reaching the knockout phase. In 1986, Algeria, Morocco and Tunisia would all reach the last 16, but ultimately bow out to France, England and Mexico respectively. Four years on in Italy, Algeria made the last 16 for a third year in succession, only for goals from Mark Wright and Gary Lineker of England to confirm their elimination. However, 1990 was well known for Africa's second quarter-finalists, Cameroon. Roger Miller had danced through the defences of Argentina, Romania and the United Arab Emirates in a perfect group stage, and bagged two more against a fractured Dutch side in the last 16. They were a whisker away from the semi-finals too, but were unfortunately dispatched via West Germany and the penalty shootout. We wouldn't have to wait too long for an African semi-finalist at the World Cup, however. Morocco made another knockout phase, but were resoundingly defeated by Roberto Baggio Hattrick. Cameroon repeated their heroics of 1990, but fell to Brazil in the quarter-final. The African owners therefore fell to Nigeria. Nigeria had scored the odd goal in five against Uruguay, pipped United States in the quarter-finals and took Italy all the way to extra time in the semi-final. Unfortunately, the eventual champions were Roberto Baggio and Italy, the talisman scoring both of Italy's goals in a 2-1 win. Shortly after a 1998 World Cup where Cameroon, Nigeria and Tunisia all made the last 16, FIFA announced that the World Cup would be going to Africa for the first time in 2006, where South Africa were penned to host the tournament. In the meantime, Tunisia made the last 16 in quick succession in the Far East, while Senegal did likewise in their debut tournament. Both would be defeated, however. As would Ghana and Ivory Coast at the hands of France and Italy respectively in 2006, while South Africa unfortunately bowed out at the group phase. Algeria in 2014 and Senegal in 2018 would carry the hopes of African football, but fall some way short in last 16 exits to England and France respectively. The closest we ever got to an African finalist in the World Cup came in 2010, a tournament hosted by England. Ghana had scraped through to the last 16 thanks to a draw against Switzerland at Villa Park and through the bodies of the United States and South Korea and the goals of Sully Ali Muntari and Asamo Jian, Ghana found themselves in the semi-finals. Like Nigeria in 1994, Ghana took the semi-final to extra time. They were level right up until the 117th minute before Andres Iniesta stuck the dagger into Ghanaian hearts on the way to lifting their first ever World Cup. Ten days in the summer of 1958 set the precedent for the magnificent career of Pele. The 17-year-old Brazilian was joint second highest scorer at the 1958 World Cup. Brazil had cruised through the group stages without a single goal from the teenager, but the knockout stage wins over Wales and France were achieved almost single-handedly from Pele. 
A single goal in the quarter-final was followed by a hat-trick against a superb French side five days later. Pele would score two in the final against Sweden. He would miss a large chunk of Brazil's 1962 World Cup victory, having been injured in a match against Czechoslovakia. Come 1966, Brazil had the likes of Garincha and the young trio of Gerson, Jairzinho and Tostout in the approach for the World Cup in England. Ready to beat the world for an unprecedented third tournament in a row, Brazil drew former finalists Hungary as well as Bulgaria and debutantes Portugal in the group. Pelé scored in the opener against Bulgaria but was essentially kicked around the pitch and was subsequently out of the second game against Hungary, in which Brazil lost 3-1. Brazil needed to better Hungary's win over Bulgaria and unlike 1962, Pelé was back from injury. Portugal proceeded to kick Pelé out of the game and won 3-1. Brazil were out of the first stage for only the second time in their history, a record that still stands today. Pelé would push himself to play in the 1970 World Cup. He scored the first goal in the 1970 final win over Italy and became the only player to win three World Cup titles. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Pele didn't get injured in the 1966 World Cup. Pele strode out on the Goodison Park turf to play Bulgaria on the night of July 12th, 1966. Within a quarter of an hour he had grabbed his first goal and Brazil sauntered to a victory. Pele survived unscathed without injury, despite the opponent's best efforts. Hungary burst into a 1-0 lead two minutes into Brazil's next group game. It didn't last long. Between Jairzinho, Pele and Garincha, Brazil blitzed the Hungarians, far removed from their magical Magyar's era. Brazil would go on to win 3-1. Four days later it was Brazil vs Portugal, Pele vs Eusebio, the greatest player at the peak of his powers against a new kid on the block, a two-time world champion against a Ballon d'Or and European Cup winner. It finished Eusebio 3, Pele 3. Brazil progressed second behind Portugal on goals scored. Soviet Union at Roca Park laid in wait for the two-time world champions. The legendary Lev Yashin, having conceded just one goal in the entire tournament stood in the way of the legendary number 9. Pele was too much for the Soviet shot-stopper, scoring a hat-trick in a 3-1 route. In a tournament for the legendary centre forwards, joining Pele was Jeff Hurst, Eusebio and Brazil's next opponents West Germany, and their star striker and captain, Uwe Seeler. Helmut Haller wasn't bad either and added his fifth of the tournament in a first half where the West Germans had the Brazilians' number. Tostar was favoured to Grincher in a seemingly bizarre call from the 1958 World Cup winning manager Vicente Faiola. The sudden change from the opening four games paid off in the second half as Pele and Tostar linked up for both goals to overturn the deficit and send Brazil into the final as 2-1 winners. England were missing their star striker in Jimmy Greaves. Standing forward, Jeff Hurst had scored the winner in the quarter-final against Argentina whilst the semi-final was clinched by two goals from Bobby Charlton. Brazil were also well-equipped and in the first half, the aforementioned Englishman as well as Garincha traded off goals in a 2-2 first half. England had yet to be beaten at home by a non-European team. Viola went for all four of his star forwards, with Garincha and Jairzinho wide and tossed down Pele down the middle. The second half was a massacre. Brazil had the Maracanazo, in the 1950 final against Uruguay and England experienced their own version at Wembley in 1966. Pele struck twice in the opening 10 minutes, Jairzinho stuck in Brazil's 5th and Tostao added a 6th and a 7th. 7-2. Brazil won their third successive World Cup and as promised, Pele retired from the international game. Just as England adopted Hungary's tactical practices after 1953 they would evolve again following the humiliation of the 1966 World Cup final. Fate dictated that England and Brazil would be reunited in the group stage of the 1970 World Cup. England lined up in a 4-2-4, matching Brazil with Bobby Charlton and Martin Peters in more advanced roles besides Jeff Hurst and Francis Lee. They played a narrow variant and flooded the Brazilian midfield. Bobby Charlton's double salvo inside 15 minutes was enough to help England to a 2-0 win in Guadalajara. The pele list Brazil were disposed of by West Germany in the quarter-final, whilst England put away successive South Americans in Peru and Uruguay. Another team that had scouted Brazil's 1966 tactics were West Germany. In the 1970 final against England, West Germany was set up with Uwe Seeler and Gerd Muller down the middle with two wingers either side of them. Unlike Brazil, West Germany had the ability to stretch the English far and wide and manipulate the wide and hot Azteca pitch. Gerd Muller struck twice from crosses in the second half in a win for the West Germans. England would never win the World Cup. Brazil would have to wait until 1994, whilst Germany capped a golden generation with successive triumph on home soil in 1974. England losers. The one triumph that England fans can always hark back to whether it's 1998 or 2098 is taken away from them. One last kicking was given to them in 1970 where the inefficiency of English adaptations to tactics shone in the final. West Germany winners. In the grand scheme of things West Germany managed to squeeze in an extra World Cup so by definition they are winners. 
In August 2016, Leroy Sané swapped Gelsenkirchen for the blue half of Manchester for around £40 million. However, Sané's breakout season in England came the following year as Pep Guardiola's second year gifted City a Premier League and a League Cup double. He would score 14 goals and assisted 15 in all competitions. He won the PFA Young Player of the Year. In doing so, Sané became the first German to win the award. Germany had qualified handsomely for the 2018 World Cup that summer, with 10 wins from 10 and would join a favourable group containing Sweden, Mexico and South Korea. Sané was expected to be in Yogi Love's 23-man squad for the tournament with the likes of Julian Brand, Julian Draxler and Mario Gomez preferred. Germany crashed out with losses to South Korea and Mexico, their first ever group stage exit. Sané had his best professional season the year immediately after, securing a domestic treble with Manchester City and netted 16 goals from the wing in another record-breaking campaign under Pep Guardiola. Sané would return to the German setup after the World Cup to help secure qualification for Euro 2020. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Leroy Sané went to the 2018 World Cup. Mario Gomez was a shock exclusion for the tournament in Russia as Leroy Sané was drafted in as an option up front alongside Timo Werner and Thomas Muller. Sané went unused in the opener against Mexico in Moscow in a loss thanks to a Hervin Lozano goal. Sané would get onto the pitch against Sweden, but only on 76 minutes for Marco Reus who started. Reus had scored but the tie was deadlocked at one all going into the final stages. With three minutes to spare, a Thomas Muller cross fizzed across the box and it found Leroy Sané six yards out, a trademark Manchester City finish. Germany's elimination from the World Cup was snatched away by a Sané's late winner. And thanks to the winner, Love granted him a start in the crucial final group match against South Korea. The game was locked at 0-0 going into the final 25 minutes, until Sané threaded a through ball to Timo Werner who found the Korean net. A heavy Sweden win over Mexico in Yekaterinburg confirmed Germany's passage into the round of 16 in second place, with Sweden, Germany and Mexico all level on 6 points. Having played a part in winning 4 of Germany's 6 points, Sané had cemented his place in the 11 for Germany. Brazil were the opponents in the round of 16. Neymar opened the scoring on 51 minutes, but by the time the full-time whistle sounded in the Cosmos Arena in Samara, Germany was celebrating a place in the quarter-finals. Sané added to his assist from the previous game by providing Timo Werner and Julian Brandt with goals in the 87th and 89th minutes in a swift turnaround that left Brazil shell-shocked. Sané would turn from provider into scorer in the second minute against Belgium in Kazan, heading in beyond Thibaut Courtois. Club teammate Kevin De Bruyne turned the game on its head by the half-time break, with a goal of his own, and provided an own goal off the head of Jerome Boateng from a corner. Germany would level from Mats Hummels in the second half, and after a 30-minute period of attrition in extra time, the penalty shootout dawned on both teams. Germany had a supreme record from shootouts, having beaten France in 1982, Mexico in 86, England in Italia 90, and Argentina at 2006 World Cup. Hazard, Werner, Lukaku and Muller all traded goals from the spot before Yannick Carrasco was thwarted by Manuel Neuer. Julian Brandt converted to put Germany in the driving seat. Mertens and De Bruyne left Germany one penalty away from a fifth successive World Cup semi-final. Sané was the fifth designated penalty taker. He sent Courtois the wrong way as he did two hours previously in normal time. Sané's World Cup would end in the semi-finals by eventual winners France, with Samuel Umtiti scoring the winner in St Petersburg. Sané would claim the silver ball award behind Luka Modric. Let's take it to the winners and losers. Germany, winners, because they avoided all of the embarrassment that a first round exit brought them. Mexico, losers, because their streak of making the last 16 that stretched back to 1978 was broken with a group stage exit. Brazil, also losers, because their streak of making the quarterfinals that stretched back all the way to 1990 was broken with a round of 16 exit. And finally, losers, South Korea, because their only competitive win over a reigning world champion was expunged with a 1-0 defeat. Ali McCoist is one of Scotland's footballing legends. He had scored 396 goals in Scottish football and was part of 10 Scottish Premiership winning teams in his 15 years at Ibrox. On the national stage, McCoist's time with Scotland peaked with his final international goal, a winner at Villa Park over Switzerland at Euro 96. It was McCoist's 19th goal for Scotland, and two years later his Scotland career was over, in a 3-2 win over Estonia, four months after the World Cup in France. Scotland had qualified for the 1998 World Cup, as they had done in every international tournament in the 90s, barring the 1994 World Cup. McCoist played in all but one of the nine international tournament games played in the 90s. 
However, by 1998, despite scoring 16 goals in the 97-98 season, Scotland manager Craig Brown left Ali McCoyst out of the tournament setup. McCoyst has since spoken that he was devastated over not going to France 98 and cried over his exclusion from the squad. Meanwhile, Craig Brown had admitted that it was a mistake not to take McCoy to the World Cup. After the World Cup, McCoy saw his career out at the top level of Scottish football, with Kilmarnock before retiring in 2001. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Ali McCoy was picked for Scotland at France 98. The 22-man squad for the World Cup in 1998 was published and Alan McCoy was enlisted ahead of Celtic Simon Donnelly, who had scored 6 from 43 games in the previous season. McCoy was left on the bench in favour of Rangers teammate Gordon Jury in the World Cup curtain racer against Brazil in the Stade de France. Brazil sneaked in a 2-1 win courtesy of a Tom Boydone goal as McCoy was left unused. Morocco and Norway's draw later on in the night left Scotland with more hope going into their next game in Bordeaux against Norway. Havard Flo and Craig Burley exchanged second half goals whilst McCoy looked on from the bench. With the balance of the group resting on this game after Brazil's 3 0 thrashing of Morocco in Nantes, McCoy was thrust into the game with 21 minutes remaining. He rose highest from a corner to head home five minutes later. Scotland saw out the match to clinch the game 2 1. Scotland were in pole position ahead of the final group game in Saint Etienne. Scotland needed a win over Morocco to be certain of qualification, but with tournament favourites and already qualified Brazil playing Norway, Scotland realistically just needed to avoid defeat. McCoy started from the off. Scotland were at their 8th World Cup and they had an uneasy record of the most appearances at a World Cup without progressing out of the group stages. In 1954 they were thrashed 7-0 by Uruguay in Basel and were eliminated without even scoring a goal. In 1958 they were pipped 2-1 by a much fancied French team in the crucial final group game. In 1974, after holding world champions Brazil and beating Zaire, Scotland contrived to draw 1-1 with Yugoslavia. The difference between qualification and elimination was just a single goal. In 1978, they needed a three-goal win over the much-fancied Netherlands and beat them 3-2 thanks to a now-fabled Archie Gemmel goal. It wasn't enough, however. In 1982, they needed a win over the Soviet Union in Malaga, but were held 2-2. In 1986, even with a potential three qualifiers from the group, it didn't stop Scotland from being eliminated at the first hurdle. Needing a win against Uruguay, they drew 0-0 and finished last. And in 1990, they needed a win over Brazil in Turin after the embarrassment of losing to Costa Rica. A fumble from Jim Layton allowed a late Brazilian winner. Back to their game. McCoyce played the full match in what turned out to be a dull 0-0 draw. Scotland had achieved four points. 330 kilometers away, Brazil played Norway in Marseille. Bobeto had broke the deadlock with 12 minutes remaining. Scotland were finally going to the knockout stages of the World Cup as it stood. A potential round of 16 tie against Italy awaited Scotland. An equaliser from Torre Andre Flo seven minutes from time sent shivers down Scottish spines. And then the Brazilian net rippled again on 89 minutes via the penalty spot. Norway had beaten the world champions Brazil, the teams were locked on 4 points and the goal difference of both Scotland and Norway were both dead level on 0. Their games against Morocco became the sickening decider. Both teams were held by Morocco but Norway's 2-2 draw left Scotland on an inferior 3 goal scored compared to Norway's 5. Norway had qualified from the first round of the World Cup for the first time in their history. Meanwhile Scotland has his fate still have to wait for such an accomplishment. Winners, Scotland, because they got to a World Cup but as fated, were eliminated at the group stages like in their previous seven tournaments, but got a lot closer than they did in reality. And the losers, Morocco, because they couldn't even get a win against Scotland who were favourites to finish last. 2002 FIFA World Cup qualification Group 9 England and Germany were locked on 16 points going into their final matches. England hosted 4th place Greece at Old Trafford. Germany played 3rd place Finland in Gelsenkirchen. One team would automatically qualify whilst the other would face the lottery of the playoffs. With Germany expected to win, England needed to match their results to qualify for the World Cup in Japan and South Korea. Teddy Sheringham had equalised Angelos Karasteas' goal, and with Germany level against Finland, it would be enough to qualify. However, Greece hit back almost immediately. The second place team were primed to face Ukraine in a two-legged playoff, and nobody wants that. David Beckham who had missed five free kicks in the match stepped up for his sixth in second half added time. And Beckham provided yet another iconic moment in English football in history, with a sensational free kick. England drew 2-2 at Old Trafford, 
and with Germany being held nil-nil by Finland, England had booked their place in the World Cup. It remains one of the most fondly remembered goals in recent English memory. Germany would qualify via the playoffs and lose to a sumptuous Ronaldo brace in the final in Yokohama, with England being ejected from the tournament by the same Brazilian team at the quarter-final stage. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if David Beckham didn't score that magical last minute free kick versus Greece. The ball sailed over the bar, England lost 2-1 and Germany limped into the World Cup after a stalemate with Finland. The playoff with Ukraine it was, a 1-0 loss in Kiev. Ukraine took a 1-0 lead to Old Trafford in the second leg. On 90 minutes after a drab 0-0 stalemate, David Beckham won and elected to take a free kick 30 yards from goal. He got Old Trafford to their feet with a last ditch goal that equalised the aggregate score at one all. Extra time came and went. Andrei Shevchenko, as he would do in the 2003 Champions League final, struck the winner in a shootout win at Old Trafford. England were out. Ukraine kicked off their first World Cup in Saitama against Sweden. What looked to be an Andrei Shevchenko first half winner was equalised by Nicholas Alexanderson. Ukraine surrendered to a 2-0 loss against Argentina in the second match that put their qualification on a knife edge going into the final game. Sweden and Argentina contrived to draw, and Ukraine played at a stalemate with Nigeria. Ukraine were out. Argentina would fall to Brazil in the quarterfinals after an impressive win over Denmark. Brazil claimed their fifth World Cup title. Another Mediterranean nation funneled England into qualification playoffs two years later. Turkey's Hakan Suka capitalised on a missed David Beckham penalty with a late winner, leapfrogging England into first place in the 2004 European Championships qualifiers. This time though the three Lions qualified, beating Latvia. Ukraine meanwhile were buoyed by their experiences in the Far East and would pip Greece to a qualification place. In Portugal, England would stumble to qualification for the quarterfinals with a Wayne Rooney double in a 2-2 draw with Croatia. By this point, Ukraine had left the tournament with just a win over Russia to their name, Spain and Portugal qualifying from their group. England, as to be expected, were put out on penalties while Spain upset France in the quarterfinals with a Raoul double in Lisbon. Spain would meet Portugal again in the final after Ivan Helguera secured Spain's place in the final via the silver goal ruling. The solitary Fernando Morientes goal broke Portuguese hearts in Lisbon in the final, as Spain ended 40 years of hurt with a second European Championship. In a shocking show of consistency from England, the 2006 World Cup meant a quarter-final, penalties and Portugal. Ukraine and Spain were paired off in the same group which was essentially decided on match day one with a 4-0 win for Spain. They would both defeat Tunisia and Saudi Arabia easily to qualify for the knockout phase. Sergei Rebrov and Andrei Shevchenko teamed up to take out Switzerland in the last 16 whilst David Villa single-handedly eliminated both France and Brazil in 1-0 victories for Spain that put them into the final four for just the second time. Italy in search for their fourth World Cup title were in the quarter-finals for Ukraine who contrastingly made their first appearance in the knockout phase. A Shevchenko goal was cancelled out by Luka Tony in normal time. The game ebbed towards a penalty shootout. Shevchenko, Artem Milevsky, Andrei Voronin and Sergei Rebrov all converted from the spot to send Ukraine to the semi-finals. Ukraine would face Germany in Dortmund. Ukraine would end their tournament with a win, but it would be in the third place playoff against a weakened Portugal side. Germany had hammered Ukraine 4-0 on their way to a fourth World Cup title with a 2-0 win in the final against Spain. Let's take it to the winners and losers. Ukraine, winners, because they qualify for three successive tournaments off the back of the penalty win in Manchester and made the semi-finals of a World Cup. England, losers, because not only did they underachieve for their golden generation, they didn't even qualify for the 2002 World Cup. Italy and Greece, more losers, because their triumphs in 2004 and 2006 vanished. And finally the winners, Spain and Germany, because they were triumphing in 2004 and 2006 at the expense of Greece and Italy. Thanks to the Algerian War of Independence from 1958 to 1962, Algeria were footballing minnows. After the breakaway from France, they won two games in three World Cup qualification campaigns. They had a solitary African Nations Cup campaign to their name, going out of the group stages thanks to losses to Ethiopia and the Ivory Coast. By 1980 though, Algeria had the likes of Lakhtar Baloumi and Tej Bansola, both netted twice at that spring's African Nations Cup where Algeria made it to the final in Lagos, but they were beaten 3-0 by Nigeria. Two years later, Algeria had reached the final stage of the World Cup qualification where, in the same Surilaire Stadium in Lagos, Algeria vanquished bad memories of 1980 by beating Nigeria 2-0. They won 4-1 on aggregate. They were going to Spain. They were prepared by playing former European Cup winners Real Madrid and Benfica. They were drawn the European champions and two-time world champions West Germany, Chile and Austria. 
West Germany boasted two of the world's best players at the time, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge and Paul Breitner. June 16, 1982, Algeria stunned the West Germans 2-1 with a winning goal from Lakdar Baloumi. Man of the match and Algerian defender Chabé Merzakan recalled, One German player even said that he would play against us with a cigar in his mouth. After all, who has ever heard of a German team that doesn't do its homework? West Germany picked up the piece with a win over Chile whilst Algeria floundered against Austria. Algeria recovered to beat Chile, 3-2 on June 24th though. Unfortunately, this gave West Germany and Austria enough time to sign the Nick Tan Griffs backed von Gijon, the non-aggression pact of Gijon to you and I. With one game to play this is how the group stood. Austria had 4 points from 2 games, Algeria 4 from 3 and West Germany 2 points from as many games. Chile had lost all 3, let's forget about Chile. The El Molinon Stadium in Gijon, June the 25th. West Germany started in the most West German man imaginable. Efficient, attacking, penetrative. Horst Hubrex found the net inside 10 minutes. They were to take the game by the scruff of the neck. The Algeria loss was forgotten. The game was a matter of by how many they would win. And then nothing. 80 minutes of turgid, plodding passes. No attempts on goal. No attempts to hide the non-aggression pact. West Germany needing just a win to qualify as group winners qualified with the 1-0 win. Austria needing anything less than a two-goal loss, qualified too. The backlash was inevitable. Commentator Eberhard Stanjek refused to commentate on the game for long stretches of time. A local Gijon newspaper printed the match report the following day in the crime section. Angry Algerians in attendance threw money at the players, the Spanish in the crowd chanted for Algeria and shouted let them kiss at the 22 co-conspirators on the pitch. A West German even burned the national flag in the aftermath. It was labelled the disgrace of Gijon. West Germany's manager Jupp Dowell defended the team, stating that they took the foot off the pedal due to Karl-Heinz Rummenigge's lack of fitness. Neither team were punished, West Germany reached the final where justice was served in the form of a loss to Italy. Algeria would have to wait until 2014 to reach the knockout stages of the World Cup where they of course faced Germany. Germany would progress, going on to win the tournament. As a result of the disgrace of Gijon, FIFA and UEFA would ensure that final group stage matches be played at the same time, from Euro 1984 onwards. It eradicated most potential match fixing, but not all. We'll get on to you, Denmark and Sweden, and 2004 in a future episode. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly, and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... The disgrace of Gijon never happened. West Germany blitzed the Austrians with a 10 minute barrage of attacks. Austria having scraped through wins over Algeria and Chile, were at the mercy of the West German captain Karl-Heinz Rummenigge. The Bayern Munich forward who had led West Germany to the European Championships two years prior was fresh off a hat-trick against Chile. He scored two more in Gijon. Austria were defeated 4-0. Algerians in the ground rejoiced. They qualified in second place behind West Germany. Such was the nature of the 1982 World Cup. The second round draw was devised of four groups of three. West Germany were drawn England and Spain, whilst Algeria were fed France and Northern Ireland. Due to the energy and overworking of a long season, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge was ruled out for the rest of the tournament through injury. They were picked apart by Spain and England as Spain qualified for the final four in their home tournament. Meanwhile, Algeria were fresh 3-0 at the Vicente Calderon, which was largely decked out in Algerian green and white. Later that week, the Spaniards in attendance became their 12th man in a 2-1 win over Northern Ireland. Due to the nature of a three-team group, France's final game with Northern Ireland was contested three days later. France and Algeria were locked on two points apiece. France needed to avoid a two-goal loss to Northern Ireland. They played out a dull 0-0 draw. Algeria were eliminated and returned home heroes. Karl-Heinz Rummenigge returned from injury to the West German team the following year with a mountain to climb to qualify for Euro 1984. In his absence, West Germany had dropped points in Northern Ireland, Turkey and Austria. Northern Ireland would pip Germany to qualification by goal difference. Norman Whiteside and Jerry Armstrong starred in the tournament, waking it all the way to the semi-final with wins over Portugal and Romania. They would be eliminated by eventual winners and hosts, France. The Green and White Army qualified for Mexico 86 in a collision course with Algeria. Both teams had been picked off by Spain and Brazil and if either side could muster a win, they would progress. They drew one all. Meanwhile, on the other half of the draw, West Germany had bounced back from their embarrassment of not being able to defend their European Championship. They had been humbled 1-0 by Uruguay in the opener before two Rudy Volley goals earned them a win over Scotland. Two late, sickening goals from Denmark in the final game left them hanging in the balance. West Germany awaited the result of Uruguay vs Scotland the following day. The standings were as follows. Denmark had qualified, Uruguay had all but qualified with two points with a game to spare. Germany also had two points but relied on Uruguay defeating Scotland. Scotland had one point, they needed to get something. 
Uruguay simply needed to avoid loss by 6 goals or more. Scotland's goal difference was minus 1 whilst Germany's was minus 2. Anything but a loss for Scotland would qualify both Uruguay and Scotland. A non-aggression pact was made. 90 minutes in the Mexican heat, Uruguay and Scotland succeeded in keeping the score at 0-0. BBC cut the feed of the match at half time for a repeat of Only Fools and Horses. The daily record called for Alex Ferguson's resignation, but the Scottish contingent in Mexico were delighted for the nation's first qualification out of the group stages. West Germany were eliminated. Almost as an act of karma, Scotland were destroyed 5-0 by Argentina in the round of 16, and Uruguay would go on to be embarrassed by Morocco at the same stage. FIFA and UEFA belatedly agreed to play their final group stage fixtures in their competition simultaneously from Euro 88 onwards. Let's check out the winners and losers. West Germany, mainly losers, because they were hampered by Karl-Heinz Rummenigge's injury, bowing out at the second group stage in 1982, as well as failing to qualify for Euro 84. They were further embarrassed at the 1986 World Cup by Scotland and Uruguay. Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, another loser, because he has lost his place in the West German and Bayern Munich teams. He was forced to play out the remainder of his career at Swiss club Servette from 1983 to 1989. He would be selected for the 1986 World Cup but would not see any action. Algeria, big winners, because regardless of their showing at the 1982 World Cup, they were always going to be winners. But for a flawed format at the 1982 World Cup, Algeria might have made the knockout stages of the tournament. Fans will always remember that first win over West Germany though. Northern Ireland, winners, because hashtag GAWA were at their hottest in the early 80s and exploited Rummenigge's injury in Euro 84 qualification. The likes of Whiteside and Armstrong dragged them kicking and screaming to the semi-finals where only the wizardry of Michel Platini could defeat them. Spain, the biggest winners, because they had eliminated Olympian West Germany and a path to the final via England and France were clear. The momentum upset the Italians in the final with Marco Tardelli and Paolo Rossi in their ranks. Spain were world champions in 1982 and were European finalists in 1984. November the 17th, 1993, the Parc de Prance in Paris, France versus Bulgaria, a straight shootout for qualification to the 1994 World Cup in America. France needed a simple point to qualify for the tournament, whilst Bulgaria were in search of all three points. Bulgaria had won the first fixture between the two 14 months prior in Sofia, Aristo Stoichkov and Krasimir Balakov with the goals. In Paris, however, Eric Cantona fired him from close range after Jean-Pierre Papin cushioned a header down to him. Following Sweden's draw with Austria a week prior, the win would send France to the top of the group, with the top two teams qualifying. Just six minutes later, however, Bulgaria were level through Emil Kanstadinov. The two sides played out the remainder of the match with the scores locked at 1-1 and France a final whistle away from the World Cup. And then an overhit cross from David Ginola just 15 seconds left in normal time allowed for a Bulgaria breakaway. By the time the clock ebbed from 89 minutes 59 seconds into 90 minutes, Konstadinov cracked the second Bulgaria goal in off the bar. There was no time for France to respond, Bulgaria were going to the World Cup. Prior to 1994 they had been to five World Cup tournaments and failed to record even a single win. The likes of Konstadinov, Lechkov, Ivanov and most importantly Haristo Stoichkov gifted Bulgaria their first win on the world stage, a 4-0 demolition of Greece. Four days later, Bulgaria produced the scalp of the tournament, beating a Maradonalus Argentina 2-0 to climb above them into second place. Bulgaria coupled a win over the finalists from 1990 with a win over the world champions in the quarterfinals, goals from Stoichkov and Lechkov at Giant Stadium giving Bulgaria an unlikely place in the semi-final. Bulgaria were undone by a Roberto Baggio masterclass and finished in fourth, whilst France sat at home and watched Brazil beat Italy in the final. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if France qualified for the 1994 World Cup. Lizarazu, Djorkaev, Carambeau, Cantona, Papin, Blanc, Leboeuf, Deschamps, Desailly and Ginola. France's team was stacked heading into the tournament where they drew Nigeria, Greece and Argentina. Whilst Diego Maradona dragged Argentina to two impressive wins over Greece and Nigeria, Eric Cantona and Jean-Pierre Papin combined to secure successive 2-1 wins over the same opponents. The showdown in Dallas went to the wire as Argentina without Maradona laboured to a 2-2 draw with a late Gabriel Batistuta equaliser. Argentina and France remained on a collision course despite the result. 
Batistuta secured a 1-0 win over Italy on the same day that Yari Jarkayev secured the winner against Mexico. 1-0 wins would become a theme for the two nations. France picked off Germany with a 90th minute Jean-Pierre Papin penalty, whilst Argentina put Spain to the sword through an own goal. Despite the chaotic 2-2 draw between the two sides, defensively they had otherwise been solid. So in the semi-finals typical of the stoic defences, it was settled by a single goal. The goal wasn't to be found in the opening 90 minutes however, but through a 103rd minute volley from Jean-Pierre Papin, his fifth of the tournament. One more goal would sit the Frenchman alongside Oleg Selenko, who had six to his name. France continued the theme of their tournament. A penalty shootout followed a 0-0 draw at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. Cantona and Papin funded their penalties in, as did Deschamps. However, David Ginola stepping up with France's fourth penalty put the ball into orbit, and with that, France had lost their first World Cup final. Their next final would be two years on at Euro 96, turning their penalty heartbreak into celebration with a 7-6 win over Czech Republic in the semi-final. They will be beaten, however, by Germany in the final. As the 20th century became the 21st, France straddled the new millennium with two more finals, turning two defeats into two victories through goals from Zinedine Zidane and David Ginola in a 3-0 revenge win over Brazil in Paris, and a David Trezeguet golden goal against Italy in Rotterdam. Winners First of all Nigeria because they became the first African nation to make the final four of a World Cup after beating Romania and Sweden after finishing third in their group. They would eventually lose to Brazil. Next Argentina because like Nigeria they exchanged a real life round of 16 exit for a showing at the semi-final in 1994 before losing to France. And our last winner France because they would dominate finals between 1994 and 2000. Our only losers Bulgaria because they didn't have their day in the sun with Aristo Stoichkov and a semi-final finish in 1994. Oh, it's so far in! Was it FIFA don't want? Technology. Thanks very much, Seth Latter. Well, I hope he's here. I hope he's squirming in his seat, by the way. Fabio Capello and Frank Lampard's celebrations were cut short. David Beckham remonstrated with the officials. For a moment, England had overturned a two-goal deficit in the round of 16 with Germany in a matter of minutes. Matthew Upson headed in from a set piece and Frank Lampard took a superb volley in off the crossbar. Something was amiss. Manuel Neuer scrambled to keep the ball alive from a foot or two behind the goal line and Germany broke away. The Uruguayan linesman hadn't seen it, the referee hadn't seen it. Goal line technology as we know it now would not come into place at a FIFA World Cup for another four years. Germany still led 2-1. England's World Cup campaign in 2010 was already precarious going into the contest with Fabio Capello at the helm. A Rob Green fumble against USA and a Wayne Rooney full-time tirade against Algeria left England with two points from two games. They met Slovenia in Port Elizabeth in the final group game and salvaged a 1-0 win via Jermaine Defoe to qualify. England were drawn Germany in the last 16. The only chance England were given was that the German side was one of inexperience. Sami Khedir, Meza Ozil, Thomas Muller, Jerome Boateng and Manuel Neuer all had 27 international caps between them. None of them had played in an international tournament before. Germany thrashed England 4-1. It was England's biggest World Cup defeat. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... The Blumfontein ghost goal countered and England drew level 2-2. Two, two. two goals in three minutes, England had the momentum. Frank Lampard was galvanised, he bruised past Sami Khedira who fumbled almost immediately from kickoff. A jink past Per Mertesacker and a simple pass. Wayne Rooney found himself through on goal. He had yet to score in a World Cup match. The only headlines he made in South Africa thus far were negative ones. Manuel Neuer stood between him and the goal. Rooney gave him the eyes and added a third goal. Germany limped into half-time trailing 3-2. Germany became desperate for that leveller. More senior members of the team, most notably Mario Gomez, were thrown on in an attempt to force extra time. In flashbacks of 1966, German hope was ripped apart by a fourth England goal on the counter. By not Sir Jeff Hurst, but by Emil Heske. England's quarter-final opponents, Argentina. They had the best player on the planet, Lionel Messi, but he was severely underperforming. The goal-scoring onus had fallen on Carlos Tevez and Gonzalo Higuain. Lionel Messi vs Matthew Upson, there was only one winner. Yes, of course it was the West Ham defender, only on the plane to South Africa because of injury to Rio Ferdinand and Ledley King. And it took just three minutes. Aaron Lennon surged beyond Angel Di Maria and the Benfica winner scythed down the Tottenham man. A set piece. 
the Jabulani landed right on Matthew Upson's forehead and into the net. England led, but still had 8-7 minutes to play, with the fearsome holy trinity of Messi, Tevez and Higuain up front. Capello reverted to a 4-5-1 at half-time with James Milner and Gareth Barry on the wings. Argentina huffed on their puff but they could not blow the English house down. Revenge for 86. England had somehow scraped through into the semi-finals with 19% possession. From Cape Town to Durban, England faced Spain in the semi-finals. Just as in Bloemfontein, the game was over before it begun. David Villa with two clinical goals inside 15 minutes. Unlike Bloemfontein, however, there was no English recovery. The world marvelled at the tiki-taka style of play. Spain thrashed England 4-0, England's biggest World Cup defeat. Spain won the World Cup just as they did with the European Championships in Austria and Switzerland in 2008 and would go on to do in Poland and Ukraine in 2012. The team that stood in Spain's way in the 2012 final was led by an Italian manager, but it wasn't Cesar Prandelli's Italy, it was Fabio Capello's England. England ran roughshod over the European Championships, the defenders head being Julian Lescott and not Matty Upson to take them there though. Lescott put his head on set pieces against France in the group stages and Italy in the quarter-finals. The semi-final was goalless and typically for England it resulted in a semi-final shootout with the Germans. Germany had missed just two penalties in major tournament shootouts and had scored all ten against England. Miroslav Klose did his best Uli Hoeneß impression from 1976 and put his penalty into orbit. Ashley Cole scored the winning penalty and sent the country into raptures. Three days later and an exhausted England were on the receiving end of another 4 0 hiding from Spain. Fabio Capello stepped down at the end of the tournament. Wayne Rooney's golden boot performance at Euro 2012 would earn himself a knighthood. In this overly fantastical scenario, let's check out the Brexit tinted glasses of the winners and losers. Matthew Upson, winner. His performances in the 2010 World Cup earned him a move back to Arsenal in the summer. He was signed instead of Lauren Koscielny. Instead of bumping into Wojciech Szczesny in the 2011 League Cup final, Upson cleared his lines. He single-handedly earned Arsenal the cup on that day against Birmingham. Germany, losers. Their inexperienced squad were dumped out of successive tournaments by England, and it doesn't get more humiliating than that, does it? And finally, England, big winners. Fabio Capello did something the great Sir Alf Ramsey could never do, take England to a major tournament final overseas. Okay, they didn't win Euro 2012, and they got mauled by Spain, but come on, it's England. Cameroon, by definition, had the best team in Africa, as we transitioned from the 20th to the 21st century. They had taken the baton of Nigeria, who performed well at the Olympics and the World Cup, as well as winning the 1994 AFCON. Cameroon had qualified for their first ever World Cup in 1982, and in the process of being eliminated without losing, only behind eventual champions Italy because of goals scored, they won their first two AFCON in 1984 and 1988. Then they became a permanent fixture at the World Cup, becoming the first African nation to play in a World Cup quarter-final, where they were ultimately unfortunate to lose to England. Whilst Cameroon would win just one World Cup game from their following five World Cups in six tournaments, today we'll be discussing that sixth tournament, 2006. With the likes of Rigobert, Song, Loren, Samuel Eto'o and Jeremy still in their prime, Cameroon shockingly failed to qualify for the World Cup, their first failure in 20 years. This was a far cry from the team that won successive AFCON titles in 2000 and 2002, held by Egypt on the final day, which allowed Ivory Coast to waltz into their first World Cup. Cameroon went into their final game needing a win over the would-be AFCON champions Egypt to seal their qualification for Germany ahead of Ivory Coast. Les Elephants were victorious 3-1 in Sudan, whilst Cameroon matched them stride for stride, Douala's first goal the only goal of the game in Yuande. Cameroon were in their fifth successive World Cup. Revenge for Drogba, Torre and Cole would come a couple of months down the line in a mammoth penalty shootout in the 2006 AFCON quarter-final. Cameroon had their eyes set on the bigger prize, but it would feel a world away given their horrific draw. The Netherlands, Argentina and Serbia and Montenegro. The latter were beaten in one of the most slept-on World Cup matches in history as Cameroon won out 4-2 in Munich. However, it didn't count for all that much as both teams were hounded out of the World Cup thanks to two defeats on the spin. 
Cameroon fell to Hernan Crespo and Javier Saviola in a 2-0 defeat in Hamburg before Robin Van Persie's thunderous free kick did them in Stuttgart. Cameroon though would be victorious two years on through the bodies of Egypt, Angola and Ivory Coast, the latter of which in a sweet sense of revenge. A reunion with Egypt in Accra three weeks after Sami Eto's hat-trick sunk them 3-2 in Kumasi was on the cards. It would be by no means a five-goal thriller but instead a tetchy final where Samuel Eto scored once more to confirm his golden boot as the indomitable Lions won a fifth AFCON. The likes of Gabon, Togo and Morocco were sworn off in qualification for the first ever World Cup in Africa. Blumfontein was the scene of Cameroon's first match, fresh off a second AFCON in succession, once more defeating Egypt in the final. In some ways the Japanese represented the most important game of the group, as the Netherlands would ease to top spot on 100% and the remaining three would not be separated by much. Keisuke Honda fired in Japan's opener but it was Sami Eto's double beforehand that already had Cameroon into the unassailable lead. Eto was coming off a banner year where another AFCON golden boot was secured and paired off with the treble with Inter Milan. Eto netted a third goal early on in Pretoria. Qualification could be assured with a win, particularly after the Netherlands win over Japan. Nicholas Bentner got Denmark back on track with an equaliser in a game destined for a 1-1 draw, which had the indomitable Lions on the precipice of the last 16. Eto's fall for the tournament a few days later wouldn't result in another point in another 1-1 draw against the Dutch, which would have confirmed Cameroon's first knockout stage match of World Cup football in 20 years. In fact, it would be thanks to Japan's wonderful 3-1 win over Denmark that night that Cameroon qualified for the last 16 regardless. The draw though meant second place and Paraguay in a return to Pretoria, not Slovakia in a kinder half of the draw. Regardless, Paraguay provided a stern test for Cameroon. The continent willed Cameroon on to qualify for the quarterfinals just as they had done three days prior as Ghana made the last eight after extra time against the United States. Cameroon would similarly have to go the distance. Paraguay as they had done with Italy earlier on in the tournament stifled their opposition, but like their American counterparts earlier on in the week, were finished by the 120 minute mark. Sebastian Basson with a bullet header from a corner with 5 minutes left on the clock. Not since the days of Roger Miller had Cameroon qualified for the quarterfinals of a World Cup. However, unlike in 1990, Cameroon wouldn't have to deal with a bumbling England, they'd be matched up with the best team in world football, Spain. Cameroon suffered along with Ghana as they were defeated by Spanish-speaking opposition in Uruguay the previous night in Johannesburg. Also in Johannesburg was African heartbreak, David Villa leaving it late on to dispatch of Africa's final representative in the 2010 World Cup. Cameroon wouldn't be successful in the 2012 or 2014 AFCON tournaments bowing out in the quarterfinals of both before they crashed out bottom of the pile in a tough selection of teams in Brazil that included the hosts as well as Croatia and Mexico. Ellis Park Stadium in Johannesburg, roughly 5.45 local time. The world champions were crashing out of the group stage. After disappointing draws to Paraguay and New Zealand, Italy, a triumph in Germany four years prior, had booked their premature plane home. Fabio Quagliarella's magnificent lob in the second half stoppage time was for nothing. They had lost 3-2 to Slovakia. The usuals were on the plane to South Africa, Buffon, Cannavaro, Zambrotta, Gattuso, Perlo, De Rossi, all world champions in 2006. One that didn't appear in South Africa was Francesco Totti. The Roman stalwart had tentatively retired from the national team after the World Cup win in Germany. Marcello Lippi, who had left as manager at the top of the mountain, was back after Italy's early elimination at Euro 2008. Totti had declared his interest in returning to the national team. Such was his love that he played through the entirety of the 2006 World Cup with metal screws in his ankles, fresh off surgery. Teammates Fabio Cannavaro and Gianluigi Buffon attributed their losses to lack of creative players, with Diego Maradona citing the exclusion of Totti by name as the reason for Italy's early elimination. Totti was snubbed for the subsequent tournaments and officially played his final international match in the 2006 World Cup final. Italy have, as of publication, yet to win a trophy since that game and haven't played a World Cup knockout stage match since that final. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. 
Here's what would have happened if Francesco Totti played in the 2010 World Cup. Totti had averaged almost a goal a game in the 2009-10 season as they were the best of the rest outside Jose Mourinho's treble winning into Milan. June the 1st, 2010, Francesco Totti beats Giuseppe Rossi and João Paolo Pazzini on the plane to South Africa. The 33-year-old would start from the bench in the opener against Paraguay in Cape Town. Antolin Alcaraz headed in to put South Americans into a half-time lead. Having seen enough 50 minutes in, Lippi hauled the legendary Roma forward onto the pitch. Totti slipped in Alberto Giladino for the equaliser almost immediately. De Rossi struck from a corner to gift Italy the first three points in their defence of the World Cup. Six days later against New Zealand, Totti started just behind Giladino. 30 minutes in, the Roma forward proved his worth, assisting a Chiellini header and converting a penalty. A 2-0 win and a qualification to the knockout stage with a game to spare. Lippi continued with the 4-4-1-1 throughout the tournament. Totti was rested for the final game, a 0-0 draw with Slovakia, publicly declaring Totti's value heading into the knockout stages. Japan were next in Pretoria. Giladino claimed the only goal of the game in a scrappy 1-0 win, where the resolute Italian defence starred again. Against the grain of the trendy, free-flowing, tiki-taka style of Spain that awaited in the quarter-finals. The revolutionary football played by Barcelona was famed the world over. It was rarely beaten. One team to do so was a treble winning into Milan side a few months prior. Lippi's 4-4-1-1 combated the midfield of Busquets, Xavi, Iniesta and Xabi Alonso. Mauro Camarinese came to the fore in the quarter-final, earning a man of the match performance in a midfield five containing Ricardo Montalivo, Daniele Di Rossi, Claudio Marchisio and at the tip, Francesco Totti. Spain, as expected, ran the game and penned Italy back into their half. Spain made just the one breakthrough in the previous round against Portugal, but no such luxury was to be had against the Italians. Italy remained resolute and against the run of play took Spain to a goal's draw and penalties. David Villa, who couldn't stop scoring throughout the tournament, stopped in the shootout. Italy ran out 5-4 winners. The youthful Germans stood in their way of a second successive final at the Soccer City Stadium in Johannesburg against the Dutch. Totti slid in Giladino for a third minute strike. Having conceded just one goal in the entire tournament, Italy were earmarked as instant favourites. As in the previous contest, Italy allowed their opposition to play as a front four of Lukas Podolski, Miroslav Klose, Meza Ozil and Thomas Muller were unable to break down the Italian backline. The German breakthrough, however, would come from the set pieces, just as the Paraguayan breakthrough came in the first match. Jerome Boateng levelled up the game from a corner with 12 minutes to go to take Italy into a second successive extra time. Germany, having played the long game, made just one substitution and stung a tiring Italy side. Cacao and Mario Gomez freshened up the German front line. Cacao demolished Italy down the right wing on two occasions, assisting both closer and Gomez in extra time. Germany ran out 3-1 winners. Totti's final game in an Italy shirt. Let's take it to the winners and losers. Spain loses. Their long-awaited coronation as champions of the world would not take place in South Africa. They would continue their European dominance against the Totti-less Italy at the European Championships two years later, however. Netherlands still loses. Instead of struggling to a defeat in extra time against Spain in the final, Netherlands were picked apart by a dominant German team, as is so typical of a Dutch team in a World Cup final. And Germany winners. They won their fourth World Cup by blitzing a Dutch team with youthful legs in Johannesburg. Ireland were drawn with the world champions Italy in the 2010 FIFA World Cup qualification Group 8. They were qualified for the playoff stage behind Italy despite going through the group stages undefeated. France were pipped to automatic qualification to South Africa by a single point by Serbia. The two nations were on a collision course in the playoffs. France took a 1-0 win back to Paris thanks to a Nicolas Anelka winner in Croke Park. Robbie Keane equalised in the 32nd minute, taking the reverse leg at the Stade de France into extra time. Then in the 103rd minute, Thierry Henry handled the through ball not once but twice and with an open pass to William Gallas a yard from goal, Ireland were out. France progressed to South Africa. Karma would be swift for France. They were held to a goalless draw in Cape Town against Uruguay. Nicolas Anelka called Raymond Domenech a son of a whore midway through a defeat to Mexico and was on the next flight home. The French players went on strike. It wasn't going well, let's be honest. A considerable goal swing and the hope that Mexico and Uruguay didn't play out a draw was needed for France to progress. South Africa needing a similar outcome soared into a 2-0 first half lead. Florent Malouda would score a consolation, France's only goal in the tournament. The rest of the team weren't far behind Anelka in returning to Paris. Ireland are yet to return to the world stage. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Thierry Henry didn't handle the ball against Ireland in the 2010 World Cup playoff. Thierry Henry allowed the pass to sail over his head and bounce out for a goal kick. Ireland held out for the half-time period in extra time. 
Once back out for the final 15 minutes, Kevin Dial delivered a sickener to France on the counter-attack. Ireland had gone 2-0 up and progressed 2-1 on aggregate. Ireland were going to South Africa, their first World Cup since 2002. Ireland were drawn with hosts South Africa and Uruguay, both appearing for the first time since 2002, and Mexico. A mixture of a toothless Uruguay front line and a stoic Ireland defence gave an entertaining 0-0 in Cape Town on night one. Ireland would succumb to a 1-0 defeat at the hands of Javier Hernandez and Mexico on night two. Ireland were three points adrift of Uruguay and Mexico going into the final day. They needed a win by two or more goals over South Africa in the hope that Uruguay would beat Mexico. Ireland conceded an early goal to South Africa, uncharacteristically from a corner. A Robbie Keane double coupled with a Uruguay 1-0 win over Mexico left Ireland needing one more goal to qualify. Enter, of all people, Richard Dunn. A header from the corner propelled Ireland into the round of 16. Finishing second to Uruguay meant Ireland were fed Argentina in Johannesburg. A Carlos Tevez brace before the break effectively killed the match. Argentina would win 3-0 and another former World Cup finalist dealt Ireland a knockout blow in the World Cup. Two years later, still with the momentum of a World Cup run, Ireland made the European Championships in Poland and Ukraine. They lost their three group games against Italy, Spain and Croatia. Elsewhere at the tournament, France qualified. They were rejuvenated by the national embarrassment of missing the World Cup. The previous time France had missed a tournament, the 1994 World Cup, they made the semi-finals of the European Championships afterwards. In 2012, France didn't make the appropriate start to relive that statistic, losing 1-0 to a Jolien Lescott header against England. France would come back with a win over Uruguay and were left needing to better Ukraine's result over England. Ukraine would lose to a Wayne Rooney screamer from 30 centimetres out. Zlatan Ibrahimovic and Sebastian Larsson struck in a 2-0 Sweden win to eliminate France on goal difference. Let's take it to some very obvious winners and losers. France losers. They failed to qualify for a World Cup and wouldn't make the Euro 2012 knockout stages. Ireland winners simply for making the 2010 World Cup. Mexico losers because their streak of making the knockout stages of a World Cup was finally broken by of all teams Ireland. I said in three of last week's videos that Nigeria are among the most important footballing nations in Africa. In their first attempt at AFCON football in 1963, they conceded 10 goals in two games to Sudan and Egypt as Ghana triumphed in their home tournament. This came prior to their first stab at World Cup qualification, where they were paired with Ghana in the summer of 1960. They were resoundingly defeated 4-1 in Accra before Ghana scraped a 2-2 draw in Lagos to make the final phase. The African boycott of the 1966 World Cup meant that Nigeria's next opportunity to qualify for the tournament was in 1970. They were more than a decade away from hosting and winning the AFCON of 1980 and it appeared that they would have to wait for their first World Cup appearance after a sloppy 1-1 draw in front of 87,000 in Lagos against Cameroon in December 1968. A fortnight later, however, they scored three in Douala to progress into the second phase against none other than Ghana. They fell behind at home, but Muyiwa Oshodi bagged the winner to take a lead to Accra, where Nigeria held firm, drawing 1-1. African sides had jumped through hoops to qualify for the World Cup at this stage, and what remained was a final group phase featuring Sudan and Morocco. Nigeria won just one of four matches, shipping five goals in two games against Sudan whilst Morocco qualified for the World Cup with a 3-0 win in Casablanca over the Sudanese. Nigeria wouldn't qualify for the World Cup until 1994 having watched the likes of Morocco, Zaire, Tunisia, Algeria and Egypt all qualify for the tournament and all fail to do anything with it. Could Nigeria have become the first African country to reach a World Cup quarter-final, a full generation? prior to the exploits of Roger Miller and Cameroon. Nigeria recorded two wins on the spin over Sudan and through a 2-0 win over Morocco in Lagos, they were to play in a World Cup for the very first time as Africa's second ever representative. In Mexico, Nigeria opened up their World Cup account against West Germany and the Europeans represented the group's runaway favourites. Peru and Bulgaria, meanwhile, could be considered a toss of the coin between the three in regards to qualification. West Germany had gone to the final four years prior and midway through the first half, the 11 in white were frozen to the spot, purely stunned. Muda Lawal danced through 
Franz Beckenbauer as if he wasn't there through the bodies of Helmut Haller and Bertie Vogts before sliding the ball beyond Sepp Meyer. West Germany dumbfounded and 1-0 down, they would roll back in the second half to win 2-1. Lawal though would become a legend not only in Nigeria but the world over, scoring four goals in the group phase, a double in a 2-2 draw with Peru and then the winning goal in the 2-1 victory over Bulgaria. In the end, the margin of defeat to West Germany separated Peru and Nigeria, and Gerd Muller's inability to score beyond Nigeria but sticking a hat-trick past Peru ensured that Africa had a team in the quarterfinals for the very first time. Nigeria would be found out eventually as the trio of Rivellino, Jairzinho and Tostao put four beyond them without replying Guadalajara in the quarterfinals. Irrespective, Nigeria returned home heroes and returned to the World Cup four years later, returning to play Brazil. Ghana, Zaire, Zambia and Morocco were defeated along the way to become the first African nation to qualify for multiple World Cups. Yugoslavia and Scotland were also in their group in what amounted to a potential group of death. Scotland were the first opponents in Dortmund, a Scottish side that boasted the likes of Billy Bremner, Kenny Dalglish, Joe Jordan, Peter Lorimer and Dennis Law. Scotland clearly hadn't scouted the Nigerians and Haruna El Arika netted two in the first 20 minutes. Stunned, Scotland struggled to get back into the game and floundered to a 2-0 defeat. Coming off the back of a 0-0 draw with Holders Brazil, regardless of the South Americans' drastic drop-off from 1970, it showed that Yugoslavia were a team to be feared. Immediately against Nigeria, Dusan Bajevic scored for Yugoslavia. As the game looked to have petered out into a 1-0 win for the Europeans, Yakubu Mambo surged forward and struck an almighty effort from 35 yards. It beat Enver Maric and crashed off the inside of the post and in. Brazil's second 0-0 draw of the tournament left them third on two points behind both Yugoslavia and Nigeria on three. Unfortunately, Brazil's experience shone through in Gelsenkirchen. Nigeria was starstruck by a largely under par Brazil who won a nervy contest in the second half through a Rivellino rocket and were quite rightly embarrassed by the Netherlands in the subsequent round. For Nigeria, however, it marked a step up into the big time and the country grew as a result. They claimed the 1976 AFCON with a draw to Egypt in Addis Ababa in the final group stage and won a second continental title four years on in front of their own fans by thrashing Algeria. They hadn't qualified for the 1978 World Cup but in Segon Odegbami, Nigeria finally had another striker that they could pin their hopes on. They would return in 1982, pipping Algeria in a playoff to the tournament before re-announcing themselves on the world stage with three wins from three in the group against West Germany, Austria and Chile. As West Germany boarded the first plane, home Nigeria was stunning England in the second group phase, 1-0 in the Bernabeu, thanks to an Odegabami goal. Spain would qualify after taking Nigeria apart 2-0 in the second match and gaining the requisite point needed from England to qualify. Nigeria would beat Algeria to a place in the 1986 tournament but join Northern Ireland on the first plane home in the group phase. Their golden team of the 1990s threatened to emulate that great outfit of the 1970s but losses to Italy and Denmark in the last 16 prevented that, as did a group of death in 2002. The international window is well and truly open and the FIFA World Cup qualification begins to conclude all over the world. The competition for qualification for Qatar later this year is nowhere near as intense as it is in South America right now. With Ecuador all but qualified and assured of their place alongside Brazil and Argentina, we'll ease you into the international break by looking back at three nations who will battle it out for the 1.5 remaining spots in South America. Today it's the turn of Uruguay and their attempt at returning to the World Cup for successive tournaments for the first time since the 1986 and 1990 editions. They were on what would become their longest drought without a Copper America between 1995 and 2011 and were yet to usher in a generation of Luis Suarez, Edison Cavani and Fernando Muslera. However, they were still blessed with the likes of Alvaro Recoba and Diego Forlan. They edged out Colombia for the final playoff spot just as they had done in 2002 and thanks to a 1-0 win over Argentina too. Confident of replicating their 2002 playoff win over Australia, Uruguay lost 1-0 away from home just as they had done four years prior. However, this game in the second leg to tie up Uruguay's own 1-0 victory in Montevideo. 
the only World Cup participant to be decided by the penalty shootout was confirmed. And thanks to John Aloisi's penalty in Sydney, it was Australia, not Uruguay, as the Socceroos made their first World Cup in 32 years and recorded their best performance, a last 16 exit to Italy. Sydney waited with bated breath. The penalty shootout had come down to John Aloisi and Fabian Carini. If the Australian could score the kick, Australia were into their first World Cup since the 1970s. Carini's save ensured the shootout would continue, but transplanted all of the anxiety and pressure of Uruguay onto Ricard Morales. By scoring, Morales plunged the shootout into sudden death where Vince Grella and Diego Lugano's different fits sent Uruguay to the World Cup and prolonged Australia's wait until 2010 when they were admitted into AFC in a far easier passage to the finals. Uruguay graduated from stunning a Sydney audience to wowing a German one, or at least attempting to, as they met Italy, Czech Republic and the United States in Group E. As a result, Ghana were fed into a similarly tricky group containing Brazil, Croatia and Japan. Whilst Brazil would prove too strong courtesy of Ronaldo's record-breaking World Cup goals tally, Japan and Croatia provided a superb springboard for the debutants to make the World Cup knockout stage. That they did. Sully Ali Muntari scored the winning goal against Japan and a double from Asamo Gian and a Steven Apaya penalty was necessary to sink Croatia 3-2 in the final group game. They were rewarded with the winners from Uruguay's group. Uruguay's plan of meeting them in the last 16 encounter in Kaiserslautern pretty much died on impact with the tournament. In their first match in Hanover against the Italians, they were outclassed by goals courtesy of Andrea Perlo and Vicenzo Iaquinta. Uruguay had five days to dust themselves down, pick themselves up from the canvas when they met Czech Republic in Cologne. And they got off to a magnificent start, Diego Forlan heading in the opener inside two minutes. Forlan would add a second from the spot on 66 minutes and Uruguay ran out 3-0 winners, putting them on the board in terms of wins and ensuring their goal difference was positive ahead of the third contest with America. Italy's expected win over Czech Republic combined with a point needed against an underperforming USA side left the expectation that La Celeste would be in for a 1950 final reunion with Brazil in the last 16. Marco Materazzi and Pippo Inzaghi provided the win for Italy as Marcelo Zalietta tied up Clint Dempsey's first half opener. Albeit nervously, Uruguay had booked their place in the last 16 in Dortmund with their neighbours from the north. Whilst Ghana fell cruelly to a late Francesco Totti penalty in the eventual winners of Italy, the same couldn't be extracted from Uruguay's contest with Brazil. Not that they were victorious, far from it. Whilst the ghosts of the Maracanã in the 1950 final were hardly laid to rest, Brazil went some way to exercising some of those demons. Ronaldo and Adriano's goals more than enough to embarrass Uruguay as part of a 3-0 win. Not that Brazil did much with it, bowing out to France at the quarter-final phase. Meanwhile, Uruguay followed up their first World Cup in 16 years with another immediately after. They proceeded to betray their host continent by cheating their way to a semi-final spot against the Netherlands. Karma would be swift and sufficient as Uruguay placed fourth, their best return since winning the tournament in the Maracanã 60 years prior. It was the start of a long line of near misses for the Ukraine national team in an attempt to reach a football tournament. Ukraine had starred in Europe through the performances of Andrei Shevchenko, Sergei Rebrov and Dynamo Kiev in the Champions League, but they couldn't reach an international tournament until 2006. They fell to Croatia at their first World Cup qualification, losing 2-0 in Zagreb to a team heading to their first World Cup who would reach the semi-final. Then came the late setback against Slovenia in the Euro 2000 playoffs when Rebrov's penalty wasn't enough to secure an away goals win before a good showing against Germany in Kiev, only to be thumped 4-1 in Dortmund in the second leg of a third playoff defeat in a row. Ukraine's first participation in a tournament came at the following World Cup with a spirited quarter-final showing, in defeat to eventual champions Italy. Andrei Shevchenko, who else was on the spot to score his second and third goals of the contest to mark an incredible turnaround in Kiev? 
Their 3-0 victory over Croatia had abolished the defeat they were handed in Zagreb. Ukraine were to play in a World Cup Finals for the very first time. They joined debutants Jamaica and Japan in Group H in France and in disposing of the pair, joined Argentina in the last 16 of the World Cup as dark horses. Rebrov and Shevchenko had netted four of their five goals at the finals thus far and two more from Milan-bound Shevchenko in the last 16 confirmed Ukraine's prolonged stay in France. With that, the baton of surprise packages was sufficiently transferred from Romania to Ukraine ahead of a trip to Lyon to meet three-time champions Germany. Despite the status of European champions, Germany weren't up so much really, a shell of their former selves. That was hammered home when Sergei Rebrov won a penalty with seven minutes left on the clock and hammered it in. Ukraine were to play in the semi-final of a World Cup. Unfortunately, they were to come up against hosts France in the capital. Many had underestimated the Ukrainians, but their fighting spirit was obviously there to see, a matter of seconds into the second half. Shevchenko picked the ball up 40 yards from goal. He beat Bashenkte Lizarazu, he beat Thierry Henry, he beat Manny Petit, he beat Marcel Desailly. He rounded Fabian Barthez and slotted the ball home. Ukraine won, hosts and favourites France, nil. Then out of the blue, Le Bleu and Lillian Taram sunk Ukraine's defence with his only two goals in international football and France went on to win the tournament. Ukraine though went home as bronze medalists and heroes. Shevchenko wasn't long for Ukraine thanks to his performances and moved to the eventual Serie A champions, Milan. The 98 World Cup though was not a one-off for Ukraine. A 3-0 thrashing of Slovenia in a Euro 2000 playoff in Kiev ensured they would take up a rightful spot in Belgium and the Netherlands. And again it was another favourable group, Yugoslavia, Norway and Spain. Ukraine announced themselves with a 3-1 battering of Yugoslavia in Charleroi but quickly fell in Amsterdam to an early goal from Raul in a 1-0 defeat of Spain. Yugoslavia's win over Norway in Liège made things simple for Ukraine, heading to Arnhem for their final group match, win and be certain of a place in the quarterfinals of another tournament. No surprise by the goal scorer against Norway then, who sealed a 1-0 win, Andrei Shevchenko. Ukraine were in second place following Spain's dramatic turnaround against Yugoslavia in stoppage time. First or second place, it didn't matter too much. They were on the first plane home after the quarter-finals. Zinedine Zidane conquered the Spanish. Patrick Kluivert's hat-trick did for Ukraine in a madcap 5-3 victory for the Dutch in Rotterdam. The string of qualifications continued into 2002, but this time without the need for a playoff of victory. Ukraine squeaking ahead of Poland to qualify for the finals in the Far East. Poland were the victims of Germany in the playoff as Ukraine prepared for the likes of Portugal, USA and co-host South Korea in their toughest group at a tournament yet. For the first time, Ukraine lost their opening match at a tournament when South Korea stole a 1-0 win in Busan through a contentious late goal. Ukraine rebounded though, Andrei Shevchenko outscored Pauletta in a 2-1 win over Portugal and Sergei Rebrov bagged the only goal against the Americans to confirm Ukraine's place in the last 16. In a fortunate quarter of the draw, Mexico first and then Germany or Paraguay in the quarterfinals. Mexico were dispatched in golden goal extra time and Ukraine were feeling buoyant ahead of another quarterfinal against Germany, with a potential semi-final reunion of South Korea ahead. However, Germany gained revenge for 1998, but did so unjustly. Torsten Fring's handball on the line should have warranted a red card and a penalty. Ukraine got neither and Michael Balak's winning goal sent Ukraine tumbling out of the tournament. Ukraine were dealt another strong group at Euro 2004 with Spain and Portugal, also in the group Russia, yikes, whom they were expected to beat. After draws against Portugal and Spain, a win over the Russians was necessary for Ukraine's qualification into the quarterfinals, and Andrei Shevchenko hat-trick demolished Russia in a 4-1 victory. The forward was on course for the Ballon d'Or and with his third, fourth and fifth goals in successive matches against France, Czech Republic and Portugal, Ukraine had one nil their way to becoming European champions. Yes, 
Ukraine had won Euro 2004 and did so with the best player on the planet as the tournament's top scorer. In Group 1 of UEFA's 1994 World Cup qualification, two traditional forces in Italy and Switzerland qualified ahead of Portugal and Scotland. With the dissolution of Yugoslav, Czech and Soviet states, this kind of group now would be impossible, especially with the expansion from 24 to 32 teams. But if it popped up now, this result would be shocking for Portugal's absence. In 1994, the bigger shock perhaps came as Scotland failed to qualify for their first World Cup since 1970. Switzerland had been at one fewer World Cup than Scotland and, under the stewardship of Roy Hodgson, qualified instead in second place, whilst Italy had never failed to qualify for a World Cup and did so in top spot. Although that isn't to say that their position at the tournament was confirmed match days in advance. Going into the final match day, Portugal travelled to the San Siro while Scotland and Switzerland were expected to pick up wins over the group's whipping boys in Malta and Estonia and did so. The win took Switzerland on to 15 points and even in a world of 2 points for a win the task was simple for both Italy and Portugal. Win. A draw would be enough to send Italy through on goals scored, the same method that split Ireland and Denmark and barred the European champions from the tournament. Meanwhile, whoever lost were to stew on it for another four years. Dino Baggio flagrantly stuck the ball into the net seven minutes from time in an offside position. It was adjudged to be a valid goal somehow, despite the midfielder being a few yards offside, and Italy would go all the way to the final. Portugal, meanwhile, would have to wait until 2002 to play in a World Cup and have yet to play in a World Cup final. Portugal head to the United States and take their place in pot three for the draw. Their opponents for a first World Cup in eight years are Belgium, Saudi Arabia and Morocco. The Netherlands are now seeded in Italy's absence get drawn with Mexico, Ireland and Norway. They are held by the Irish, styming any Ray Houghton magic in the giant stadium and go on to record their only group victory against Norway. A draw with Mexico confirms the Netherlands place in the last 16 as Group E's winners. Would they be joined by Portugal? Well, it was a nervous start by the Portuguese, drawing 1-1 with Saudi Arabia in their opener. The second game was the hardest, but Belgium were held too thanks to a sublime effort from Manuel Rui Costa in another 1-1 draw. Rui Costa was the man who struck again in the third match, the opener, in a 2-0 victory of a winless and pointless Morocco. It confirmed Portugal's first World Cup knockout stage match since the days of Eusebio. The food chain in the bottom quarter of the draw was as follows, Norway lose to Nigeria, who lose to Spain on penalties. Meeting them in the semi-final were the Dutch, who scraped beyond Bulgaria on penalties in the last 16, before they overturned an early deficit against their mortal enemies, Germany, winning 2-1 to confirm a first World Cup semi-final since 1978. Let's return to Portugal's Fred. João Pinto scored the first Portuguese knockout stage goals in a World Cup in nearly 30 years, in an early quickfire double that humbled the Swedes in the last 16. Romania and Georgia Hadji were next in the quarterfinals, and as paths to semi-finals go, a calmer one than what you'd expect. Regardless, Hadji dominated Portugal and Pinto and Rui Costa and co, and they were fortunate to take the game to penalties. Portugal, though, would squeeze through 4-3 earning the right to play Brazil in the semi-final. That particular food chain saw Saudi Arabia lose to Mexico, who in turn lost comfortably to Brazil. The semi-finals were set, Brazil versus Portugal, Netherlands versus Spain. The Portugal's contest was by far the cager of the two, but Romario proved too good for the Portuguese, the talisman scoring the winning goal in a 1-0 victory. On the other half of the draw, an almighty clash. Luis Enrique and Dennis Bergkamp traded four goals of their own. Albert Ferrer edged Spain ahead 3-2 before Ronald De Boer's penalty late on forced the game to extra time and ultimately, penalties. And penalties is where the Dutch would slay the Spanish on their way to losing the final 3-1 to Brazil. Two years on, Portugal qualified quite comfortably for Euro 96. Italy too, showing no lasting repercussions from a first failure to qualify for a World Cup in 44 years. A feel-good factor about the Dutch, despite losing a third World Cup final, is clear to see, as they top a qualifying group, defeating the Czechs home and away. Those results have Norway sneaking into the playoffs at the Czech Republic's expense to play Ireland, and they fulfil their obligations, beating Ireland 1-0 at Anfield. The nature of the Euro 96 draw sees hosts England, Denmark, Germany and Spain seeded, whilst the remaining 12 teams can simply be put anywhere. That kind of administration makes creating these kind of alternate football scenarios an absolute dream. Cheers UEFA. And it means that Norway simply take Czech Republic's place in a group with former European champions, Germany, former European champions Italy and former European champions under a different name, Russia. 
Portugal top their group with champions Denmark, Dark Horses, Croatia and No Hope as Turkey and were confirmed to be playing the runners up from Group C, a group which Germany similarly topped with relative ease. Their points against Italy at Old Trafford in their final group game proved crucial not only in sealing top spots but serving to eliminate the Italians. Norway had opened up with a 2-0 defeat against Germany but quickly rebounded. Jan Aga Fjortov scoring two in a stunning 2-1 win over Italy. Fjortov scored the winning goal in the final game, a 2-1 win against Russia to confirm Norway's place in the quarter-final against Portugal. So whilst England beat Spain but lost to Germany and France pipped the Netherlands with penalties all over the gaff in those particular games, Portugal spared the viewing public from another shootout, Luis Figo in his first tournament scoring the golden goal against Norway. Penalties couldn't be prolonged for much longer however after a goalless stalemate with France at Old Trafford. For Fernando Couto it was, assigned to convert the winning spot kick to confirm Portugal's place in their first ever tournament final. The golden goal was in the other net, so to speak, at Wembley, Figo's quarter-final effort, now Oliver Bierhoff's championship winner, thundering an extra time strike into the top corner. Their performance at the previous two tournaments earned Portugal status as a seeded team for the 1998 World Cup and sees Romania paired off with Germany in qualification, Romania have to go through the playoff system and bow out to Croatia at the final hurdle. Meanwhile Portugal qualify ahead of Ireland in Group 8 and draw England, Colombia and Tunisia in Group G in France. All the stars were on show for Portugal that summer, Luis Figo's double sunk Colombia. Rui Costa bagged the winner versus England and whilst Tunisia were held by a second string, Croatia were only picked off on penalties in the last 16, revenge was sealed in the quarter-final against Germany, Sergio Conte South scoring all three in a 3-0 win. As we passed from one decade to another, one century to another, one millennium to another, the story would repeat Portugal-France semi-finals. Portugal had won the first back in England at the European Championships in 1996, but two years later, on French soil this time, Lillian Taram's unlikely double killed Portuguese hopes. And in the rubber match at Euro 2000, French domination continued, Zinedine Zidane the difference from the spot. Portugal's wake-up call would come two years later in the Far East when they were dumped out of a group containing South Korea, USA and Poland, before the ultimate triumph was finally secured. The Euros of 2004 on home soil, with Luis Figo and Cristiano Ronaldo combining for both goals in a 2-1 win over Greece in the final. But France and semi-finals and heartache weren't too far away, Zinedine Zidane scoring the winning penalty against the Portuguese at the 2006 World Cup. An extraterrestrial, the words of Gabriel Batistuta remarking on Lionel Messi upon him breaking the Argentina goal-scoring record at the 2016 Copa America. Lionel Messi moved to Spain to join the La Masia Academy in 2001 when he was 13. Whilst at Barcelona, Messi became a dual citizen of both Argentina and Spain. In 2003, the Spanish under-17 team selectors sought after the diminutive Argentine, but Messi rejected them. A year later, Messi made his under-20 debut for Argentina against Paraguay, scoring one goal and assisting two in an eight-goal thrashing. He would go on to make his international debut in August 2005 against Hungary and picked up the under-20 World Cup for his country in the same year. The second and final trophy that he picked up for the Argentina youth squads was gold at the Beijing Olympics in 2008. At senior level for his country, however, he would only pick up silver medals, one at the World Cup in 2014 against Germany, and then three at the Copa America, in 2007 against Brazil, and in 2015 and 2016 against Chile. After a second successive heartbreaking penalty shootout loss to Chile in the 2016 final, where Messi missed a vital penalty, the number 10 signalled the end of his international career. He would quickly reverse the decision in time for round of 16 elimination at the World Cup in Russia 2018 and a year later Messi helped Argentina take bronze at the Copa America. He's currently the record goalscorer for Argentina and Barcelona and is sure to break both Barcelona and Argentina's appearance record in the not too distant future. Lionel Messi will be remembered as one of the best footballers to ever live. This is largely due to his club form with Barcelona. He has picked up 6 Ballon d'Or awards alongside 10 La Liga titles, 6 Copa del Reyes and 4 Champions League titles. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if Lionel Messi played for Spain. Upon Spain selector scrutinising Lionel Messi's La Masia performances, Messi accepted their advances. After making his breakout season in 2004-05, Lionel Messi made his senior debut for Spain in a 2005 friendly win over Canada. His first goal for the Spanish side was in a 6-2 aggregate win over Slovakia that gained Spain their spot at the 2006 World Cup the following year. Spain manager Luis Aragon is plumped for Marcos Senna at the right wing for the opening two matches at the World Cup, while Spain tore apart Ukraine and Tunisia. Messi would feature in a second string side for the final group game against Saudi Arabia. 
with Spain already qualified. He netted twice in a 3-0 win. He returned to the bench for the last 16 match against France. David Villa and Frank Ribéry traded goals in the first half. In a nail-biting affair, Messi was thrown into the fray with 18 minutes left on the clock. The Barcelona magician struck the winner, killing Zinedine Zidane's career dead in the water in Hanover. Aragonés selected Messi from the start instead of Fernando Torres from the left wing, but proved ineffective as Spain faltered to a 1-0 defeat over Brazil in the quarter-finals. With Aragonés still in charge, Messi would be a perennial starter in the Spanish lineup. At Euro 2008, Messi was paired with either David Villa or Fernando Torres up front and would score four goals in the routes of Russia and Sweden, with a rest granted in the third match against Greece. Messi netted the winner in the quarter-final with Italy, featured in the semi-final win over Russia, before Fernando Torres won Spain's first trophy since the European Championship in 1964. As part of his five goals in the tournament, Messi would receive the golden boot and the golden ball. Vicente del Bosque succeeded Aragones for the 2010 World Cup and tweaked the setup in South Africa. He lined Spain up in a 4-2-3-1 with the Barcelona trio of Iniesta, Xavi and Messi behind recently signed Barcelona forward David Villa. Messi announced himself on the World Cup with a hat-trick against Switzerland in Durban, before confirming Spain's place in the knockouts with a goal against Honduras. He was striking the 2-0 win over Portugal in the last 16, in Messi's first real victory in what was shaping up to be the biggest footballing rivalry with Cristiano Ronaldo. Messi wouldn't score in the 1-0 knockout wins over Paraguay and Germany but would ensure he left South Africa with a golden boot in Spain's first World Cup final against the Netherlands. Messi, not Iniesta, would be the extra time hero in Johannesburg, scoring twice against the 10-man Dutch. Del Bosque kept the same faces in his front line for the Euros in 2012 but moved Messi up top on his own with Iniesta and Xavi behind him. A third successive golden boot was acquired with four goals, one in the winning final against Italy. Diego Costa joined the Spanish setup in the World Cup two years later despite a number of caps for Brazil. Lionel Messi didn't hit fine form in the group stages, stifled perhaps by the two-man attacking lineup alongside Costa, only scoring in the final group win over Australia. A 3-0 win over the Netherlands on opening night claimed top spot in the group despite losing 1-0 to Chile. Messi came to life however in the quarter-final route of Costa Rica. He scored all three for Spain. A winner in the semi-final against Argentina in Sao Paulo followed. For Messi, this was the real final, as he invested all his energy in the extra time win. So much so that with a jaded Messi for the final, Germany crushed Spain with a Mario Goetze extra time winner. Germany would be the instigator in the following European Championships in 2016, knocking Spain out in the quarterfinals. Messi's six goals, five of which came in the group stages, secured him a silver boot behind Antoine Griezmann. Under Fernando Hierro in the 2018 World Cup, Lionel Messi surrendered his place up front for the returning Diego Costa. He sat on the left wing beside Isco and Andres Iniesta, but the four failed to click in the group stages, scraping through his group winners with just five points. What followed in the knockout stages was a single performance, the likes of which the World Cup hadn't seen since Paolo Rossi dragged Italy to the World Cup in 1982. Messi scored both goals in a 2-0 win over host Russia before netting the winner over Croatia in the final eight and the first goal in a semi-final win against England. Four years removed from the final defeat against Germany, Spain fell behind to Antoine Griezmann's penalty in Moscow. Diego Costa levelled up a VAR-inspired equaliser before Lionel Messi single-handedly won the tournament for Spain, jinking in and out of the French defence with just five minutes left on the clock, netting the winner. With two European Championships and two World Cups won, Lionel Messi retired from international football, the same month that Argentina capitulated to a group stage knockout courtesy of Nigeria. But what of Argentina? The immediate effect wasn't profound. Argentina laboured to successive quarter-final eliminations at the World Cups in Germany and South Africa and lost the 2007 Copa America final. Messi eliminated Argentina from the 2014 World Cup whilst the Sergio Aguero-led Argentina could only reach the semis of the 2011 Copa America. Gonzalo Higuain and Sergio Aguero were the focal points of a successive Copa America titles in 2015 and 2016, with Mauro Icardi welcomed into the fold for the latter tournament. Argentina won both finals against Chile, Icardi scoring the crucial penalty in the 2016 final, also winning the Golden Boot. Let's take it to the winners and losers. Lionel Messi winner because he actually won some international trophies two of each portugal another winner because they went on to win the 2006 world cup after beating brazil and italy spain another winner because they won a second world cup in 2018 argentina yet another winner because they broke their trophy drought from 1993 with successive copa americas in 2015 and 2016 Mauro Cardi, another winner, because he was able to compete on a regular basis for his country, and he won the Copa America in 2016. And the only loser, France, because they didn't win the 2018 World Cup and didn't reach the 2006 World Cup final. The 2010 World Cup was significant as it was the first World Cup to be held in Africa. 
and is by Tunisia's ever presence at the World Cup from 1998 to 2006, they hadn't threatened to make the last 16, failing to add to their 3-1 win over Mexico in Rosario back in 1978, as the likes of England, Romania, Belgium, Japan, Spain and Ukraine all qualified for the respective knockout stages ahead of them. They never again hit the heights of their 2004 AFCON triumph, losing in successive quarterfinals to Nigeria and Cameroon before bottoming out to a group phase exit in Angola in 2010, despite being undefeated. They'd toiled to make the last phase of qualification in 2010, failing to beat Burkina Faso over two contests, yet they went into their final qualifier away in Mozambique in the driving seat. We went into the final 10 minutes with both games in the group deadlocked, Nigeria drawing 2-2 in Nairobi and Tunisia held 0-0 in Maputo. Then across two minutes the entire complexion of the group changed, Obafemi Martin scored the winner for Nigeria in Kenya. This forced Tunisia to go looking for a winning goal in Mozambique but were caught out themselves, Dario netting the winner for Mozambique. Nigeria qualified and gifted us the classic moment of Yakubu's miss against South Korea, whilst Tunisia were forced to wait until 2018 to qualify for the World Cup. There, they finally won their second World Cup match in a dead rubber 2-1 victory over Panama in Saransk. Nigeria secured the 3-2 winning Kenya and awaited news from Maputo. They'd had radio silence for 84 minutes, but finally noise, and it wasn't good noise for the Nigerians. Wissam Ben Yahya had converted from the penalty spot, Tunisia had won 1-0, and they were heading south that June to South Africa for a fourth successive World Cup, equaling Cameroon's tally between 1990 and 2002. Buoyed by their qualification, Tunisia made light work of Gabon in their second AFCON contest that January to top Group D qualifying ahead of Zambia. Instantly, the Tunisians were fed into a reunion with Nigeria in Lubango. 120 goalless minutes were followed by a similar theme. Ben Yahya scored a penalty and the Nigerians were heartbroken. The final four consisted of three teams that had qualified for the World Cup, yet the winner of AFCON was Egypt, a team who had failed once more to reach the world stage whilst dominating continentally. Tunisia had been outclassed in the semi-final, missing out to Ghana and Asamoah Gyan, as Ghana made their second successive knockout stages, confirmed by Serbia's failings against Australia in the final group match of Group D, Tunisia had something riding on their final group game too. Tunisia had begun their World Cup in losing fashion, but the 1-0 defeat to Argentina, considering that South Korea had shipped four goals to the South Americans, looked a great result. As Gonzalo Higuain tore the Koreans apart, Amini Chomiti had fired Tunisia into a 1-0 lead against Greece. Unfortunately, Dimitri Salpingidis drew Greece level before the break and both nations headed into the final match day with a point apiece. Tunisia's outlook on the tournament, however, was far more positive. They needed a victory over South Korea and needed to better Greece's result, although they played Argentina. Greece, meanwhile, needed favours and a win over Argentina. They lost 2-0. Therefore, it was simple enough for Tunisia, defeat South Korea to claim second place. Chermiti scored Tunisia's second goal of the tournament, early again in Durban against South Korea. However, just as they had done in the previous contest, they were pegged back before the break, courtesy of Lee Jung-soo's leveller. Group B was on a knife edge, the game and therefore the group was settled by a corner deep into the second half. Kareem Hagui heading into the top corner, Tunisia 2, South Korea 1. At the fifth time of asking, they had qualified for the knockout phase of a World Cup. And their reward, a Uruguayan side with Luis Suarez in imperious form. Suarez netted twice breaking Tunisian hearts before handling on the line to stop Ghana in the quarter-finals, ending their involvement at the tournament too. Tunisia would break Cameroon's record run of World Cup qualifications by taking Cameroon themselves to penalties in a playoff. Tunisians claimed it was about time after they had been eliminated at successive AFCON tournaments via the shootout. First in 2012 to Mali and then a year later they went one step closer to emulating 2004 but were put out again by Ghana again in the semi-finals on penalties. They were drawn with the host Brazil for the upcoming World Cup 
but met Mexico and Croatia beforehand in an attempt to get points on the board and presumably qualify alongside Brazil. Instead, Tunisia shipped four without reply and four more to Brazil, leaving the tournament without scoring a single goal. They'd be back in Russia, but once again it seemed that 2010 was the exception rather than the rule, losing to Belgium and England in another tough group. The international window is well and truly open and the FIFA World Cup qualification begins to conclude all over the world. The competition for qualification for Qatar later this year is nowhere near as intense as it is in South America right now. With Ecuador all but qualified and assured of their place alongside Brazil and Argentina, we'll ease you into the international break by looking back at three nations who will battle it out for the 1.5 remaining spots in South America. Today it's the turn of Peru and the 1998 World Cup. With the expansion to 32 teams, it is this particular tournament that ushered in the huge 9-10 team group with four nations guaranteed of a place in South America. However, because of Brazil's participation via the virtue of being world champions, remember that old rule, the playoff players wasn't allotted in the 1998 tournament. Had it been so, Peru would have earned the consolation of that playoff, presumably against Australia. The turning point of qualification was Peru's penultimate day defeat in Santiago, Chile, where the Chileans, led by hat-trick scoring Marcelo Salas, won out 4-0. Chile ended their 16-year wait for a World Cup tournament on goal difference and reached only their second ever knockout phase. Peru's own wait would go on, finally ceasing with the qualification for the 2018 tournament through the playoffs and thanks to goal difference, yes, ahead of Chile. Marcelo Zalas and Ivan Zamorano cast long, dark shadows on the turf of the Estadio Nacional in Santiago on October the 12th. The continent's top scorers for France 98 qualification had both failed to net. Peru escaped with a draw and with only one match to play, Chile needed a minor miracle to qualify. Courtesy of Uruguay's 5-3 dismantling of Ecuador in Maldonado, Peru knew that a point against 8th place Bolivia would be enough to secure a first World Cup in a generation. Jorge Soto netted, Peru qualified with a 1-0 win over the Bolivians. Awaiting them in France the following summer with the previous finalists, Italy, 90 surprise packages and neutrals favourites, Cameroon as well as Austria, who had failed to make a true imprint on a World Cup since the 1950s. Italy were first up in Bordeaux, and Peru held their own for a time, Roberto Palacios equalising the great Christian Vieri's opener. A draw looked to be the outcome until the Italians won a penalty. This time against the South American team, Roberto Baggio converted the kick, and not in a rugby sense either. Whichever way you spun the opening game, Peru had shone, but ultimately in defeat. They therefore needed a result six days later against the Austrians in Saint Etienne. Palacios nodded in his and his nation's second goal of the tournament with 20 minutes left on the clock, a goal which was against the run of play and curbed Austria's will. Peru edged their way to qualification with a tense 1-0 win. Neither Austria nor Cameroon had got on the board in terms of a win, unlike the Peruvians, and with a likely Italian win over Austria, Peru simply needed one more point to make the knockout phase for the first time since 1970. In spite of the Africans going down to nine men thanks to both Laurent and Rigobert's song receiving red cards, Peru were made to cling on desperately to a 1-1 draw. Four points on the board was enough. Christian Vieri, Roberto Baggio with the goals in the Stade de France not only confirmed Italy's perfect group phase record, but confirmed Peru's place in the last 16. Waiting for them, Brazil. Brazil, who contained the best player in the world. Ronaldo, who slapped two goals beyond Peru in a 4-0 victory for the Seleção. Knockout phase exits at the hands of Brazil and Colombia at subsequent Copa America finals in 1999 and 2001 imbued Peru with spirit, heading into the final match day of the 2002 World Cup qualification. Nobby Solano had entered his peak, and we had a young Claudio Pizarro netting in the goals left, right and centre. They concluded their qualification with Bolivia again, but this time were heart-achingly held 1-1. Their points tally of 31 guaranteed a playoff against Australia, yet they still awaited the result from Paraguay in their home contest with Colombia. The already eliminated Colombians had surprised the continent, thumping Paraguay 4-0. That fed the Paraguayans down a route of Australia in the playoff before being eliminated eventually by Senegal and Denmark in Group A in the tournament proper. Meanwhile, Peru were handed Spain, South Africa and Slovenia in Group B. 
Claudio Pizarro and Fernando Morientes were the stars of the group. Pizarro netted a double for Peru against South Africa before five days later the Spaniard Morientes got two of his own in Peru's group defeat. It meant that a win was needed against Slovenia, but by half time they had gone down to a Milenko Aksimovic opener. Spain winning in the other group match against South Africa buoyed the Peruvians and they returned to the field a refreshed team. Claudio Pizarro in the goals again in a 3-1 win which confirmed Peru's place at a successive last 16. Where Peru held their own this time but unfortunately in the face of the mechanical uninspiring Germans they floundered to a golden goal defeat courtesy of Oliver Nervel. Peru wouldn't return until 2018. September the 1st 2001, England annihilated Germany in their backyard 5-1 with goals from the Liverpool trio of Michael Owen, Emil Heskett and Steven Gerrard. It was a watershed moment for the young golden generation under the stewardship of Sven Goran Eriksson. A month later David Beckham's famous free kick against Greece at Old Trafford would confirm England's qualification for the 2002 World Cup. However only two of the aforementioned Liverpool trio netted against Germany in the World Cup qualifier would make the tournament the following summer. On the final weekend of the 2001-2 Premier League season, Steven Gerrard suffered a groin injury in Liverpool's 5-0 win over Ipswich Town. With Gary Neville also missing out from Sven's golden generation, England squeezed through the group of death featuring Argentina, Nigeria and Sweden, but would lose to eventual winners Brazil in the quarter-finals thanks to that Ronaldinho free kick. 2002 was perhaps the best chance for England's golden generation to win an international tournament after successive quarter-final defeats to Portugal in Euro 2004 and the 2006 World Cup. The generation shuddered to an abrupt halt with the failure to qualify for Euro 2008. Steven Gerrard would have a stint as England captain after a disappointing 2010 World Cup up until his international retirement. Retirement after a group stage humiliation in Brazil four years later. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Steven Gerrard didn't miss the 2002 World Cup through injury. Gerrard passed fit for England's 23-man squad and played in both warm-up matches against South Korea and Cameroon. He would keep Trevor Sinclair out of the squad. Eriksson would opt for a slanted 4-4-2 formation at the World Cup, shoehorning Owen Hargreaves, Steven Gerrard and Paul Scholes into a midfield four, with David Beckham on the right-hand side. Owen Hargreaves would be preferred on the left, staying back whilst Ashley Cole's bombing runs down the wing utilised width on the left. The first group game in Saitama against Sweden was a war of attrition with Sol Campbell and Nicholas Alexanderson trading goals before Steven Gerrard thumped in a winning goal 10 minutes from the end. Gerrard played every minute of England's group winning effort after a 1-0 win over Argentina and a 0-0 draw against Nigeria that confirmed first position. Winning the group gifted England a more generous path to the semi-final. Eriksson continued with the asymmetric 4-4-2 and it allowed Steven Gerrard and Paul Scholes to be fully utilised going forward. Scholes would score in a 2-0 win over Senegal in the round of 16, whilst Gerrard stepped forward to score in a similar 2-0 win against Turkey in the quarter-finals. The business end of the tournament left the real final being played a match early in Saitama between England and Brazil, whilst Germany were gifted co-hosts South Korea and were expected to saunter into the final barring any phantom referee decisions. Ronaldo fired Brazil into a first-half lead only for Michael Owen to cancel out the opener in stoppage time. A first World Cup final on foreign soil was sealed in scenes akin to those at Old Trafford eight months prior. With the clock ebbing from 89 minutes to 90, David Beckham stepped up 25 yards from goal. The curl into the top corner had Marcos in the Brazil goal beaten all ends up. There was no time to respond and England's second World Cup final would be against the same opponents as their first final, Germany. And Germany's hottest player during the tournament was Miroslav Klose. The Kaiserslautern centre forward hit his sixth goal of the tournament from the spot 11 minutes into the final. England had to do things the hard way again. The key battle in the middle of the pitch was Liverpool teammates colliding in the form of 22-year-old Gerrard against 28-year-old Dietmar Hamann. A lunging Hamann brought about England's equaliser before the hour mark. The German stepped up allowing Gerrard to stride beyond him and slide Emil Heskey through on goal. Heskey as he did with the fifth goal back in Munich in September 2001, calmly slotted the ball beyond Oliver Kahn to level the final up. Beckham now favourite alongside Michael Owen to win the golden boot provided the moment of genius that swung the game in England's direction. He nutmegged Christoph Metzelder before whipping a dangerous cross into the front post. Michael Owen's positioning beat the two remaining German defenders and the slightest of touches deflected the ball into the German's net with nine minutes remaining. Beckham would live up to his nickname, claiming the golden ball for his part in England's second World Cup win, while Steven Gerrard won the Best Young Player award. It would be England's peak as a golden generation however. Portugal would tame England in the final of the European Championships in 2004, whilst France beat England in the semi-finals of the following World Cup. As was fate, England's generation granted to a halt after a loss on a rainy November day in 2007. Croatia denied England qualification to Euro 2008.
Portugal winners because they won their first piece of silverware in their backyard with a Euro 2004 win over England. Brazil losers because they were robbed of that 2002 World Cup. June 29th, 1958. Sweden undone by a teenager, losing 5-2 in the World Cup final. That teenager's name, Pele, or Pele if you're American. Since then, Sweden have dwelled around the periphery, not only in the World Cup, but in the European Championships. In fact, despite Sweden's glut of World Cup tournaments in the early days of the Jules Rimet Trophy, making the top four in three successive tournaments, Sweden wouldn't qualify for a European Championships until 1992. And even that was a matter of default, as they earned their place as hosts. But like in 1958, Sweden's campaign ended in defeat, this time a loss in the semi-finals. Like in 1934, 1938 and in 1950, and to world champions, Germany. Off the back of this, the likes of Andersen Lars and Brolin and Darlene led Sweden to a fifth semi-final in 1994, but they would ultimately miss out to Brazil again. So with this golden generation in the ranks, would Sweden capitalise on successive semi-finals? No. They would miss out on qualification for Euro 96 and France 98, despite being easily in the top 10 nations of Europe at the time. Since the 1994 World Cup, Sweden have only won one knockout stage match, a last 16 against Switzerland at the 2018 World Cup, going out in four group stages in five European Championships at the start of the 21st century. So how do we get Sweden to the 98 World Cup? So we've got to go all the way back to November the 10th, 96, Scotland versus Sweden at Ibrox, a 1998 World Cup qualifier. Scotland were coming off the back of a group stage exit at Euro 96. Sweden hadn't qualified, but they had got to the semi-finals of the World Cup in 1994, of course. Henrik Larsson, soon to be of Celtic, equalised John McGinley's early goal, and the game finished 1-1, seemingly inconsequential at the time. However, by the end of qualification, Sweden were left on 19 points, and Scotland were left on 18 points going in to the final day. Both won their respective games and Sweden qualified as the highest ranked second place on goal difference from Italy. Scotland would have to wait until Euro 2020 to play in another major tournament. Sweden had played Brazil twice at USA 94, drawing the group game and losing the semi-final. This time they met them in the groups alongside Morocco and Sweden's neighbours, Norway. Sweden started slowly. Caesar Sam Power opening the scoring inside five minutes in the tournament opener. Kenneth Anderson converted from the spot and the result was, as in the 1994 group stages, 1-1. Bordeaux was the venue for the All Nordic Affair. Havad Flo suck a punch in Sweden on the 46th minute, but Sweden would recover, Kenneth Anderson heading in an equaliser before Henrik Larsson put Sweden ahead on 66 minutes. Barring a bizarre Norway win over Brazil, Sweden could avoid a two-goal loss and qualify. Instead, Darlene got the only goal in a 1-0 win against Morocco. But Brazil would claim the winner's spot with victory over Norway in Marseille. But even seven points didn't guarantee Sweden's top spot, but instead they faced Group B winners Italy. By the time Christian Vieri had scored in 18 minutes, Sweden had opened up France 98's knockout stages with a quick-fire double from Henrik Larsson. Italy huffed and they puffed, but they could not blow the Swedish house down. Sweden escaped with a 2-1 win. A week later, it was France in the Stade de France. Sweden wouldn't replicate the 1994 semi-final, however, Zinedine Zidane finally turning on the style. Zidane grabbing a goal and an assist in a 2-0 win. Sweden were dumped out, France going on to win their first World Cup, 3-0 against Brazil. Sweden got through to Euro 2000 by topping a group featuring England, and in Brussels they had their easiest match, first out of the block. Lundberg and Alexanderson, who gained innumerable experience in France, scored the goals in a 3-2 win against Belgium, whilst Henrik Larsson got a run out, returning after a leg break. Henrik Larsson turned those minutes into the winner in Eindhoven five days later in a 1-0 win against Turkey. He'd get his second of the championships against Italy, but it was sandwiched in between the goals from Luigi Di Biagio and Alessandro Del Piero. Italy had got their revenge and they'd go through to the final only to lose. They'd lose to Sweden's conquerors. The opponents in Amsterdam were Portugal. Nuno Gomes was on a roll and he got his second of the tournament on 44 minutes. It was an equaliser for Freddy Lundberg's opener. The game went into golden goal extra time marred by the Abel Xavier handball. Xavier was sent off, Nuno Gomes too, both receiving lengthy bands. Henrik Larsson's third goal sent them through to another semi-final, but France were the conquerors, Zidane bagging a late penalty in normal time. France would march on to win Euro 2000. 
Meanwhile, Sweden would go beyond them in the next two tournaments, as France fell in the group stages of 2002 and the quarterfinals of Euro 2004 shockingly against Greece. Sweden won both groups in those tournaments, beating teams like England, Argentina and Italy. Golden Goal, a friend of Sweden's in 2000's quarterfinal against Portugal, was a huge friend in 2002, necessary to beat Turkey and Senegal in the knockout phase, before foes of 1994 reared their heads again in the semi-final. Sweden would lose again, finishing third in the World Cup again. But two years on, Sweden finally went one further and replicated 1958. But by the end of Euro 2004, replicating 1958 would prove a huge disappointment. Topping Group C gave them the Netherlands, won not by a goal made of gold, but by silver. Henrik Larsson again, his fourth goal of the tournament. Meanwhile, Kim Karlström scored twice in a 2-2 humdinger against Portugal in Lisbon. Then Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Henrik Larsson, Kim Karlström, Freddy Lundberg and Olaf Melberg converted the penalties. Sweden were to be in a final once more. The opponents in Lisbon were Greece, and surely Sweden would win their first title. Angelos Karasteas thought otherwise. Iceland and Panama both made their debuts at the 2018 FIFA World Cup and were handsomely dispatched in a tough group stage. A World Cup debutant that did last the entire tournament, however, was the video assistant referee, VAR, or VAR. On the whole, the decision to implement VAR was positive, with more goals given and largely correct decisions made. Whilst not being so intrusive to the overall play, the World Cup was allowed to flourish under FIFA rules, whether that can be said about the Premier League's implementation of VAR remains to be seen. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effects of the butterfly, and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if VAR wasn't in operation for the 2018 World Cup. For this scenario, we can only take a look at the group stage matches as the knockout stage match decisions that were overturned had different teams and players in, and we're not opening that can of butterflies up today. A little note before we begin, no World Cup changing decisions overturned or changed by VAR in groups A, B, D or G, so we're not going to touch those groups. Little decisions such as Egypt beating Saudi Arabia in a dead rubber and Switzerland losing against Costa Rica didn't have any effect on the standings in the tournament. In Group B, Spain, Portugal and Iran went into the final match needing a result to qualify, with Morocco eliminated with successive defeats to Portugal and Iran. Undeterred, Morocco clinched a 2-1 win over Spain in Kaliningrad after Igor Aspas' stoppage time equaliser was ruled out for offside. This left Portugal at the top of the group on 7 points as a potential Iranian equaliser from the spot was adjudged not to be a foul by the referee. The first decision to be overturned by VAR was in France's match with Australia in Kazan that was slowly ebbing towards a stalemate. The contentious penalty decision left France vexed, but play continued. Australia would receive a penalty which mildly Edinac converted to beat France in their opening game. Australia's second group game was changed drastically by a lack of decision on 38 minutes where Denmark wouldn't be penalised with a penalty. Denmark would go on to win the match 1-0. This left France third in the table going into the final showdown with Denmark in Moscow. France and Denmark would play out the only goalless draw of the tournament which left Australia needing just a point to qualify ahead of France, however goals from Andre Carrillo and Paolo Guerrero killed Australia's hopes of a second qualification from the group stages. Denmark topped the group and France finished in second place. There would be no more drastic a change to the makeup of a group than Group F. Sweden and South Korea were playing out a rather uneventful nil-nil in Nizhny Novgorod. What seemed a clear foul on Viktor Klaas and is waved away, and on the break, South Korea capitalised with a perfectly worked counter-attacking goal. Sweden toiled to a 1-0 defeat. With the group up for grabs by match day 3, Sweden's 3-0 win over Mexico is fruitless. However, it allows Germany to sneak in and snatch top spot. South Korea's opening goal remains ruled out, and with a deep punt up the field, Germany net a 90th minute winner through Julian Brandt. In the process, Germany leapfrog Mexico to finish top, while Sweden and South Korea are both eliminated cruelly. The tightest of all eight groups was Group H, which saw Senegal, Colombia, Japan and Poland separated by two points after Sadio Mane was adjudged to have been fouled. The Senegalese forward would score from the spot as Senegal romped to a win to top the group. This left Colombia in third, whilst Japan qualified in behind Senegal. This dramatically changed the round of 16, as Argentina would face Denmark in the first knockout phase match. Argentina's trio of goals was enough to see off Denmark 
In the quarterfinals, they would face Spain, who eked out a 2-1 win over Uruguay in their round of 16 contest. Croatia would still contest the third knockout stage game but would battle France where Kylian Mbappe and Paul Pogba goals were enough for the French to progress into the quarterfinals. Portugal would be waiting for them after a solitary Cristiano Ronaldo header clinched a win over the hosts, Russia. Germany, who progressed to the knockout stages by the skin of their teeth, had Switzerland in front of them in the round of 16. Switzerland, off the back of a defeat in the final group game, were picked off once more by Germany, but only on penalties. England would face them in the quarterfinals after beating Senegal in normal time thanks to a double from Harry Kane, who effectively confirmed his golden boot win in the process, his seventh goal of the tournament. The only unchanged quarter in the knockout phase were Belgium and Brazil's wins over Japan and Mexico respectively, which led to Belgium's 2-1 win over Brazil in the quarterfinals. Waiting for them in the final four was Spain who pipped Argentina via a penalty shootout. France finally clicked into gear with a 3-1 win over a floundering Portuguese side, Antoine Griezmann striking two penalties. Germany were taken to another penalty shootout in the quarterfinals, this time against England. In a historic moment, at least for the English, they finally won a World Cup penalty shootout and with Germany on the end of the defeat, it made the win all that much sweeter. The final four would be an all-European fair, as was fate. Vincent Kompany scored the only goal against Spain to gift Belgium a maiden World Cup final appearance. A gruelling contest against France would be the prize after the French overturned an early Kieran Trippier free kick with an equaliser from Kylian Mbappe in normal time and Antoine Griezmann's winner in extra time. England would snatch the bronze medal while Samuel Umtiti became the hero in the final, scoring a header from the corner in a third successive final to end 1-0. Winners, Germany, because they weren't embarrassed by a group stage exit, instead opting for embarrassment via a quarter-final penalty shootout defeat to England. Also winners, Spain, because a semi-final appearance against Belgium is a far better way to exit a tournament than a round of 16 penalty defeat to Russia. And finally Belgium, winners, because a maiden World Cup final is better than losing a semi-final, even if they still went out to the French and still 1-0 and still via Samuel Umtiti's header. Losers, Colombia and Sweden, because they wouldn't see the light of the World Cup knockout phase thanks to losses against Senegal and South Korea respectively in the groups. Argentina are one of a handful of illustrious nations to have won the FIFA World Cup multiple times. Brazil with five, Germany and Italy both with four, and France and Uruguay both with two share that same fact. With this in mind, it is not surprising that Argentina have an exceptional qualification record. In fact, Argentina have only failed to qualify for the World Cup once, and that was for the 1970 tournament. They hadn't played in World Cup tournaments between 1938 and 1954, that is true, but that was in part due to an almost 12-year disagreement with FIFA over the hosting rights for the 1938 World Cup. Since reaching the inaugural World Cup final in 1930 in a 4-2 loss to Uruguay, Argentina picked up a habit of being eliminated from the first round of the tournament. In 1934 they were defeated by Sweden. In 1958, after 24 years away owing to a world war, disagreements with FIFA and political interference, they returned to bow out in the group stages with losses to West Germany and Czechoslovakia. 1962 would be the final time Argentina got eliminated at the group stage until 2002, as they were edged out on goal average by England thanks to a 3-1 defeat. They were eliminated by England again in 1966, but this time Argentina broke their World Cup curse and made the quarter-finals. Being drawn against Bolivia and Peru in a qualification group for the 1970 tournament, Argentina were fully expected to qualify. Peru had only qualified through invitation in 1930, and Bolivia had only qualified automatically through invitation in 1930 and drew to South American withdrawals 20 years later in 1950. Argentina began qualification disastrously, with losses in Bolivia and Peru. The third game in the group between Bolivia and Peru ended in controversy, as match official Sergio Chelichev was paid off by Argentina and a Peru equaliser disallowed a perfectly good Peruvian goal. Bolivia won 2-1. Argentina replied with a 1-0 win over Bolivia in Buenos Aires. Seven days later, Peru visited. Argentina were bottom of the table and needed a three-goal win. Four goals were traded between the two sides in the final 20 minutes, but Argentina were left with a 2-2 draw and were subsequently eliminated. So even with the pain off of a referee, Argentina finished last, behind Bolivia. Peru qualified. Brazil ended up winning the tournament, beating Peru and Uruguay on the way in the knockout phase. Peru's high points were overcoming Bulgaria and Morocco in the groups to qualify for their first ever knockout phase. 
Argentina would reply with two World Cup titles in 1978 and 1986. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if Argentina qualified for the 1978 World Cup. In a stalemate of a first half, Peru had a perfectly good goal ruled out and Argentina rarely threatened. Peru found the net once more in the second half but again it was ruled out. In response, Argentina scored four, two via dodgy penalty claims to qualify emphatically for the tournament in Mexico. Amid obvious cries of match fixing, Argentina fulfilled their participation at the tournament and will qualify from the group inside two matches, with heavy victories over Bulgaria and Morocco. West Germany had their number in the final group game, winning 1-0. They were doing the quarter-final game against England, whilst Argentina were paired off with Brazil in their second successive quarter-final. Argentina were played off the pack, Rivellino, Gersinho and two from Tostao in a 4-1 thrashing on their way to a third World Cup in four tournaments. Reeling after another inability to replicate their peak of the 1930 World Cup, Argentina went again in 1974. Another defeat to Brazil, this time in a second group stage, had a part to play in another Argentine demise. They would finish bottom of the group, losing to eventual finalist Netherlands, as well as Brazil and had been held to a 1-1 draw with East Germany in what had become a dead rubber. Four years later, Argentina hosted the 1978 tournament amid heavy political discourse. It would spill out onto the pitch in near farce, but first Argentina succumbed to an opening defeat to Hungary. Argentina battled back with a 2-1 win over France. They remained reliant on France beating Hungary going into their final match with Italy. They needn't have worried, because despite requiring a win, Argentina were held 0-0 by Italy, but still went through after refereeing shenanigans that saw France run out 5-1 winners against Hungary. After finishing second, Argentina were drawn with Poland, Peru and their tormentors for the two previous tournaments, Brazil. Argentina matched Brazil's win over Peru with one of their own against Poland prior to their showdown on the second match day. Confident of Argentina's hopes, no outside measures were put in their place for the upcoming match against Brazil. They ran out 3-0 winners. Argentina were left stunned and were left needing a minor miracle to qualify for the final. In a delicate balancing act, Argentina needed to run up the goals against Peru but also ensure that Poland beat Brazil but finish on an inferior goal difference. Mario Kempes rubber stamped his already burgeoning prospects at winning the Golden Boot with six goals in an 8 0 rout of Peru. Meanwhile, Brazil was style filled by an insane four disallowed goals against Poland. However, Poland were unable to find the net. Brazil qualified for the final against the Netherlands by a single point with the stalemate. The Netherlands put them to the sword in the final, whilst Argentina had to settle with third place. They were made to wait for the World Cup until 1986. The winners, Netherlands, because they finally got hold of the World Cup in 1978 with a win over Brazil in the final. Argentina losers because they were made to wait for their maiden World Cup title until 1986. Argentina didn't have the best luck in the 1998 World Cup when it came to conceding absolutely mesmeric goals. They had gone behind in their first half of the last 16 tie with England after Michael Owen danced through the entirety of the team. Luckily there was the majority of the match to come and a little from a well-worked set-piece to equalise, a little from David Beckham being sent off, a little from a disallowed Sol Campbell goal, and a little from England being horrifically useless at penalties, saw them through to the quarter-finals. The Dutch were hardly dazzling either, whilst Argentina had comparatively sailed through, conceding their first goals of the tournament against England, the Dutch had struggled to draws against Mexico and Belgium, whilst thrashing South Korea by five to top the group. In the last 16, they dug themselves out of the hole with a last-minute Edgar Davids winner. Yet 12 minutes into the quarter-final in Marseille, Patrick Clivert put Laurent ahead. Claudio Lopez quickly hit back as was their remit in the previous match against England, and then with a sweeping long ball up to Dennis Bergkamp in the dying embers of the contest, the forward simply plucked the ball out of the air and with three touches eliminated Argentina from the World Cup. The Dutch would go on to finish fourth after missing out on penalties against Brazil in the semi-finals. Argentina have stumbled at the quarter-final hurdle or sooner in all but one of their World Cup campaigns between 1994 and 2018. In fact, ever since they won the World Cup in 1986, they have been eliminated by European opposition. It was the West Germans of 1990, Romania in 1994, the Dutch in 98, a combination of Sweden and England in the group stages of 2002, Germany via penalties in 2006, Germany via another quarter-final in 2010, Germany again in the 2014 final and France in a seven goal classic in 2018. Meanwhile the Dutch have either gone out to a Spanish or Portuguese speaking country in the World Cup tournaments that they have qualified for since 1994. 
but let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Dennis Bergkamp didn't score the last minute winner against Argentina in the 1998 World Cup quarter final. The game petered out into extra time and through tired legs and the threat of golden goal hanging over both of their heads, penalties. Argentina had a knack from 12 yards, they'd already shown as much in the previous round against England. In their previous World Cup shootouts both in 1990, they'd beaten both Italy and Yugoslavia on the way to the final. Only Veron who scored in the shootout against England was on the field for the quarter final, not that it mattered. Frank de Boer initiated the shootout by blazing over, and the subsequent converted penalties from Veron, Batistuta, Ayala, Zanetti and Claudio Lopez saw Argentina through. In 1990 they had to win two shootouts and beat a Brazil side to get to the final. In 1998, they had already won two shootouts, now they had just a Brazil side to beat to get to the final. However, this was a Brazil that had in the meantime won their fourth World Cup title and now had the talents of Ronaldo, Rivaldo and Roberto Carlos in their squad. Whilst the Dutch went home to prepare for the tournament that they would host in 2000, Argentina fell behind to a Ronaldo effort just seconds into the second half. Gabriel Batistuta pegged them back with three minutes left on the clock. With minds cast to extra time on the thought of a third penalty shootout, Argentina attacked, Roberto Ayala lumped a long ball up forward to the chest of Gabriel Batistuta, and Juan Sebastian Verón strode onto it beautifully, half volley, top corner, Argentina 2, Brazil 1. Brazil sunk to their knees, they were out of the tournament, they were almost certain to win. Now Argentina progressed into a final to face hosts France. The two sides had played each other twice competitively, the first of which was only the fifth ever World Cup match in 1930, Argentina won there. Fast forward 48 years from Uruguay to Argentina, where Michel Platini and Daniel Passarella traded goals in another win for Argentina, a result that eliminated France. And thanks to Zinedine Zidane it would be third time lucky for the French, winning 2-0 with two headers from the midfield maestro. Argentina would slay Brazil again a year later in the 1999 Copa America final. The entire tournament changed when Martin Palermo decided to score all three of his penalties and not miss them, which fed Argentina to Chile, rather than Brazil in the quarterfinals. Argentina withdrew from the 2001 Copa America but had qualified for the 2002 World Cup as one of the favourites. The Netherlands who again found themselves eliminated from a tournament on penalties, this time in their own home soil, at Euro 2000 didn't even qualify. Argentina claimed a win over Nigeria before David Beckham claimed a scrap of consolation in the second match. Then Argentina met Sweden in the all-important group match. Sweden and England had the advantage with four points whilst Argentina were a point behind and needed a win, especially after England eked out a draw with Nigeria. Two minutes from time, Hernan Crespo scored the winner. Sweden were out, Argentina were in. Not only were they in, but they were top, leapfrogging England who remained second. And whilst England were hapless to fall to Brazil in the quarterfinals, Argentina had a smoother road to saunter down. Senegal then Turkey in the knockouts, no problem. The World Cup semi-final had come down to Brazil and Argentina again. The winner would face Germany in the final. Nobody wanted a third Germany versus Argentina final, especially not Ronaldo, who toe-poked Brazil into the final before putting two more beyond Oliver Kahn in the German net in the final. Argentina winners. Yeah, they didn't win the World Cup in either 98 or 2002, but a Copper America that they otherwise wouldn't have won was sandwiched in and wasn't too bad. The Netherlands losers, because they couldn't make a World Cup semi-final losing on penalties. This doesn't sound too bad, however when you take the sequence started by Argentina in 1998 and then remember they were eliminated via penalties in Euro 2000 by Italy, Euro 2004 by Sweden, World Cup 2006 by Portugal and the 2014 World Cup by Costa Rica winning zero shootouts and losing five in a row, it seems as though they've got some sort of curse. A year after his international debut, Diego Maradona was effectively robbed of winning the 1978 World Cup on home soil by Argentina's manager at the time, who felt he was too young to play in a World Cup at the age of 17. Flashback to Pelé scoring in the 1958 World Cup final at 17. Maradona stuck around after the 1982 World Cup in Spain to play for Barcelona in a world record fee of £5 million. Maradona played all but five minutes in the World Cup as Argentina bowed out in the second group stage with losses to Italy and Brazil. Maradona was sent off five minutes from time against the Brazilians, with Argentina's fate already sealed. The 1986 iteration of the World Cup was an entirely different matter. Maradona now with four years of European football under his belt and now at Napoli dragged Argentina into the round of 16 in Mexico. Adding to his two goals from 1982, Maradona salvaged a point against Italy and would score two goals against England in the quarterfinals that would be spoken about forevermore in the space of four minutes at the Azteca Stadium in Mexico City. The first was of scandal, 
Maradona leapt above England goalkeeper Peter Shilton to punch the ball into the net. The second though was of beauty, Maradona running half the pitch to round Shilton in the English net to poke home the ball. Two more for Maradona in the semi-final against Belgium and a 3-2 win over Germany clinched a second World Cup for Argentina and a first for Maradona. The most notable match of the tournament and in fact Maradona's career still remains the quarter-final against England where the world saw the best and the worst of Diego Maradona. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if Diego Maradona's Hand of God goal was ruled out. 51 minutes in, Maradona's blatant punch into the net against England is disallowed by the referee, who sends the Argentine forward off for the offence. Argentina struggle for the remainder of the match, and with 9 minutes left, Gary Lineker fires in his 6th goal of the tournament, England progressing to the semi-final against Belgium. With just 3 days rest, the Belgians were picked apart by England, who had the match effectively sewn up inside 22 minutes through two Brian Robson goals and a Gary Lineker header. England sauntered through into their second World Cup final just 20 years after their first. Their opponent, well it was the same as 1966, West Germany. West Germany had toiled their way to the final, Lothar Matthäus snuck a winner against Morocco at the death in the round of 16, whilst penalties were needed in their quarter-final victory over Mexico. A tight semi-final was settled with goals early and late from Andreas Bremer and Rudi Voller. A second successive World Cup final for the Germans, and that is where the difference between the two sides stood in Mexico City. England were undone almost immediately through Karl-Heinz Rummenigger on 14 minutes. West Germany might have toiled their way through the knockout stage, but it was clear that England's final had already come two rounds previous. Their legs had run their course. Rudi Voller stuck a header in shortly before the break, and under the late June Mexico City heat, England wouldn't regain a foothold in the match. West Germany would keep their two goal advantage, unable to punish a flimsy England, but ran out comfortable winners nonetheless. Argentina would return to the final four years later, but West Germany would take that title too, via Andreas Bremer, and in 1994 courtesy of a failed Diego Maradona drugs test, Argentina bowed out at the round of 16 stage. The same tournament of which, Germany crashed out at the semi-finals to Italy and to Roberto Baggio. The winners. West Germany, because a third World Cup triumph was achieved and with sweet, sweet revenge over England. England, who were also winners, because a second World Cup final was reached and with a sweet, sweet win over Argentina. And the losers, Argentina, because their barrel in progress towards a final at the Azteca was grinded to a halt by Gary Lineker and England. The eve of the tournament, Spain are in utter dire straits. Julian Lopetegui has accepted an offer for the Real Madrid job. The next day he was sacked and by October the 29th he was sacked again, this time by Real Madrid after a 5-1 defeat to their Clasico rivals Barcelona in a season that ushered in yet another La Liga title for Barcelona. Lopetegui would bounce back winning the Europa League in 2020 with Sevilla and Spain would to an extent too making their first semi-final since winning Euro 2012 nine years later at the European Championships in 2021 but they had to plunge to some depths in order to get there. By some miracle, Spain topped their 2018 World Cup group despite shipping three goals to Portugal in the opening game with Fernando Hierro in temporary charge as well as drawing to Morocco, whilst Portugal could only manage a draw of their own against Iran. This meant the easier half of the draw for Spain where only one former world champion lived and even then it was 1966 winners England who weren't favoured to go very far. In the end, Spain wouldn't even make the quarter-finals, eliminated on penalties by host Russia as England made the semi-finals. Spain would return to a semi-final, in England ironically enough, under the stewardship of Luis Enrique at Euro 2020. Igor Aspas sent the sparse collection of Spaniards in Moscow into raptures as Spain progressed to the quarter-final at the expense of the hosts. Waiting for them in Sochi were one of the form teams of the tournament, Croatia, and they proved it in the first half, stunning Spain with an early goal from Andrei Kramaric. Thankfully for Spain, penalties would come, not in the shootout form, but late on in the second half when his goal was felled, and then in extra time when Dejan Lovren was deemed to have handled the ball. Sergio Ramos converted both. Spain made the semi-final of a World Cup for only the second time. The mighty England stood in their way, at only their third World Cup semi-final themselves, and it was Kieran Trippier who funded in a three kick for England inside five minutes in Moscow. The tie would be won in midfield however, and when Jordan Henderson, Jesse Lingard and Deli Alifaits co-care Sergio Busquets and Andres Iniesta, there was only one winner. 
Marco Asensio then David Silva backed the goals in a 2-1 win for Spain. Spirits were up as Spain entered a second World Cup final in three editions, but they would be slaughtered by France in the final. Antoine Griezmann, Paul Pogba and Kylian Mbappe all converged on a 4-1 victory for the French to lift their second World Cup. Revenge was sweet for England too as they beat Spain home and away in the newfangled UEFA Nations League qualifying for the finals. Fernando Hierro's side were relegated initially but that was deferred following the tournament's restructuring. Hierro earned himself a new contract with the national team for the side's performance in reaching the World Cup final. By the 2022 tournament however the RFEF were criticised heavily for that decision in retrospect. Among the less biased bookies, Spain were installed as favourites for the Euro 2020 tournament ahead of England and played all their group games at Seville, a boon for Hierro's side, or so it was fought. Spain's style of play was stifled by the dry Seville pitch in June as they played out timid draws with Poland, Sweden and Slovakia. The point, along with Sweden's win over Poland in St. Petersburg, had Spain through in third place but as the worst qualifier of the 16. With the third place qualifiers settled, it left Spain with an arduous task to reach the semi-final, with Belgium and Italy in their way. They occupied the same half of the draw as Slovakia, who tumbled out to Croatia, who in turn fell to Switzerland in the quarter-final. Spain were long gone by this point though, falling to a mesmeric Belgium with an equally mesmeric Kevin De Bruyne on the top of his game. Italy would be the representatives from the top half of the draw in the final, however, whilst England met them in the final after defeating Portugal. Italy would win the Euros, they would win the Nations League three months later after bypassing Spain in the semi-final. By the time Qatar 2022 rolled around, Fernando Hierro was living on borrowed time as the Spain manager, with football's worst kept secret Luis Enrique waiting in the wings to succeed him if Spain couldn't reach the quarter-finals, at the very least. Many Hierro defenders pointed to the fact that he was only the second man in Spanish history to take them to a World Cup final. Others pointed to the fact that the conditions in Qatar would be similar to Seville, hampering Spain's fluid passing system. And so it proved. Spain would be drawn against the European champions Italy, Senegal and Saudi Arabia. There was no confidence in Spain winning the group, but they ought to have been heavy favourites to qualify alongside Italy. Italy, who ransacked the group, Chiro Immobile scoring four goals in three wins. And after Spain defeated the group's whipping boy Saudi Arabia in the second match by a less than grand margin of one goal to nil, Senegal were next in Alcor. Senegal had the goal difference advantage after losing only 2-1 to Italy and thrashing Saudi Arabia 4-0 thanks to an Ismail Assar hat-trick. They needed just a point, but instead took all three. Senegal's counter-attacks were frightening as Sadio Mane swept home the first and Bai Diang the second in a 2-1 win, and while Senegal would bow out to Argentina in the last 16, Spain relieved Fernando Hierro of his duties, Luis Enrique taking charge ahead of the 2024 European Championship cycle. When you're plopped onto this earth and gain consciousness, your memories form a lot of, you're thinking about how the world operates and exists. This is true of course of football as well. For example, I gain an understanding of football from 1998 onwards believe teams such as Charlton Athletic to have an ingrained right to be in the top flight despite only gaining promotion in 1998 for what was only their fifth season in the top flight of English football since 1957. The same potentially could be said for Denmark around this time. Before France 98, Denmark had only appeared at one World Cup but from my point of view at least, I was about to watch them embark on four successive major tournament experiences, three of which included reaching the knockout stages. This led me to believe that Denmark were among the front runners in world football. And of course in 1998 it helped that they enjoyed the Laudrup brothers, they enjoyed Peter Schmeichel as well. Denmark would see those three international careers fade away. They'd be humiliated at Euro 2000, losing all three group games without scoring and face the indignity of losing 3-0 in a knockout stage match to a Sven Goran Eriksson era England side two years later. A much-changed younger Denmark appeared at Portugal in 2004 for the Euros, yet were beaten 3-0 in the first knockout round again, this time to Czech Republic in the quarter-finals. They were drawn with European champions Greece, Turkey and Ukraine in a highly competitive group, which also featured Albania, Georgia and Kazakhstan, let's not forget about them as well. In the end, Ukraine qualified with a game to spare, whilst Turkey won in Albania to secure a playoff spot. Meanwhile, Greece and Denmark's wins weren't enough, as the top four were separated by four points. Denmark missed their first tournament since 1994 and would follow that up by failing to qualify for Euro 2008, their first failure to qualify at the Euros for 28 years. In order to qualify Denmark for the World Cup, we don't really have to change any of Denmark's results, just Turkey's who are held 0-0 in Tirana by Albania, which mean that Denmark sneak in through the back door. As a result, Denmark draw Switzerland 
in the playoff Switzerland, who had been at just one World Cup since 1966. Valon Berami steals a late winner in Bern in a 1-0 win for the Swiss. However, Thomason's double and Dan Agger's header put Denmark through 3-2 an aggregate. Denmark's sternest test in the World Cup was France, drawn with them for the third successive World Cup. But this was a French side that stuttered with two draws to open up, first of which was a 0-0 against the Danes in Stuttgart. Denmark would gain momentum with a three-goal win over Togo and a Dennis Romadal winner against South Korea. Top spot in the group meant Ukraine in the last 16 a reunion from qualification and it took 120 minutes, but with Soren Larsson's 112th minute winner, Denmark went through to the quarterfinals. They had equaled their best ever showing at a World Cup, the quarterfinal from 1998. Italy stood in their way of beating that, but it was Italy who had scraped through Australia in the last 16 with a dubious late penalty from Francesco Totti. Denmark had yet to concede, Italy hadn't conceded at least by opposition, see Christian Zicardo's goal against America. Neither would again, Denmark going another 10 minutes, this time 0-0, Fabio Grosso missing the fifth and decisive spot kick, Denmark were through thanks to the conversion from Klaus Jensen. Denmark were in the semi-finals for the first time, but Germany awaited in the semi-finals, host Germany as well. Two games going to extra time admittedly took their toll on the Danes with Philipp Lahm, Michael Ballack and Miroslav Klose running the goals in a 3-0 win for Germany. And Germany would win World Cup number 4 at home, beating France on penalties in Zinedine Zidane's final game. Denmark would finish 4th behind Portugal in the World Cup and then set their sights on Austria and Switzerland for the European Championships in 2008. Denmark's qualification for 2006 ensured they'd be second seeds instead of Romania and qualified for the tournament alongside the Netherlands, whilst Romania eliminated Sweden to qualify. Romania would be fated with a group of death going out alongside France and behind the Netherlands and Italy. Meanwhile in Group D, Denmark beat Greece through Nicholas Bentner and Martin Lausen goals in a 2-0 win. A loss to favourite Spain followed, but crucially, the score was less than Russia's 4-1. They would lose 2-0. Spain were through, Greece were out, whilst Denmark needed just a point against Russia to qualify. Roman Pavel Yachenko opened up the scoring for the Russians, but John Dahl Tomlinson equalised late. Denmark were through to yet another knockout stage. Their fate was the quarter-final, the Netherlands were the supposed best team at the tournament, and then suddenly they stopped playing. Ruud van Nistelrooy scored on the 86th minute, but it turned out to be a consolation after Dan Agger headed in on 11 minutes with Nicholas Bentner doubling that tally. The winner would simply earn the right to lose to eventual champion Spain. Denmark lost 2-0 in the semi-finals just as they would in the group stage so Spain ended 44 years of hurt. Denmark's run in tournaments continued qualifying ahead of Portugal for the 2010 FIFA World Cup and their reward was the Netherlands again but a Netherlands side this time who were on the warpath to the final. Would Denmark join them? Well they rebounded from an opening loss to the Netherlands with Dennis Romadal's quick fire double claiming a 3-1 win against Cameroon in Pretoria. Again due to goal difference superiority, a draw was all that was needed in the final group stage match against Japan. John Dal Thomson got an 81st minute equaliser, Denmark were through to a fifth successive knockout stage. Italy's own failures in their group meant that Denmark faced Paraguay in the last 16. A war of attrition meant penalties where Dan Agger's Thunderpult meant a 6-5 win over the Paraguayans. But again for Denmark, it was for the right to lose to Spain in the next stage, another quarter-final exit this time. Their run of knockout stages ended with 2012's Group of Death, a win against the Netherlands harkened back to 2008 to open up the tournament, but losses to Portugal and Germany meant that they would be out of the groups. The only change in Denmark's qualification for the 2014 World Cup meant that instead of losing 4-0 to Armenia at home, they would win 1-0 and this ultimately was the difference between qualifying for the playoffs and not, and ultimately taking Croatia's place at the tournament. They would beat fellow Nordic country Iceland in a playoff 3-1 on aggregate, but the group stage exits continued, losing to Brazil in the tournament's opener and in 2016 they would, after pipping Sweden in the playoffs, couldn't beat Ireland in the groups and ultimately finished fourth in Group E. But they would beat Ireland to make the World Cup in Russia two years later, ultimately the bowing out of the last 16 against Croatia and then the semi-finals of Euro 2020 to England, the normal timeline being resumed in the late 2010s. The World Cup was as close to home soil as Scotland were ever going to get. They had an invitation to the party that we called the 1966 FIFA World Cup. 
They had missed out in 1962 but had travelled to two World Cups, first in 1954 where they failed to get out of the group not winning a game and then in 1958 where they, yes, failed to get out of the group and didn't win a game again. Scotland were right on the cusp of elimination until John Gregg denied Italy's qualification in the penultimate match day, a heroic 88th minute winner in front of 100,000 at Hampden Park. However, a heartbreak a month later in the reverse fixture. A draw would have forced a playoff as it did with Spain and Ireland and Bulgaria and Belgium. A win would have taken Scotland to their third World Cup. Unfortunately, they had to travel to Naples and got stunned 3-0. Scotland would not return to the World Cup until 1974 where they began a streak of five successive qualifications. Meanwhile, Italy were roundly embarrassed in England. First, they were beaten by a Soviet Union, which, you know, fair enough. But then in what was decided in the group, Italy met North Korea at Ayrson Park. The Koreans had no hope, that is until Pak Duik scored the winning goal to eliminate Italy. Italy's indignation turned into European champions two years later. Meanwhile, North Korea put three beyond Eusebio's Portugal in the quarter-final, but still wasn't enough in a 5-3 defeat. To get to the World Cup, Dennis Law claws a goal back to cancel out Poland's lead before heading in close range within five minutes. Scotland's winning run in qualification ensures that a win in Glasgow over Italy would confirm their place at the World Cup. John Gregg stepped up to break the deadlock on 88 minutes, denying Italy a place at the World Cup for the first time since 1958. Coincidentally, that was the last time Scotland were at the World Cup. Chile, North Korea and Soviet Union were the opponents in England, in the North East, right on the Tartan Army's doorstep. Game 1 at Roca Park versus Chile, Dennis Law at the double, a 2-0 win. Game 2, Soviet Union, Billy McNeil and Dennis Law's late goals finally broke Levy Ashin's resolve. Scotland entered 1966 without winning a World Cup game, now they had a place in the quarter-finals. The easiest game was Game 3, or at least it was supposed to be. Scotland underestimated North Korea and their fans were left furious with a 1-0 defeat. Soviet Union would follow them into the knockout phase but were quickly sent home by Portugal and Eusebio. For Scotland, it was returned to Sunderland to play Hungary. Goals from Law, Baxter and McNeil helped Scotland dispatch Hungary in a 3-1 victory and they moved to Liverpool to play West Germany in the semi-finals. Helmut Haller broke the deadlock for the West Germans but as was the theme of the tournament, Scotland left it eye-wateringly late, growing into the contest and finally earning a penalty with 17 minutes left on the clock. Dennis Law, a club legend on the other side of the Mersey, hammered in the vital equaliser. John Gregg headed in on 83 minutes, eliminating West Germany late on, as he did with Italy in qualification. The dream final was at Wembley days later, England versus Scotland. Wembley was packed to the rafters in scenes not seen since the White Horse final of 1923, and perhaps it was due to this that England started off sluggishly. Dennis Law silenced the English in London, firing him from long range. By the break though, England had drawn level through Jeff Hurst, a late replacement for Jimmy Greaves. With nerves shaken off, England were firmly in the driving seat. Martin Peters stole a second for England with 12 minutes remaining on the clock. Scotland had to press, they were desperate. A Jim Baxter effort cannons off an England defender and England break. Jeff Hurst completes the counter. England 3, Scotland 1. They thought it was all over. It is now. England were the winners but Scotland by no means were the losers, earning plaudits for getting deep into the tournament. The subsequent British Home Championship doubled up at qualification for Euro 1968 and Scotland had a chance to enact revenge. Scottish football was on the rise, Celtic were European champions in 1967 and mere days later Rangers claimed European silverware of their own, the Cup Winners Cup against Bayern Munich. 1967 was truly a banner year for Scottish football, 1968 though had the hallmarks to be even better. England stood in there wearing the return fixture in the Home Championship, winner take all, another Scotland win. This meant a quarter-final playoff against Spain to earn the right to play at the Championships. Dennis Law would score in both legs. The striker was the man that Scotland pinned their hopes on at Euro 1968. Italy and Scotland were joined at the tournament by Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. Scotland met the latter in the semi-finals in a humid Italian summer. 30 extra minutes in those conditions were not favourable for the Scottish. 30 extra minutes they wouldn't face. John Hughes netting at the death, a 1-0 win and Scotland were at successive finals and successive finals where they would play the home nation, this time Italy, in Rome. Italy didn't win to get to the final, only progressing by virtue of a coin toss. They were out for revenge on Scotland for World Cup qualification. They looked to be exacting that revenge, Luigi Riva volleying home inside 15 minutes. 
Despite the Italian pressure and dominance, Dennis Law dredged Scotland level before the brick. Law the hero in 1966, the hero for his club in 1968, and sure enough, he got his second of the match and the tournament. Rome was stunned, Europe was stunned, Scotland were European champions. The attention of Europe was on Scotland and their players were afforded bigger and better opportunities across the continent. They moved on to Mexico two years later, claiming the scalp of West Germany again, eliminating them, this time in qualification. Disastrous for the West Germans, yet Scotland marched on to Mexico City, beating Peru, Bulgaria and Morocco in the groups. Their reward, a rematch in the quarterfinals against England, champions of the world versus champions of Europe. No nerves, no caginess, just the match of the century. The hot climate, the pressures of the contest crumbled both defences. England romped to a 2-0 lead through Martin Peters and Alan Mullery to be equalised by Dennis Law and Bobby Lennox. Extra time followed, 30 sweltering minutes in Mexico. Lennox struck once more. Just as quickly as Scotland overturned the deficit, they would lose it. Jeff Hurst back in a brace either side of the half-time period in extra time. Scotland had lost their first game of tournament football in four years, to the same opponents no less. England's defence of the trophy would run right the way to the final, defeating Italy in the semi-final before falling to the great Brazil. Diego Maradona for some is the greatest footballer to have ever played the spot. He dragged Argentina kicking and screaming to successive World Cup finals in 1986 and 1990, lifting the Jules Rimet trophy in the former tournament. Argentina were humbled by Germany and Italy, but were running full speed towards the 1994 World Cup in the States. The experience of Diego Maradona and Claudio Caniglia was blended with the likes of Ariel Ortega, Diego Simeone and Gabriel Batistuta. They were one of the leading candidates to win the tournament alongside Brazil, Italy and Champions Germany. They would dominate Greece with a hat-trick courtesy of Batigol and a superb strike from Diego Maradona. A double from Claudio Caniglia secured a second win which qualified Argentina from the group. However, following the match, Diego Maradona was tested positive for ephedrine and was suspended from the remainder of the tournament. A loss to Bulgaria in the final group game plummeted Argentina from first to third in the group. Argentina would now play two days prior thanks to the change in the position and would be beaten 3-2 by Romania thanks to the brilliance of Georgi Hadji. Diego Maradona would never play for Argentina again and would retire from football in 1997 whilst at Boca Juniors. Argentina have yet to win a trophy since Maradona's failed drug test but have since reached one World Cup final and four Copa America finals. Maradona would appear at a World Cup once more, in a managerial capacity at the 2010 World Cup, where Argentina were beaten in the quarter-finals. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly, and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Diego Maradona didn't face a drugs test in the 1994 World Cup. Argentina were fresh off two back-to-back -back wins in the group stages and needed just a point against Bulgaria in Dallas to confirm top spot. Canigia and Batish Tutor would score twice, eliminating them from the tournament, and in turn qualified for the round of 16. Due to Bulgaria missing out on the knockout phase behind Russia in the best third place teams, Italy would play Romania whilst Argentina played Belgium. Mexico would play Nigeria in the round of 16, the winner meeting Germany or Russia in the quarterfinals. Claudio Canigia combined with Diego Maradona in the round of 16 contest in a carbon copy of their 1986 World Cup semi final, beating Belgium 2 0. Sending their way in the quarterfinals was Spain. Luis Enrique cancelled out a Batis tutor opener with four minutes remaining. The match would go to penalties. Argentina had developed quite the appetite for penalty shootouts in the World Cup, with successive wins in the previous tournaments against Yugoslavia and Italy to reach the final in 1990. Spain were beaten in the shootout, preserving Argentina's 100% record from 12 yards out. A reunion in the semi-finals with Nigeria was granted after JJ Okocha's hat-trick sunk Germany in the quarter-finals. Brazil had beaten Italy via a shootout in the other semi-final, with Roberto Baggio's magic touch dissolving at precisely the incorrect moment as he blazed his spot kick over in a loss. Brazil went into the final searching for their fourth World Cup title. They would face, after two moments of Diego Maradona at brilliance, South American opposition in Argentina. Argentina were seeking their third World Cup title, but it would be out of grasp for the Argentines. A poacher's goal in Pasadena sealed the tie in extra time from Brazilian Romero. Diego Maradona would retire from the international stage shortly after the tournament. Argentina winners because a third successive World Cup final only matched by Germany was achieved. And Nigeria also winners because they became the first African nation to reach the semi-finals of a World Cup after upsetting both Mexico and Germany in the knockout phase. And losers Bulgaria because after a historic run to the semi-finals wasn't met after a loss to Argentina, that led to a group stage elimination. And also Italy, also losers, because they didn't have a chance to win their fourth World Cup in the final and were beaten around early by Brazil. 1990, Turin. West Germany. Stuart Pearce 
Chris Waddle. 1996, London, Germany, Gareth Southgate. 1998, St Etienne, Argentina, Paul Ince, David Batty. 2004, Lisbon, Portugal, David Beckham, Darius Vassell. 2006, Gelsenkirchen, Portugal, Steven Gerrard, Frank Lampard, Jamie Carragher. 2012, Kiev, Italy, Ashley Young, Ashley Cole. 2018, Moscow, Colombia, Jordan Henderson, but stop, stop right there. The sequence didn't continue at the 2018 World Cup last 16 match with Colombia. Yes, Jordan Henderson missed, but so did Mateus Uribe and Carlos Baca. Eric Dyer's fifth kick wasn't missed, it wasn't to stay in the game, but it was to win the game. And for the first time, England had won a penalty shootout. Okay, if you forget about the Spain quarterfinal in Euro 96, which collapses this diatribe about the England penalty failures, admittedly. But this was a new England. This was England under Gareth Southgate. A man tortured by his own penalty miss had perhaps thrown the biggest footballing monkey from the backs. England would go on to equal their best overseas performance at a World Cup with a fourth place finish after they were defeated by an experienced Croatia in the semi-finals. Of course this is England and penalty heartbreak is never too far away is it? Three years on from vanquishing bad memories of tournaments gone by, from the penalties of the 90s, the golden generation of the 2000s and the downright poorness of the 2010s, England made their first final since 1966 on the continued stewardship of Gareth Southgate. But standing in their way of only ever a second ever international title was penalties and undoubtedly the team of the tournament, Italy. So Matthias Uribe's penalty sneaks in off the bar. Jordan Pickford keeps England in the game thanks to a strong hand from Carlos Backer's penalty and Eric Dyer's kick is to keep England in the game. He goes to the keeper's right, but so does David Ospina. Penalty woe for England again, and football ultimately wasn't coming home. Columbia march on, they squeak through thanks to Yerry Mina's fourth goal at the tournament, beating Sweden 1-0, and Colombia had gone one step further than in 2014, further than they ever have done. Croatia stood in their way, but Colombia had their talisman back in James Rodriguez. He struck early from distance, akin to his goal from the 2014 World Cup against Uruguay. Colombia had their way in the first half, but then the Croatia midfield settled in for the long haul. Perisic snuck an equaliser, Mina and Davison Sanchez switched off from a throw-in and Mario Mandzukic stole in. Croatia would lose the final ultimately, they'd be stuck in the real timeline, a last 16 exit to Croatia at Euro 2020. But let's stick with Colombia and the subsequent two Copper Americas. Duvan Zapata comes to the fore in Brazil in 2019, a double against Argentina and a 3-0 win in Salvador, and then he steals a late winner against Qatar, yes, Qatar, of Asia. And then the 100% record without conceding was accomplished against Paraguay. It fed them a harder quarter-final, but ultimately an easier half of the draw. They were taken the distance by Chile, but their defence stood firm, as did David Ospina once more. Colombia converted 4 from 4. Meanwhile, Ospina saved from Eduardo Vargas and Charles Aranguiz. Colombia's path to the final was clear, a tie with Peru in Porto Alegre to make their first Copa America final outside of Colombia. By the time Paulo Guerrero snatched a 91st minute goal for Peru, the first goal Colombia had conceded at the tournament, Colombia had run in four, James with a double, Mina from a corner and Duvan Zapata once more. Duvan led the Golden Boot Stakes and he would win it, but in a crammed full Maracanã, host Brazil won out once more. And it was a penalty in which Colombia lost Richarlison's 90th minute penalty in a 2-1 win for the Salasau. Luckily another Copper America is always just around the corner isn't it, and Covid ensured that qualification from the group was all but confirmed. Especially after successive wins against Ecuador and Venezuela, the bottom feeders of the group. Peru was slightly harder with Colombia scraping a draw, but the 1-1 was the kickstarter needed for Colombia. They were 12 minutes away from defeating Brazil in Brazil, but Roberto Firmino levelled the game. Colombia escaped from the group with 8 points, level with leaders Brazil, but with less goal difference. Second place means that they would be inextricably linked in the draw. Duvan Zapata sinks Paraguay in the quarterfinals, which means a return to Rio, a return to play Brazil, and Duvan Zapata strikes another one early, only to be replied with by Lucas Paqueta. At the halftime, Edwin Cardona comes off the bench, provides Luis Diaz with the winner, and suddenly Colombia were in the driving seat. They withstand the Brazil barrage, winning 2 1, and suddenly they were into only a second final outside Bogota. 
and they were playing a team who had waited even longer than they had for Copa America glory. Colombia had won in 2001 and Argentina and Lionel Messi hadn't won a Copa America or anything since 1993. Argentina of course were favourites, they had the wave of Lionel Messi behind them and Lautaro Martinez hit an early goal. Luis Diaz equalised either side of the half-time break and the game went to penalties. The weekend of July the 10th and 11th, two international finals, two penalty shootouts, more on that later. Argentina had lost Copa America finals before on shootouts 2015 and 2016, the latter still fresh in Messi's mind of course, and for Messi it was more 2015 than 2016, he would convert in the shootout. But like in 2015, his teammates let him down. Rodrigo de Paul and Leandro Paredes missed, whilst Yerry Mina had his spot kick saved by Emi Martinez and the game came down to Edwin Cardona. He converts, Argentina's wait for a trophy continues, meanwhile Colombia win a second Copa America. Now to the following day, England, Italy, the Euro 2020 final. Italy had been the best team at the tournament, England arguably the best defensively. Their only goals conceded came from set pieces, a Mikel Damsgaard free kick in a semi-final against Denmark and a Leonardo Bonucci goal from a corner in the final. And it was 1-1 after 120 minutes, another penalty shootout. The weight of the penalty shootout was heavier thanks to one more defeat from 2018. Andrea Bellotti has his penalty saved, Harry Maguire breaks a camera thundering his response in. Bonucci and Bernadeschi convert Italy's kicks, but in youth came ignorance. Marcus Rashford clatters one in off the post, Jaden Sancho sends Donnarumma the wrong way, and Jorginho, who had won the semi-final in the shootout against Spain, has to score to keep Italy in it. Pickford goes the right way, pushing the ball onto the post. England were European champions, and as fated, Colombia and England would be paired off in their World Cup group in 2022, with Argentina lurking in the same quarter of the draw. Carlos Alberto, also known as O Capital, wouldn't become O Capital until the 1970 World Cup. The Brazilian wing-back would go on to score arguably the best goal ever to have been scored at a World Cup in the 1970 final against Italy. Four years prior, however, Brazil manager Vicente Faiola couldn't find a place for him in his 22-man squad, despite being part of the initial training squad. Carlos Alberto had made his Brazil debut in 1964 in a 5 1 win over England and was an ever present in a Nations Cup that featured England, Argentina, and Portugal. He had earned seven caps when he didn't make the cup for the tournament, by which point he was transferred from Fluminense to Santos, where he would spend eight years and appear in 445 league games. Brazil started the tournament with a 2 0 win over Bulgaria at Goodison Park, but quickly exited the tournament with successive 3 1 defeats to Hungary and Portugal. Carlos Alberto was named captain by the new Brazil manager in the lead up to the 1970 World Cup. He was ever present as Brazil swept to a third World Cup title, beating Italy, Romania and Czechoslovakia in the groups, and Peru, Uruguay and Italy in the knockout phase. He would be cruelly ruled out of the 1974 World Cup through injury in another tournament where Brazil underperformed and finished fourth. Playing in his first competitive international in seven years, he would take part in Brazil's qualification for the 1978 tournament, but would retire halfway through the campaign. Brazil went one better, finishing third. 1966 was the low point of a purple patch for the Brazilian side, still recovering from the Maracanazo in the 1950 final. Their failure to qualify from the group was a bridge between two successes, with the double winning team in 1958 and 1962, and the 1970 winners in Mexico. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly, and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Carlos Alberto played in the 1966 World Cup. The 22-year-old right-back Carlos Alberto was in. The inexperienced defender made an immediate impact, drawing a save from the Bulgarian goalkeeper that led to Pele pouncing on a rebound inside three minutes. That laid down an immediate marker inside Goodison Park. Despite Bulgaria's attempts to kick Pele up and down the pitch, Brazil thrashed them 5-0. The easiest game, however, was out of the way, and two tossed-out goals in Pele's absence were the only scraps that Brazil could feed on. Brazil had been held 1-1 by Hungary before being beaten 2-1 by Portugal. Luckily, Brazil scraped through on goal average, joining Portugal in the quarter-finals. They would avoid hosts England but have a harder quarter-final against the Soviet Union in their path to the final. The new look front four of Garincha, Jairzinho, Tostau and Alcindor were all coming into their own, however. Garincha netted twice against the Soviet Union. Brazil had beaten them 2-0, their defence had strengthened as the tournament progressed. The two tournament favourites lined up as Brazil returned to Goodison Park for the semi-final. West Germany were next. The prize was England at Wembley. Carlos Alberto was now 23 and much wiser. 
Brazil achieved a clean sheet in the semi-final against West Germany despite the penetrative attack of Uwe Seele and Helmut Haller. Tostau struck early on for Brazil and after holding out for 70 minutes with just a one goal lead, Carlos Alberto led a breakaway down the right. He fed in Jairzinho, who put the ball beyond Hans Tilkowski and put the game beyond the West Germans. England at Wembley was the final hurdle between Brazil and a third successive World Cup title. Brazil's only match at Wembley came against the English just over 10 years ago to the date, in a team that featured Duncan Edwards and Stanley Matthews. England defeated Brazil 4-2. None of the Brazil 11 who lined up in the 1966 final played in that match 10 years ago. Garincha and Jeff Hurst swapped goals in the opening embers of the match, and just when it looked as though the final would be decided by extra time, Carlos Alberto popped up on the right flank after a well-worked move by the Brazilians. A dagger of a shot straight through the English defence and straight into the net, into their heart. Brazil were three-time champions of the world. They would clinch a fourth successive world title four years later in Mexico against Italy and reached a fifth final in 1974. The total football of the Dutch and the natural successors to the old Dinamonier in Brazil side and they ran out 2-1 winners. Carlos Alberto's international career would end with a third place playoff in Argentina, a 3-0 win over Poland after losing out narrowly to the Netherlands in the second round group stage. The Netherlands without Johan Cruyff would lose 3-1 to Argentina in Buenos Aires. Brazil winners because they marked a sustained period of dominance by winning every World Cup from 1958 to 1970. And the only losers today are England because they, along with their fans, will still be banging on about how they got to a World Cup final and not winning a World Cup. After much wrangling, South Korea and Japan were selected as co-hosts of the 2002 World Cup in May 1996 after a three-nation race between the Asian nations and Mexico. When the two had been elected to host the tournament, Japan had never been to the World Cup, while South Korea had been at just four tournaments. South Korea were the second Asian nation to ever qualify for the World Cup in 1954, after the Dutch East Indies participation in 1938. Asia hadn't seen multiple nations at a World Cup until 1986, when Iraq qualified alongside South Korea. Japan and South Korea qualified as part of an expanded 32-nation World Cup with Iran and Saudi Arabia, making up the numbers for Asia in 1998. The only Asian winner at the tournament was Iran's in their much-anticipated clash with the United States. No Asian nation progressed to the knockout stages. In fact, up until the staging of the 2002 World Cup in the Far East, only North Korea in 1966 and Saudi Arabia in 1994 had qualified to the knockout stages. Neither Japan or North Korea had won a single World Cup game as the opening game kicked off in the 2002 tournament between France and Senegal. Senegal's 1-0 win over world and European champions would be an indication of things to come. They both kicked off their tournaments on June the 4th, 2002. Japan were made to wait for their maiden World Cup win, but did get a creditable 2-2 draw with Belgium. Alternatively, South Korea beat Poland 2-0. Japan's first win was five days later in Yokohama, a 1-0 win over Russia. The two nations would finish with almost identical records, both topping the groups with seven points. South Korea finished their group stage campaign with a 1-0 win over Portugal, a match that eliminated their European counterparts and was marred by the red cards to Yao Pinto and Beto. The European grievances against officiating would continue. Japan's World Cup would end at the round of 16 stage at Turkish hands, while South Korea would power on controversially against Italy. The worst of a litany of bad refereeing decisions was Francesco Totti's second yellow card for diving in extra time. The scores were locked at 1-1 and a converted penalty under the golden goal ruling would have ended South Korea's tournament. Italy could have arguably had a penalty in normal time, when Alessandro Del Piero was elbowed in the box. It wasn't given whilst Christian Panucci was adjudged to have brought Sol Ki Hyung to the ground three minutes in. There was little contact if any, but Gianluigi Buffon would save An Jun Wang's spot kick regardless. Damiano Tomasi had a perfectly good goal ruled out for offside before An Jung Wang clinched the win for South Korea on 117 minutes. The winning goal resulted in the termination of his loan to Perugia for the following season. The controversy wasn't over. South Korea met Spain in Guangzhou for a first quarter final where Spain had two goals ruled out. First, Ruben Barayas' seemingly good header was chalked off for a foul and Fernando Morientes' golden goal winner was adjudged to have gone out of play in the build-up. South Korea went through to the semi-final on penalties, where they would be beaten by Germany. Japan and South Korea would return to the knockout stages in 2010, where they were beaten by Paraguay and Uruguay respectively. Japan have since graced the knockout stages once more in 2018, losing to Belgium 3-2. South Korea's tainted wins over Italy and Spain remain the only Asian knockout stage wins in World Cup history. Since they both hosted the World Cup in 2002, they have been both ever-presents, making the knockout stages three times between them. 
the World Cup partially returned to the continent in 2018 with Russia's Asian host city of Yekaterinburg and will return fully with Qatar's controversial hosting of the tournament in November and December 2022. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... South Korea didn't get the help of referees at the 2002 World Cup. Portugal held on to a 0-0 draw in their final group game against South Korea, despite the red card of Yao Pinto for a horror challenge on Jisung Park. For their part in the draw, Portugal would leapfrog United States on goal difference despite their 3-2 defeat against them earlier on in the tournament. As runner-up in the group, Portugal were theoretically handed the harder match against Mexico, while South Korea faced Italy in the round of 16. Goals from Luis Figo and Pauletta in a 2-0 win confirmed a first quarter-final tie for Portugal since 1966. Meanwhile, South Korea dragged Italy to extra time in Dijon. A blatant foul on Francesco Totti was given as a foul on 103 minutes. Totti dusted himself down to convert the penalty that stopped the game under the golden goal rules. Joining Italy in the quarter-final was Spain, after they scraped through against the Republic of Ireland on penalties. In the groups, they had waltz past Paraguay, South Africa and Slovenia, with three successive wins whilst Italy relied on Ecuador's surprise 1-0 win over Croatia after fumbling to a draw against Mexico to qualify. Prior to an all-European quarter-final in Guangzhou, another all-European quarter-final took place the previous day. Michael Balak had scored the only goal to extinguish Portugal's hopes of emulating Eusebio's 1966 side and reaching the final four. Germany would face the winner of Spain and Italy, which for a long time appeared to be Spain after Fernando Morientes' header early on in the first half. As Spain tired and Italy looked towards their depth from the bench, Italy's experience shone through. Italy had their hearts broken by France after extra time in the previous two tournaments, via penalties in the quarterfinals of France 98 and via a David Trezeguet golden goal in the Euro 2000 final. Meanwhile, Spain had a group stage exit in 1998 and a quarterfinal defeat to France in 2000 to their name. Christian Vieri tapped in late on to take the game to extra time and would net a header in the second period of extra time to win the game via the golden goal rule. Spain fell and in the semi-final so would Germany. Michael Ballack's yellow card in the 71st minute proved to be the turning point. The card meant a suspension for the German midfielder in the World Cup final and Italy pounced on that fact, Alessandro Del Piero scoring moments later before Germany could recollect themselves. Ronaldo and Brazil would prove too good for Italy in the final, the Brazilians striking twice in Yokohama for their fifth World Cup triumph. Winners, Italy, because they reached another World Cup final at the expense of Germany and Portugal another winner because they wouldn't be humiliated with a group stage exit but with an appearance in the knockout stages for the first time in 36 years. South Korea loses because their run would end at the round of 16 stage at Italian hands and not the glory of a fourth placed finish. United States also loses because they had their knockout stage dreams snatched away from them with a Portugal draw against South Korea. And Germany our final losers because they would not go to a World Cup final. nineteen eighty six. Diego Maradona was the most expensive footballer in world football for the second time in his career with a five million pound switch from Barcelona to Napoli in nineteen eighty four. A twenty one year old Maradona had announced himself on the world stage in the nineteen eighty two World Cup, with two goals and a red card, as Argentina crashed out of the second group stage. Four years later, Argentina were once again amongst the favourites to lift the Jules Rimet trophy, as they had done on home soil in nineteen seventy eight. Maradona would lift the golden ball, finish second in the golden boot and score the infamous hand of God and the goal of the century within four minutes with each other in a quarter-final against England as Argentina won the World Cup for a second time. However, this was only possible thanks to a match in June 1985. Argentina and Peru were locked in a showdown in Buenos Aires. Peru needed to win to qualify automatically, whilst Argentina needed just a point to secure qualification to the 1986 World Cup. Peru led 2-1 going into half-time and looked set for a fourth World Cup qualification in 16 years. Nine minutes from time, however, Argentina scraped through with an equaliser. Peru advanced to the playoffs where they would be beaten 5-2 on aggregate by Chile in the semi-finals, who in turn would be dispatched by Paraguay in the final. Peru would have to wait until 2018 to qualify for another World Cup, whilst Chile would have to wait until 1998. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Argentina didn't qualify for the 1986 World Cup. With a 2-1 loss at the Estadio Monumental, Argentina surrendered their automatic qualification spot in the World Cup to Peru. Uruguay and Brazil joined the Peruvians. Argentina were paired off with Chile in the playoff semi-final and were beaten 4-2 in Santiago. Even a Diego Maradona masterclass in the return leg couldn't help Argentina as they won 2-1 but went out 5-4 in aggregate. 
Chile, buoyed by eliminating Argentina, would sneak through against Paraguay 2-1 on aggregate in the final. Peru would kick off their World Cup with a 2-0 win over South Korea, whilst inversely losing by the same scoreline three days later against Italy. With qualification all but assured, Peru ran out 2-1 winners over Bulgaria on the final match day to confirm second place and a tie with France in the round of 16. Chile finished similarly in second place and would meet England in the second round after progressing undefeated. A 3-0 thrashing of Iraq in Toluca was followed by a 0-0 stalemate against host Mexico and a 2-2 draw against Belgium. With Italy's top spot clinched in Group A, they would be gifted Uruguay as opposed to Peru's opponent of France. Neither side would make the quarterfinals, as a Michel Platini performance containing two goals sunk Peru 3-0. Meanwhile, Italy maintained a clean sheet but would go out to Uruguay on penalties. This left Uruguay with a resurgent England in the quarterfinals, who, on the verge of elimination from the tournament, registered successive 3 0 victories over Poland in the group and Chile in the round of 16. An Azteca quarterfinal stalemate was quelled with a late winner from Gary Lineker on 81 minutes. 20 years after winning the World Cup on home soil, England were dreaming of another World Cup final. And as fated, England would breeze through the Belgians, with goals from Brian Robson and a seventh of the tournament from Gary Lineker. The same opponents as 1966 would materialise in 1986, West Germany. Without the stern test of the Argentines in the quarterfinals and a relatively simple path to the final, England were fresh going into the final. Alternatively, West Germany had struggled to a penalty win over Mexico in the quarterfinals and had to beat European champions France in the final four. Gary Lineker headed his eighth of the tournament to head England into a lead inside four minutes just as West Germany led England in 1966. They kept the lead beyond the half-hour mark, the half-time mark and the hour mark. English eyes remained on the clock. But with 15 minutes left on said clock, West Germany levelled emphatically. Karl-Heinz Rummeniger struck from distance to level the match-up. Just moments later, a 1-0 England lead was turned into a 2-1 West German lead. Rudy Voller headed in on the back post. England had melted under the Mexican heat of June, West Germany had got revenge for 1966 and England had bottled their second final. The winners. Peter Shilton first, because he wasn't embarrassed by Diego Maradona for being outjumped by a 5 foot 5 Argentine. Peru also winners because they made the knockout stages for only the second ever time. And West Germany of course winners because they lifted a third World Cup and got sweet sweet revenge over England. Losers are only losers today at Argentina because what would have been a second World Cup title in 8 years was watching Germany lift their third World Cup title from the comfort of their sofas. Five days prior to the 2014 World Cup final, Germany were the perpetrators of the Mina Rizal, a record scoreline for a World Cup semi-final as Germany thrashed the host Brazil 7-1. They were then expected to go to Rio in the final and put aside Argentina in the final with ease, a team that had gone through the tournament undefeated. They had gone through the tournament undefeated but had done so arguably less gracefully than Brazil and certainly less so than Germany in the prior four weeks. But the World Cup final simply just happened. A goalless 113 minutes in the Maracanã was ended by a Mario Goetze volley that gave Germany the necessary victory. A fourth in the World Cup and a first since German reunification and left Argentina and Lionel Messi predictably in tears. And tears would tumble down Argentine faces in the subsequent two summers as they lost in successive finals against Chile by the closest margin of a penalty shootout. Lionel Messi retired from international football heartbroken and without an international trophy. He will be back two years later in time for the 2018 World Cup in Russia where Argentina were left similarly heartbroken again, winning one match in four and bowing out at the last 16 phase, all kick-started by a goal that never was. Those goalless 113 minutes in the 2014 World Cup final all hinged on and were allowed to continue thanks to Gonzalo Higuain's goal chalked off by a clear offside. Had it stood, would Argentina have clung on to the World Cup, their third and tie level with Germany, or would the golden generation of talent with Lionel Messi reaching the end of his peak fizzle out with missed finals between 2014 and 2016 and their early elimination in 2018? But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Gonzalo Higuain's goal in the 2014 World Cup final stood. Despite being clearly offside, Gonzalo Higuain had fired Argentina into an unjust lead. Germany huffed and they puffed, but they wouldn't get a goal inside 113 minutes. Nobody would, as the 113th minute in the game between Germany and Argentina wouldn't exist. The likes of Romero, Mascherano, Messi, Higuain and Di Maria, who all made the all-star team and impressed in the knockout stage, all played a blinder in clinging on desperately to the 1-0 win, and subsequently, Argentina won their third World Cup. The sides had met seven times in the tournament, Germany winning five, but crucially, both of Argentina's wins came in finals in 1986 and now 2014. 
12 months later, Argentina barreled through the Copper America thanks to goals from Aguero, Messi and Higuain in wins over Paraguay, Uruguay, Jamaica and Colombia to get to the semi-finals, and another contest with Paraguay. Six Argentine goals followed, and they were safely into the final for the first time in eight years. They hadn't won it since 1993. Messi, Higuain, Benega, Rojo and Levese all got the goals, whilst Beausejour missed the crucial penalty. Twelve months later, almost to the day, the two sides were in the exact same spot. Argentina bested Chile in both sides opening match of the tournament, as well as Bolivia and Panama in the groups, whilst both Mexico and Colombia fell in the knockout. Chile had beaten the same opposition in the groups and surpassed Venezuela and host the United States in the knockout. Chile had scored 8 in the knockouts, Argentina 9, but in the final, the same result. 120 minutes of goalless football and a penalty shootout initiated with a conversion from Lionel Messi. Lucas Biglia followed suit with Argentina's fourth kick, as did Eric Lamella with the fifth. Argentina 5, Chile 4. The World Cup was next. Their campaign began in Moscow with a thunderbolt from Sergio Aguero and a penalty from Lionel Messi in a Teche opening win against Iceland. Next was Croatia, Argentina's main rivals in the group stage, a pulverisation in Nizhny Novgorod. First from Angel Di Maria, then from Sergio Aguero and then a third in stoppage time from Lionel Messi. They confirmed a 100% record in the group stage and a knockout phase match against Denmark, a day after Croatia were eliminated by France, 4 goals to 3. The penalty shootouts in their last three tournaments wouldn't be seen in 2018. Messi got the only goal against Denmark, Aguero the only goal against host Russia, and then after 120 minutes, a double from Angel Di Maria to overturn an England win in the semi-final. And so was the trend between the finals of 1986 and 1990. Argentina would win a World Cup final and follow it up with another. And just like in those finals, Argentina won the first, but were left with a defeat in the second final four years later. But this time, not to a solitary West German penalty. Instead, it started with a penalty given courtesy of the implementation of VAR, a system that rushed into being because of Gonzalo Higuain's illegal winner in the previous tournament. Goals from Pogba and Mbappe secured a 3-1 win for France in Moscow. Argentina winners as they would enjoy a four-year period of utter dominance in world football. First came the fortunate World Cup win in 2014, the successive Copa America wins over Chile, and then a run to the final in the 2018 World Cup. Losers, Croatia because they wouldn't reach their World Cup final in 2018, instead bowing out to France by conceding four in the last 16 and not the final. And also Chile their losers too, because they lost successive Copa America finals in 2015 and 2016. Don't lie, you thought it went in as well. Deep in the heart of the Amazon jungle, England and Italy lined up for the opening clash in the group of death at the 2014 World Cup. Pubs stayed open for the 11pm kickoff up and down the country. Pre-drinks included a shocking Costa Rica win over the much favoured Uruguay. The best team Costa Rica had previously beaten at a World Cup was Sweden in 1990. Sorry, Scotland. This left a much higher importance on the England vs Italy clash later on that night. The winner would essentially win the group because Costa Rica couldn't spring another surprise, could they? So as I was saying, England and Italy lined up in the opening group game. A few minutes of light sparring ensued. Enter Raheem Sterling. He'd only made his professional debut in 2012. He was 19 but he almost dragged Liverpool kicking and screaming to a first ever Premier League title. He let fly from 30 yards. Salvatore Sirigu was completely and utterly stranded in the Italian goal. The net burst. Beer everywhere. The scoreboard read, England won, Italy nil. Just like four years ago in South Africa, England had got off to a blistering start just three minutes in. We all know how that tournament went. Things were going to be different this time. We'll beat Italy, we'll probably beat Uruguay, and we'll definitely beat Costa Rica. And our potential opponents from Group C, Colombia, Greece, Ivory Coast or Japan, piece of cake. We'll probably go all the way. You know Wayne Rooney will get a statue outside Wembley right next to Sir Bobby Moore? And then it happened. People had stopped celebrating. Raheem Sterling wasn't even celebrating. The scoreboard went back to 0-0. Italy played on from a goal kick. England go on to lose 2-1. And then lost 2-1 again five days later in Sao Paulo to Uruguay. England's hopes rested on an essay's worth of permutations. Italy must beat Costa Rica. That's a given. England must beat Costa Rica. That's also a given. Italy must beat Uruguay, which is a bit of a stretch, but they're not four-time world champions for nothing, right? And what's that? Costa Rica have just beaten Italy? Well, I guess I'll see you at Russia 2018 then. Not that I'm holding out much hope for that. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly, and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Raheem Sterling scored that goal against Italy. The goal graphic encapsulates the scoreboard in the corner of the screen. When the scoreboard returns, it reads England 1, Italy 0. 35 minutes later, his Liverpool teammate joins in on the action. Daniel Sturridge, that little dance that he does. 
2-0 at half time. But for a clever dummy from Andrea Perlo leading to an Italy goal, England cruised through the match unblemished. They win 2-1 in an eerily comfortable match. Rumblings of hysteria are present back home. Five days later, the hysteria is tempered somewhat by a Luis Suarez masterclass in Sao Paulo. Another day later, the hysteria is tempered even further by a Costa Rica win over Italy. This leaves Costa Rica at the top of the pile with maximum points. England on three points on an even goal difference, only pipping Uruguay by one goal. Italy have zero points. They need Costa Rica to beat England and a win over Uruguay, preferably by over two goals. Of course, Luis Suarez still bites Giorgio Chiellini, and of course Italy still capitulate in the 81st minute through Diego Godin's header. And it's this header that forces England's hand. It would played out a largely uninspiring 0-0 up until the 75th minute in Belo Horizonte, the same city where England had the ignominy of losing to part-timers USA in 1950. Up stepped Daniel Sturridge, the dance, 1-0 to England. Wayne Rooney took a tumble under the weight of a hefty Christian Gamboa challenge. He dusted himself down to score his second goal of the tournament. England topped the group and were off to Recife to play Greece. Greece, similarly through by the skin of their teeth, were led by Socrates Papasopoulos and other easy to pronounce footballers. England sauntered through to the quarterfinals to play Louis van Gaal's Netherlands. For all the promise that the 5-1 hammering of Spain showed, the Netherlands were wilting. They stumbled through a late win over Mexico in the previous round and they even went behind against Australia in the groups. Australia, Sterling and Surridge as they had done so well for their club in the previous season, combined to deadly effect. The Netherlands were defeated 2-0. Argentina were next. Sao Paulo, the scene of England's loss to Uruguay earlier on in the tournament. Messi had put on a man of the match display against Switzerland in the round of 16 and had scored four goals in the group stages. He had effectively won seven of Argentina's nine points on his own in wins over Nigeria, Iran and Bosnia-Herzegovina. His war path to the final at the Maracanã wasn't going to be stopped by a dancing Liverpool striker and Roy Hodgson. Determination was increased as Brazil had fallen 7-1 the previous night to the Germans. England hearts were broken 4-2. Messi scored all four. Messi added a ninth in the Maracanã four days later to win the World Cup in extra time. An Argentine doing a lap of honour in Rio de Janeiro with the Jules Rimet trophy. You just couldn't write those sort of headlines. Thank you for sticking around for another fanciful England scenario. Here's the winners and losers. England, an obvious winner. England don't usually get to major tournament semi-finals, and you could probably tell by my desire to provide you with alternate universes where England do get to major tournament semi-finals. Argentina, the biggest winners. Messi finally got his hands on the biggest prize in world football, and Argentina ended a 28-year wait to regain the World Cup. Germany, a big loser. They didn't win the fourth World Cup, which the whopping semi-final win over Brazil demanded. And of course, who could forget Roy Hodgson, a winner, without actually winning anything. Hodgson would stay on as England manager by the will of the people and gave the public a penalty defeat in Euro 2016 to Germany. Well, I had to keep something realistic. Indulge our English bias for a moment, will you? December 2009, England, one of the eight seeded teams, are handed United States, Algeria and Slovenia for their upcoming World Cup draw, a group branded Easy by a British hate rag masquerading as a newspaper. During the 18th, 2010, the two favourites for the group England and USA are held in their fixtures. Wayne Rooney criticises his fans live on the pitch in front of billions watching. Slovenia top the group. Five days later, Jermaine Defoe scores the only goal in a less than stellar England performance. When the full-time whistle blows in the 1-0 victory, Algeria are toiling to let another goalless draw against the Americans in Pretoria. America were crashing out of the tournament at the group stages for the third time in four World Cups and Slovenia into their first ever World Cup knockout stage. England were to play Ghana and then probably Uruguay in the quarterfinals, with a possible semi-final against Brazil, who were hardly at the peak. Could England go all the way? The omens were there. 1966 they started the World Cup with a draw but still won it, and then Landon Donovan scored a last minute winner against Algeria and England were stuffed 4-1 by Germany. In a post-goal generation world, England had the promise of Fabio Capello as manager and a decent squad. In reality, the defeat in Bloemfontein would be Capello's final tournament match as England manager. England were consigned to more years in the wilderness, a penalty shootout defeat in the subsequent European Championships, followed by embarrassing exits at the group stages at the World Cup in 2014 and the humiliation of losing to Iceland. Oh, and the United States didn't even have the decency to continue their form and beat Ghana, like England clearly would have done, crashing out of the last 16. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if Landon Donovan didn't score the last minute winner against Algeria at the 2010 World Cup. 
the United States are handed their flight tickets and quickly scurry back home while Slovenia prepare for their match with Germany in Bloemfontein. They're not too far behind the Americans in returning home, shipping four goals in the last 16 clash. England at this time were still reeling from the events of the night before. Rustenberg seen of that Rob Green howler saw Ghana line up against England in the last 16. Viewers back home had watched Uruguay squeeze through the challenge of South Korea earlier on in the day in Port Elizabeth with a late Luis Suarez goal. A win against Ghana would surely be coupled with a first World Cup quarter-final win in a generation. And within five minutes, Kevin Prince Botang had fired Ghana into a 1-0 lead over the English. The African contingent in attendance couldn't believe their eyes. The great Fabio Capello, the great England, were being put to the sword by Ghana at only their second World Cup. Ghana almost went further ahead courtesy of Asamoah Gyan, and England went into the break fortunate to still be in the match. In spite of the recuperation of half-time, England toiled further in the opening quarter of an hour in the second half, right up until the point of substitute Emil Heskey bumbling through the Ghanaian defence. Scenes of England's clash against Cameroon in 1990, an England forward took a suspicious tumble in the box against the run of play and earned a fortuitous penalty. Unlike 1990, however, their star striker put the ball into orbit, a Ghanaian reprieve. Asamoah Gyan made true on his goal-scoring promise in stoppage time via a counter-attack. Ghana 2, England 0. England were out, Fabio Capello was sacked. Ghana headed into the quarter-final with the weight of African hope on their shoulders, as the only continental representative left in the tournament. Sully Muntari hit twice against Uruguay, another 2-0 victory for Ghana, a first African nation in the semi-finals of a World Cup. And inside 18 minutes of that semi-final, the goal of the tournament put a pin in the hopes of an entire continent. Gio Van Bronckhorst strode onto the ball and hit one from 30-35 yards out, it found the net. Goals from Wesley Schneider and Ian Robin in quick succession killed the game. Ghana had lost 3-0 but had got to within 90 minutes of the World Cup final. Ghana would take 4th place, shipping another 3 goals against Germany in the playoff, but returned home from South Africa proud. A month later, once all the dust was beginning to at least fall back to earth and settle, the English FA still hadn't appointed a new manager. Their first choice, Roy Hodgson, had been signed by Liverpool the day prior to Capello's sacking. Second choice, Harry Redknapp rejected England's advances in favour of taking Tottenham Hotspur into their first ever Champions League campaign. England bided more time and with the abrupt resignation of Martin O'Neill from Aston Villa, the FA acted quickly. Stuart Pearce took England for the friendly victory over Hungary, but by the time the Bulgaria and Switzerland fixtures for Euro 2012 qualifying came around, O'Neill was in the hot seat. Two points dropped in eight matches, including a memorable 4-0 win away to Wales, confirmed England's safe passage to Poland and the Ukraine. O'Neill was undefeated as England manager, and three wins in preparation friendlies against Netherlands, Norway and Belgium confirmed hope heading into the tournament. Hope teamed once again with the crippling weight of expectation. Expectation exceeded in the opening encounter with France in Donetsk. Julian Lescott and Wayne Rooney goals against the French was followed up with wins over Sweden and the Ukraine. England finished a tournament group stage with a 100% record for the first time since 1982. In that tournament, toothless draws against West Germany and Spain confirmed England's exit. 30 years on, however, O'Neill took England to a final with Spain in Kiev after beating Germany in the semi-final thanks to two Wayne Rooney goals, a Wayne Rooney on course for the Golden Boot. A surprisingly lacklustre Germany were far inferior to the Italians that England had met in the quarter-finals. However, England had practised penalties for once and bucked their shootout trend by beating the Italians 5-4. Spain, however, were on a different plane. David Silva, Jordi Alba, Fernando Torres and Juan Mata, 4-0, England were crushed. Yet they had just competed in their first final for almost half a century, so they rode through the World Cup qualification with a growing sense of optimism. Optimism that 2014 could be their year. 48 years of hurt evaporating. Due to England's performance in Euro 2012 and only losing that one final under Martin O'Neill's now three-year tenure, England went into the draw for the 2014 World Cup seeded, with their FIFA ranking at fifth place. Switzerland as a result drew the likes of Italy and Uruguay and tumbled out of the group stages, as they had done in South Africa. Belgium were paired with neighbours France and followed them into the last 16, but were pipped to a quarter-final place by Argentina and Angel Di Maria's extra time goal. Their reward? A quarter-final tie with England. England were given Algeria again, along with Russia and South Korea. Martin O'Neill kept up his group stage record with England coasting to three wins. The United States waited in Salvador for a last 16 tie. A team that England hadn't beaten in their previous two World Cup ties. 90 minutes passed and England weren't leading. However, neither were a Landon Donovan-less American side. Goals from Daniel Sturridge and Wayne Rooney confirmed a 2-0 win in extra time. Ghosts of 1986 and Ghosts of 1998 were vanquished in the Brazilian capital by Martin O'Neill and his side. Another penalty shootout and therefore the Dutch in Sao Paulo proved a step too far however. 
England were funnelled into the third place playoff where they recorded their best overseas finish to a World Cup, winning 3-0 against a Brazil side still shell-shocked from their semi-final defeat. The Dutch on the other hand went to the Maracanã the following day with revenge of 1974 on their mind. Louis van Gaal's 5-3-2 formation had swamped Spain in the opener and despite stumbling through wins over Mexico late on as well as shootout wins over Costa Rica and England, they hit their form again. Memphis Depay, Ian Robin and Robin van Persie got the goals, Netherlands 3, Germany 1. Netherlands winners because thanks to that disappearing of one goal from a game featuring the United States and Algeria which seemed inconsequential four years in the past, they were able to get their first World Cup on the board by beating England and then Germany in 2014. Iceland losers in the final throes of Martin O'Neill's reign as England manager before handing things over to Gareth Southgate, England beat Iceland 1-0 in that infamous last 16 clash at Euro 2016. England would bow out of the quarterfinals to France, but Iceland's biggest win as a footballing nation was gone. Winning is an important thing, but to have your own style, to have people copy you, to admire you, that is the greatest gift, the words of Johan Cruyff. Cruyff and his Dutch side gave the world a brand of attacking football that revolutionised the sport, total football. With this, Cruyff led Ajax to three successive European Cups in the 1970s. Approaching the 1974 World Cup, Cruyff had tied Franz Beckenbauer and Alfredo Di Stefano on multiple Ballon d'Or titles. The Dutch were preparing for their first World Cup since the Second World War. Thanks to Dutch domination on the continent, Netherlands were favourites amongst defending champions Brazil and hosts West Germany. Akin to the Puskas drag back in 53, Cruyff produced the most important piece of skill in a 0-0 draw against Sweden at the tournament. The Netherlands sauntered through both group stages without having an opposition player score past them. They even thrashed Argentina 4-0 and beat holders Brazil in what was effectively a semi-final. In the final, a penalty from Paul Breitner and another from Gerd Muller overturned Johan Neeskin's early penalty and left the Netherlands chasing a defensively strong West German outfit. The Netherlands would lose the final, taking third place at Euro 76 and began preparations for the 1978 World Cup. Cruyff inexplicably retired upon the Netherlands' progress to the tournament. They barely scraped through a group containing Iran, Peru and Scotland before eliminating Italy and West Germany in the second group phase. They were able to take the host Argentina to extra time, but were eventually beaten. In 2008, Johan Cruyff revealed the shocking reasons why he retired from international football. Along with his family, Cruyff was a victim of a kidnap attempt in Barcelona prior to the tournament. To play in a World Cup you have to be 200% okay. There are moments when there are other values in life, Cruyff would say. He would leave Barcelona for the Los Angeles Aztecs the following year. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if Johan Cruyff played in the 1978 World Cup. The Dutch dazzled from their Argentinian base in Mendoza with three successive wins over Iran, Peru and Scotland. Due to winning the group the Netherlands were fed Argentina, Brazil and Poland in the second phase. As in 1974 the Dutch humbled Brazil in the second group stage and surpassed Poland. They needed just a point against host Argentina. An early Mario Kempes goal threatened to boil over the ravenous Argentinian fans in Rosario. An equaliser from Johan Neskins took control back to the orange before Cruyff's second half winner took the sting out of the crowd. Through four riotous days in Buenos Aires, the presumptive Argentinians in attendance for the final cheered on the Italians. The Estadio Monumental became a home away from home for Italy, and through Marco Tardelli, they went into a half-time lead in the Argentine capital. Cruyff sent Mauro Balugi to the turf following a prized Cruyff turn on the edge of the box and levelled up the final with 15 minutes to go, before Johnny Rep headed home on 87 minutes. The Dutch had claimed their first world title in Argentina. Now aged 31, Cruyff signalled his retirement after Euro 1980. The Netherlands successfully held out Poland and East Germany for a spot in Italy and were lumped with their old enemy West Germany and huddled as Czechoslovakia in the group. Greece were thumped 6-0 in the first match before a second match in Naples against the West Germans effectively decided the group. A 2-2 draw was the outcome which left Greece at the mercy of West Germany in the final group game. The Dutch had the goal difference advantage and two goals from Cruyff against Czechoslovakia earned first place, and therefore a final with Belgium. Two early goals courtesy of Ruud Kral and Johan Cruyff effectively killed the game off what turned out to be a 2-1 win at the Stadio Olimpico. Cruyff signed off with a world and European double. By that point however Cruyff had amassed quite the trophy haul in Spain. After three silver medals in La Liga, Barcelona went hell for leather in the 1978-79 season. With Dutch colleague Johan Neskins, Barcelona racked up nine successive wins in the League and Cup Winners' Cup. This included a 2-0 win in the Bernabeu over Real Madrid. By the time European football returned in March, Barcelona were seven points clear of Los Blancos. Ipswich, Beveren and Fortuna Dusseldorf were put to the sword as Barcelona triumphed in Europe, before wrapping up the league with three games to spare with a win at Zaragoza. 
Barcelona earned successive league titles at home to Espanyol in mid-May just three weeks after booking their ticket to only their second European Cup final. Barcelona had beaten Hamburg 4-1 on aggregate to reach their first final since 1961. Even after a quarter-final Copa del Rey humbling by Real Madrid's Castilla reserve side, Barcelona would claim a league and European Cup double with a 1-0 win over Nottingham Forest. A second European Cup followed in 1981 against Liverpool, Cruyff netting two of Barcelona's three goals in a 3-1 win in Paris. This clinched the second treble of Cruyff's career after Ajax's triumphs in 1972 and marked just the third time this feat was accomplished. Cruyff retired in 1984 with successive Eredivisie titles with Ajax and Feyenoord and earned accolades in a managerial capacity with three European Cups with Barcelona and a number of domestic honours. Johan Cruyff would go down in many people's books as the greatest footballer to ever play the sport of football. Johan Cruyff winner, because he claimed a much, much bigger career for himself with Barcelona with multiple European Cup titles both off and on the pitch, as well as making an indelible mark on Argentina, who are the losers, as they were made to wait for a further eight years for a World Cup title amid a ravenous 1978 coup. It was the cruelest group stage elimination in the history of absolutely everything. If not, it was certainly the closest margin that a team had been dumped out of the illustrious World Cup. It had been 16 long years since Senegal were deprived of becoming the first African nation to play in a World Cup semi-final after a 1-0 loss to Turkey. Their next World Cup contest was a 2-1 win over Poland in Moscow where Mbai Niang ingeniously returned to the field of play after receiving treatment for an injury to confirm the win with Senegal's second goal. Japan and Senegal shared four goals five days later in Yekaterinburg and shared the qualification spots heading into the final round of fixtures. Japan led the group, however, on their disciplinary record. They had received three yellow cards in two matches, while Senegal had received five. Both needed a point from their final matches, both lost. Senegal's defeat against Colombia proved terminal, as both Japan and Senegal lost 1-0 and both received one yellow card. Therefore, they were split by those yellow cards and Japan progressed, themselves cruelly eliminated by Belgium in the last 16. The teams officially could not be split. Japan had scored four, conceded four, and received four yellow cards. Senegal matched that. In an unprecedented move, FIFA ordered the drawing of lots to separate the two teams. They had done this prior in 1990, but to decide the fate of two qualifiers in the Netherlands and Ireland. Never before had they drawn lots in order to actually eliminate a team in the World Cup. Japan's name came out of the first hat, number three came out of the second hat, therefore Senegal in the most bizarre way possible drew Belgium in Rostov on Don in the last 16. It was a nervy first half with an underperforming Belgian side toiling to a nil-nil scoreline. By the 54th minute, the game seemed beyond the Europeans. Senegal took the lead ferociously with a bulleted header by Salif Sané on 48 minutes. They doubled their advantage four minutes later with a rasping drive from Sadio Mane, and on the counter-attack, added a third through the Liverpool forward to make it 3-0. Belgium looked shell-shocked and for the next 20 or so minutes, barely threatened the Senegalese net. Finally on 74 minutes, it was breached with an inevitable Marouan Fellaini header finding the net. Suddenly, it was game on. Belgium huffed, they puffed, but they couldn't find a second goal to spark that comeback against a resolute Senegalese defence that did not need to attack. Two tournaments, two quarter-finals, as Senegal set up to face the team that won the tournament back in 2002, Brazil. To look at the performance of the two nations thus far with the star names and preconceptions removed, Senegal and Brazil went into the quarter-final as equals. In almost the opposite of their last 16 tie, Senegal raced out of the blocks against a blasé Brazil. The South Americans led by Neymar sauntered into the contest, believing the tie already won, but was shell-shocked by Fernandinho's own goal on 13 minutes. Stunned further when another low drive from Sadio Mane, his fourth goal of the tournament, ensured Senegal would take a two-goal advantage into the second half. In truth, Brazil offered very little threat on the Senegalese net, but found their route back into the game via a Renato Augusto goal on 76 minutes. Outside of that, however, Senegal sailed through. They had become the first African side to make the semi-final of the World Cup. Senegal therefore had defeated teams ranked second, fifth and sixth in the world in their wins over Brazil, Belgium and Poland. Good omens lay in wait in St. Petersburg, France, the team that they had kicked off their World Cup adventure with, 
with a win back in 2002 and they were the opponents in the semi-final. The world tuned in. France were among the runaway favourites not only for this match but for the entire tournament when considering that two novices in England and Croatia were in the opposite semi-final. The latter, of course, prevailing there. The match would come down to set-piece organisation as opposed to individual brilliance. A 51st minute corner flew into the Senegalese penalty area and with a header, Samuel Untiti sent France into their second World Cup final, whilst Africa waits for their first. There wasn't too long to be sad about the ordeal, however, as the 2019 AFCON tournament was 12 months later. Senegal progressed but behind Algeria and were then set the task of Uganda, Benin and Tunisia to qualify for only a second continental final. Sadio Mane, Idris Agana Gay and an own goal were all that was needed in three successive 1-0 victories to confirm a reunion with Algeria in the final. A final that was bereft of attacking opportunities in a nervous contest in Cairo. 120 minutes came and went without too much incident and certainly no goals to speak of. 17 years prior in Mali, Senegal had completed their first AFCON final against Cameroon and it finished 0-0, yet they lost out on penalties. Senegal had had two prior AFCON penalty shootouts and lost both of them, both to Cameroon, with their previous AFCON tournament being the method of their elimination. Penalties and Cameroon, this time in the quarter-finals. Kalidou Koulibaly, as he had done in 2017, converted his penalty and was joined by Gay, Mane and Kete Balde in scoring their kicks. 4-3 the final shootout result, Senegal had finally won their first AFCON. In Michael Ballack's time in the senior Germany national team, they were on their worst streak in the World Cup. They had fallen to successive quarter-final finishes in 1994 and 98 after capturing the Jules Rimet trophy at Italia 90. They reached their first World Cup final in 12 years in Japan and South Korea in 2002, but were handsomely beaten by Brazil and a man with half a haircut in Yokohama, a match in which Ballack would be suspended for. Successive bronze medals at their World Cup in 2006 and in South Africa four years later would be the final World Cups before Balak's international retirement. Two years after Balak's retirement from football, Germany clinched their fourth World Cup in 2014. Balak played in three European Championships for Germany, but they would follow up winning the Henry Delaunay Trophy at England in 1996 with successive group stage eliminations in 2000 and 2004. Balak would captain Germany to the Euro 2008 final, but they were beaten by a Fernando Torres winner in Vienna. Germany are still awaiting a fourth European Championship. The tournament we shall be focusing on today however will be the 2010 World Cup, a tournament where Balak was set to lead the German side as captain at a fourth major tournament. However, the Chelsea midfielder would be cruelly ruled out of the tournament thanks to Kevin prince Botang injuring Balak at the 2010 FA Cup final. German legends traded words via the media after Germany crashed out at yet another semi-final. Lothar Matthias stated that Balak's absence helped young players blossom, whilst Oliver Bierhoff stated that Michael Balak was still the Germany captain even after Philip Lahm claimed he would not surrender the captaincy after the tournament. Balak would never play for Germany again, forever stuck on 98 caps as he refused Yogi Love's offer to arrange two friendly so Balak could reach a century of appearances. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Michael Balak didn't miss the 2010 World Cup. He completed the FA Cup final against Portsmouth in a winning effort for Chelsea, their sixth FA Cup. Balak was captain and kept Meza Ozil out of the team for the entire group stages and largely played just behind Miroslav Klose. Germany laboured to a 2-0 win over Australia, with goals coming from Lukas Podolski and Miroslav Klose, two stalwarts from 2006. In what was Michael Balak's 100th cap, Serbia stunned Germany early on in Port Elizabeth through Milan Jovanovic. They would ride out the tie despite Nemanja Vidic conceding a penalty in the second half. Balak would miss the spot kick. Germany needed a win over Ghana in Johannesburg while Serbia played Australia in Nelspruit. Yogi Lov remained resolute in his 4-2-3-1 selection of Michael Balak in behind Klose and Thomas Muller and Podolski on the wings. Germany for a successive World Cup game was shut out, labouring to a 0-0 draw. It was the first time since 1978 that Germany would fail to score in successive World Cup matches. Germany below Ghana on 4 points now played the waiting game whilst Australia and Serbia played out the remainder of their game. Australia held out for a win, and Germany progressed by the skin of their teeth. Germany travelled north to Rustenburg, where they would face the United States. Landon Donovan fired America into a first half lead. Shortly before half time, however, Marco Ballack's World Cup would come crashing around him. A late tackle from Carlos Bocanegra had the German clutching at his ankle. Ballack was substituted for Meza Ozil for his first piece of World Cup football, and the armband was handed to Philipp Lahm. Germany would turn the game on its head through Meza Ozil from distance and a poacher's finish from Thomas Muller in extra time. 
the news broke the following day that Michael Ballack's World Cup was over. Up next was the Soccer City Stadium and Uruguay in the quarterfinals. Meza Ozil replaced Michael Ballack from the start and he needed just four minutes to lay on Miroslav Klose for the opening goal. It proved to be the only goal of the match as Germany advanced to a third successive World Cup semi-final. Ballack played cheerleader from the bench as an unchanged Germany pipped the Netherlands to the final through two Thomas Muller goals in a 2-1 win. The German side in Johannesburg to play Spain featured five players that hadn't played in a major tournament previously. Manuel Neuer in net, Jerome Boateng in defence, Sami Khedira, Meza Ozil and Tony Kroos in midfield. A Carlos Puyol header deep in the second half clinched Spain's first World Cup as Germany floundered in their second final in eight years. Michael Ballack would feature sporadically in Germany's qualification for Euro 2012 but after being overlooked for the tournament in Poland and Ukraine, Ballack retired from international football. Netherlands losers because they wouldn't make a third World Cup final and would be dumped out of the Euro 2012 group stages by Germany. Germany winners because they had made yet another World Cup final instead of losing in yet another semi-final to Spain. The Olympic Stadium in Berlin July the 9th 2006 at approximately 10.30pm local time in Germany. France and Italy had played out a fairly mediocre World Cup final. Zinedine Zidane shaved a penalty in off the crossbar and Marco Materazzi replied in kind with a first half header. The two European nations stalemated at a World Cup largely dominated by European sides. The full time whistle blew and we were still no closer to discovering whether France would claim a second world title or if Italy would earn their fourth. The game stopped dead in its tracks 10 minutes from the end of extra time's conclusion. Zidane had just nutted Materazzi in the middle of the Berlin turf 100 yards away from the ball, seemingly apropos of absolutely nothing. The French captain in his final match as a professional was sent off. In scenes of a stark contrast from eight years prior when Zidane's brace in the Stade de France helped bring home the country's first world title, the midfielders' actions drastically reduced their chances of winning a second title. The match went to penalties and despite Zidane's red card, the omens were in France's favour, given that Italy had lost the only previous World Cup final to go to a penalty shootout. 1994 heartache in Pasadena was replaced with 2006 jubilation in Berlin as a combination of a David Trezeguet miss and Fabio Grosso's inch-perfect spot kick gifted Italy a fourth World Cup title. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if Zinedine Zidane didn't headbutt Marco Materazzi in the World Cup final of 2006. Zidane and Materazzi trot away from a scuffle outside the Italian penalty area. Play continued in Berlin. It continued all the way to penalties. Italy won the toss and Andrea Perlo calmly stroked in the opening penalty. Zidane, very much in a different tact from his regulation time penalty, slid the ball into the bottom corner. Daniele De Rossi, Sylvain Wiltard and Alessandro Del Piero all traded off perfect penalties before it happened, before David Trezeguet missed. He slammed his penalty against the underside of the crossbar and unlike Zidane's seventh minute penalty, it landed the wrong side of the goal line. Advantage Italy. Fabio Grosso and Eric Cabidal both net leaving the hopes of two nations on one man. Substitute Vicenzo Iaquinta. The Udinese forward just as Roberto Baggio did 12 years prior, put the penalty into orbit. Willy Sagnol had never scored for France in his six years in the national team, and he stepped up to take the penalty. The Bayern Munich fullback had scored just eight goals professionally in his 11 year career. He sent Gigi Buffon the wrong way and smashed the ball into the corner. Four apiece with five kicks taken. Up next, Mr. Reliable and Italian captain, Fabio Cannavaro, on course for a Ballon d'Or. Straight into the palms of Fabian Barthez. The scores remained 4 4, and up next was Florent Malouda, a winger without a single competitive international goal to his name. The Leon man strode up to the kick, Buffon got hands to it, the net rippled, France were world champions once more. In wild post-match celebratory scenes in Germany, Zidane abruptly contradicted his retirement a couple months prior. Real Madrid welcomed the two-time World Cup winner back into the fold with open arms in a multi-million two-year contract. Zidane, who netted and assisted prolifically in the previous season, was back up to his usual tricks in the restarting of his career. Real were out to make up the 12-point gap they had surrendered to Barcelona the previous season. In the seventh game of the season, Zidane assisted all three of new arrival Ru van Nistelrooy's hat-trick in a home 3-0 win over Frank Rijkaard's Barcelona. That and a 3-2 win at the Bernabeu in March 2007 was the difference as Real romped home to the La Liga title. They won't claim La Decima, unfortunately, as they were beaten home and away in the quarter-finals by the majestic AC Milan under Carlo Ancelotti's rule. And they even surrendered the La Liga in the summer of 2008, as Zidane prepared to lace his boots for the last set of matches he would ever play at the European Championships in Austria and Switzerland that summer. Prior to that, however, was a date in Moscow with Manchester United in the Champions League final. The match between the retiring Zinedine Zidane and the young pretender Cristiano Ronaldo was billed as a passing of the torch. 
Ronaldo rose high as Ted in for Manchester United at the Luzniki Stadium in the first half. Zidane quickly levelled in the Russian rain. As the second half bled into the fated period of extra time, Zidane found space in the box. Ferdinand and Vidic were stranded before him. Zidane coolly picked the corner of the net. He clinched La Decima for Real Madrid with the extra time winner, out of Edwin van der Sar's reach. Just six games were left on the clock of Zinedine Zidane's career. He returned two weeks after the Moscow triumph to the Group C clash against Romania in Zurich, carrying Benzema's doubles securing an opening day win. The sport would not be kinder to Zidane and the French four days later as a rampant Dutch side ran out 3-1 winners in Bern. In the final group game it came down to France and Italy, again. France survived a penalty scare and would play out a tepid 0-0 with Italy. A point owing to the fact that Romania were unlikely to thrash the Netherlands by three or more goals was enough to drag France through to the quarter-finals against tournament favourites, Spain. Zidane yet to score at the tournament provided the firepower at the perfect time, lit on against Spain in Vienna. With Spain unable to reply, France found themselves just a win over Russia away from a final against Germany. It was here that Zidane, outside of the 1998 World Cup final, had his finest hour. Two penalties were converted inside of the first 14 minutes and after assist and a hat-trick and a clinching goal later, France raced into the final, courtesy of a 4-0 thrashing over Russia. Zidane was tied with David Villa for the golden boot and needed one more goal to secure the accolade. Thierry Henry headed in early on and returning the favour, Henry teed up the golden boot on a silver platter for Zidane, who happily obliged with a clean finish. France won 2-0 and claimed Le Double for Le Bleu, adding the 1998 and 2006 World Cups and the 2000 European Championships. Zidane lifted the Henry Delaunay Trophy aloft in Vienna, ending his storied career on the highest of highs. France, winners. France claimed the double-double at the expense of both Italy and Spain, who they picked for the respective would-be titles in the mid-2000s. Spain, losers. The long-awaited coming-out party was made to it for another two years as Spain floundered in a European Championship quarter-final thanks to the metronomic performance at the heart of the French midfield by Zinedine Zidane. Today, Romario de Souza Faria is a federal senator in Rio de Janeiro. From 1985 until his retirement in 2009, he scored over 700 senior goals for club and country. He was a Copa America and World Cup winner for Brazil and won league titles in the Netherlands for PSV, Spain for Barcelona and Brazil for Vasco da Gama. He is known for his famous toe poke finish and is currently the fourth highest goal scorer in Brazilian national team history with 55 goals. After four more years in Europe, three at PSV and one at Barcelona, Romario had racked up two Eredivisie titles and a La Liga crown. Individually, he had captured two golden boots, one for each foot, in the European Cup and a Pachichi trophy in his first year at the New Camp. The World Cup rocked up to the United States and with a goal in each group match for Romario, Brazil tops the group. He added goals in the quarter-final and semi-final in wins over the Netherlands and Sweden, as Brazil eked out a fourth World Cup in Pasadena, in the famous penalty shootout win against Italy. Four years later, however, Romario was nowhere to be seen in the Brazil 22. His strike partner in America, Bebeto, was selected, as well as Ronaldo, who remained on the bench as a 17-year-old in 1994. He would pull out of the 2001 Copa America, and manager Luis Felipe Scolari passed on him for the 2002 World Cup in Japan and South Korea due to indiscipline factoring back to his Copa America withdrawal. Romario would not play for Brazil again, with the exception of a testimonial against Guatemala in 2005. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly, and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if Romario was picked for France 98. The same front line of Bebeto, Romario, and Ronaldo from 1994 was selected in an attempt to replicate Brazil's successes in America. He would go unused in a 2 1 win over Scotland at the Stade de France, but he would finally get on the pitch in the 72nd minute of the second match against Morocco, where he assisted Ronaldo in a 4 0 thrashing of the African nation. In a dramatic finale to Brazil's group, Bebeto fired Brazil in front before two goals in the final seven minutes meant Norway led Brazil. Romario headed home deep in second half stoppage time to level Brazil up 2-2. Morocco sailed through along with Brazil. Despite Romario excoring Bebeto, the Botafogo forward remained in the starting eleven. Romario once again came on deep in the second half of a round of 16 tie against Chile that was effectively already won. Brazil did the business there and in the quarterfinals against Denmark, where Romario went unused. He grew restless on the bench and Bebeto remained in the 11 for the semi-final against the Netherlands. He would enter the fray in the 113th minute after Patrick Kluivert's late equaliser forced extra time. With Philip Koku missing Netherlands' third spot kick, Romario had the chance to turn the screw to make it 4-2 in the shootout. He sent Edwin van der Sar the wrong way and Ronald de Boer's miss eliminated the Netherlands from the World Cup. 
In the shock of the tournament, Ronaldo was left off the team sheet for the final against France in the National Stadium in Paris. Romario partnered Bebeto up front as in Pasadena four years prior. The final burst to life late in the day as Romagno, Petit and Bebeto exchanged goals. A second successive final would be decided by penalty. Rivaldo, Bebeto and Dunga all converted, as did Zidane, David Trezeguet and Thierry Henry. Jokaev's miss allowed Romario to forge an advantage for Brazil in the shootout. A Penenka later, and Brazil led France 4-3 with one kick remaining each. France's final kick ended the 1998 World Cup just as Italy ended the 1994 World Cup. Didier Deschamps blazed a penalty deep into the crowd. Brazil were champions again. And after scoring four goals in the 2001 Copa America in a winning effort in Colombia, Romario retired from international football. And without Romario in 2002, Brazil won a third successive World Cup, their sixth in total. Brazil, winners, because they claimed successive World Cups from successive penalty shootouts and six in total. France, losers, because they would have to wait for their maiden World Cup win in 2018 after losing another final on penalties in 2006. In the early days of international football, the British Football Associations ostracised themselves from FIFA and global football in ways that only contemporary right-wing politicians could gush at. Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales all withdrew from FIFA in 1920, so they wouldn't compete at the interwar FIFA World Cups of 1930, 34 and 38. However, following the Second World War, FIFA were keen to reinstate the home nations and offered a place at the upcoming 1950 FIFA World Cup to the winner of the 1949-50 British Home Championships. Both England and Scotland went into the Championship's final match at Hampden in front of 133,000 plus in Glasgow, winner take all. The winner would go to Brazil, the loser left at home. Except FIFA extended an invitation to second place to join the winner at Brazil. Unfortunately for Scottish fans, they would lose 1-0 to England and finish second. Doubly unfortunate for Scottish fans was the declaration that George Graham, the secretary of the SFA, had made where he stated that Scotland wouldn't appear at the World Cup if they couldn't win the home championships. England bowed out at the group stages whilst the remainder of the home nations followed them into the World Cup as follows. Scotland in 1954 finishing bottom of the group and still suffer to this day from their inability to qualify from a World Cup group. Wales and Northern Ireland both in 1958 and both appeared at the quarter-finals. Wales have never returned, whilst Northern Ireland participated at the 1982 and 86 tournaments. And finally the Republic of Ireland in 1990, who reached the quarter-finals a record best after failing at the last 16 in 1994 and 2002. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if Scotland didn't withdraw from the 1950 FIFA World Cup. England vs Scotland at Hampden Park was a tight affair and in the 63rd minute England broke the deadlock via Roy Bentley. Scotland were going to miss out on a place in Brazil. Scotland responded through Willie Bald, drawing them level. The Scottish players decided to risk it and go for the jugular. With England rattled by the equaliser, Willie Waddell volleyed in with 5 minutes to go. Scotland won 2-1, won, won the British Home Championship and won their place in Brazil for the 1950 World Cup. FIFA were delighted with Scotland's qualification due to the fact that many nations pulled out of the tournament through post-war depressions and other various factors. England and Scotland would be the only two nations to make their debut at the World Cup that year and were both looked on as favourites to do well. England lived in Group 2 with Spain, Chile and the USA, while Scotland ended up in Group 4 alongside Bolivia and Uruguay. Scotland's first World Cup match would be played in Recife on June the 25th against Bolivia. They were made favourites but the humid conditions favoured Bolivia, especially considering Scotland's warm cotton kits. Scotland struggled throughout the first half against the South Americans but broke the deadlock five minutes before the end of the first half through Billy Liddell. The Tartan army found their comfort level, got their act together and ran out as 3-0 winners, now well placed in what was a winner-take-all match with Uruguay to battle it out for a place in the final round. A few days later Scotland met up with Uruguay off the back of an 8-0 demolition of Bolivia. Scotland were outmatched, capping off their time in Brazil with a consolation goal in a 3-1 defeat. Uruguay would win the tournament. The early journey back for Scotland was shared with England, themselves crashing out in the first round. Both football associations declared that the British mindset of ruling world football was gone. The warm cotton kits and the heavy leather boots were gone. They were to modernise. 
Four years passed and Scotland were reunited with Uruguay in Switzerland for the upcoming 1954 World Cup. A more prepared and now more experienced Scotland put Austria to the sword 3-1 to give them a good start. The second of two group contests was the revenge match against Uruguay in Basel. A tense 1-1 draw sent both through, Scotland topping the group on goal difference. Uruguay were fed host Switzerland in the quarterfinals while Scotland faced England for the first time outside of the British Isles. Remaining in Basel, the game was end-to-end, end-to-end without the net ripley. That is until the 116th minute through Tom Finney as England turned the screw. England were to be the first British team to play in a World Cup semi-final. The fate of both nations diverged. England were thrashed for the third time in a row against the magical Magyars of Hungary. They would recover to finish third in Switzerland, but that wasn't repeated in Sweden four years later. Depleted by the Munich air disaster, England bowed out in the group stages after a playoff loss to the Soviet Union. Scotland, however, got beyond Yugoslavia and Paraguay and held a France side containing free scoring Just Fontaine. France would bow out to world champions West Germany in the quarter finals. Scotland, however, became the second British team to reach a World Cup semi final by beating another British team in the quarter finals, Northern Ireland. Their journey would end like England's did in 1954 by being swept aside in the semi final this time by Brazil 2-1. Brazil would claim a first World Cup as Scotland bowed out with a fourth place. Despite the near misses for both England and Scotland, the future was bright for the home nations as the 1960s loomed. England winners, because they made the World Cup semi-final far sooner than they otherwise would have. And our biggest winner is Scotland, as a history of doomed group stage exits was replaced by a good base of knockout stage appearances in the 1950s. And our only losers today, Austria, a semi-final and a third place playoff win over champion Uruguay in 1954, is now consigned to a group stage exit. If you're of a certain vintage, you'll remember that beautifully baggy Reebok strip from France 98. Blue and white wisps on a red background, a big gaudy collar that was a staple of the 1990s, and drowning in the kit celebrating was almost always the man himself, Marcelo Salas. Of the five goals that Chile scored at France 98, Marcelo Salas bagged four of them. Chile wouldn't win a game out of that tournament, but a fondness still remains in my heart of that team. Even in spite of not winning, Salas and Chile raced out of the blocks and led Italy in their opener in Bordeaux. Roberto Baggio exercised some demons with a late penalty and in the end, Chile limped into the last 16 with 1-1 draws against Cameroon and Austria and in the end, Italy's wins dragged Chile into the last 16. They'd chipped four goals to Brazil in the last 16, the favourites. It could have been the beginning of a great era. Salas alongside admittedly ageing Ivan Zamorano was supposed to be the soul of many a World Cup going forward. Salas, only 23, would earn a move to Europe but he would never play at another World Cup. In fact, it would take Marcelo Bielsa and a golden generation to turn Chile's fortunes around. Salas' entire international career came and went. He'd actually scored twice in qualification for the 2010 World Cup, but by the time that Chile wrapped up their campaign with 33 points, Salas was well beyond his expiry date. In his place were the following. Alexis Sanchez, Gary Medel, Claudio Bravo, Maurizio Ayala, Arturo Vidal, Gonzalo Jara, and Jean Bersigeau, Chile's golden generation. The aforementioned are now Chile's top seven capped players and until recently, their only seven centurions. Eduardo Vargas would etch his name onto the list at the most recent Copa America and would be in Chile's squad for the 2014 World Cup. As would Charles Aranguiz, Chile's ninth most capped player at the time of uploading. In the half decade between 2004 and 2009, all nine of Chile's now most capped players made their debut and as a result, the golden generation would all crumble at the same time but they would emulate the team of Salas and Zamorano through Marcelo Bielsa and later Jorge Sampaoli at subsequent World Cups with the joint record of Chile's best overseas performance. Of course, neither of them could touch the great Lionel Sanchez team that made the semi-final on home soil in 1962. And despite the knockout stage appearance in 1998, Chile had not won a match at the World Cup since that third place playoff in 62, a 1-0 win over Yugoslavia. Chile ended that drought with a 1-0 win over Honduras in Nels Pruitt and did likewise with Switzerland in Port Elizabeth in 2010. But just like in 1998, Chile would fall at the last 16 to Brazil. Four years on and a change of manager later, Chile would upset the odds, escaping out of a group containing world and European champion Spain and 2010 World Cup's finalists, the Netherlands. They beat Spain against all odds, but once more the last 16 in Brazil was their stumbling block. But they had got close and missing out cruelly on penalties. 
Chile's golden generation would take silverware though in successive years no less. They had done what Lionel Sanchez's team in the late 50s and early 60s could not do, or rather were not allowed to do after not participating in the 1959 and 1963 Copper Americas, and that is beat Argentina not once but twice in the finals of 2015 and 2016's editions. But that generation came to a screeching halt with a failure to qualify for the World Cup under Juan Antonio Pizzi. Peru snuck into the playoff spot on goal difference thanks to David Ospina's late on goal in Lima. Peru would play in their first World Cup since the 1970s, whilst Chile might be embarking on a similar weight of their own. So we don't have to change Chile's results one bit in qualification for the 2018 World Cup. We just have to make sure that David Ospina saves Paulo Guerrero's free kick in Lima. And with that loss, Peru leaves them on 25 points. Their wait for another World Cup qualification continues. Meanwhile, Chile's 3-0 loss in Sao Paulo doesn't particularly matter as they're gifted the reprieve on 26 points of the playoffs and under Pizzi they squeak through after a 0-0 draw in Wellington, but back in Santiago, Chile beat New Zealand 3-0. Ranked 9th in the world, Chile are in pot 2 for the World Cup. Peru's 10th place, the highest ranking team not to qualify and as a result Chile are gifted the likes of France, Denmark and Australia. Chile pipped Denmark in the... Eliminator as though it was deemed in Group C. Alexis Sanchez cutting in for a low drive for the first goal and he was felled for the second after driving into the box and would therefore convert the penalty and a 2-1 win over Denmark was a perfect opener. Claudio Brava was the hero from the spot to save Milo Jedinak's penalty in a 1-0 win against Australia. Meanwhile a stalemated 0-0 in Moscow between France and Chile didn't decide the group. Instead, the three goals for and one against meant that top spot was decided on yellow cards. France's three yellow cards less than Chile's five unfortunately meant that Chile would finish second. It meant that they would avoid Argentina who finished second in Group D and therefore would receive Croatia in the last 16. More importantly, however, with a loss of Spain's to Russia, it meant a good path to the semi-final. Jean Bersajor put Chile into an almost instantaneous lead in Nizhny Novgorod. Mario Mandzukic quickly levelled but after 4 minutes the game was fated for penalties. Milan Baidel and Josip Pivaric missed in the chequered black and navy, meanwhile only Arturo Vidal missed for the Chileans and they had finally got over their last 16 hoodoo. Now it was a chance to equal the 1962 team and all that was needed was a win against the host Russia. But they were sent to extra time once more. Alexis Sanchez got two in extra time in a 3-1 win for Chile in Sochi versus the heartbroken hosts. And it meant a return to Moscow and it meant England in the semi-final. Chile was sunk by a Kieran Trippier free kick early on and were bombarded in the first half. But then Eduardo Vargas equalised for Chile. England had encountered a South American side earlier on in the tournament though. They knew what to expect and what else, but a Harry Kane penalty to put England through. A seventh goal for Kane, a golden boot and a second World Cup final ever for England. Meanwhile for Chile they would finish fourth, losing to Belgium in the third place playoff. Meanwhile England would record successive final defeats in 2018 to France and in 2021 to Italy. Meanwhile, Chile were in the business of racking up finals too. Their third Copa America final in three tournaments, seven points from the group stage saw them top the group from Uruguay. Peru, the team that they'd picked to the World Cup, were beaten thanks to Eduardo Vargas in a 1-0 win, which meant a reunion with Uruguay. And again, more, more penalty shootouts. Luis Suarez of all players to miss for Uruguay, whilst Charles Arangui scored the winning penalty for Chile. And this final though, it wasn't at home or in America. It was against Brazil in front of 70,000 in the Maracanã. Chile wilted under the pressure of becoming the first team since 1940s Argentina to win three in a row. Richarlison and Gabriel Jesus scoring the goals in a 2-0 win for Brazil. It was the finest day in England's football in history. After four World Cups of failure, England and Bobby Moore finally lifted the Jules Rimet trophy to West Germany no less and in their own backyard of Wembley underneath the shadows of the Twin Towers. For an Englishman there was absolutely nothing wrong with the day at all, nothing suspicious or fishy about the 4-2 win. Jeff Hurst was the perfect stand-in for legendary forward Jimmy Greaves, he had scored a hat-trick. Thanks to other miseries mainly against the Germans via the penalty spot let's be honest, the only success that England can hand their hat on now is 1966. For the Germans however, it was a final in a long list of mainly successes. For how often the English speak of 1966, Germany have triumphs in 1954, 1974, 1990 and 2014 on the world stage, not to mention the other three European championships have also got to the name. 
and for Germans they will speak of Jeffers' score that should have never stood. The Russian linesman, after deliberation or hesitation under the Wembley crowd, gave the goal and England won 4-2. These things even out and Frank Lampard's goal in 2010 against Germany that, backed by televisual evidence, clearly should have counted but didn't and Germany scored 4 and won in the World Cup that night. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if Jeff Hurst's goal in the 1966 World Cup final didn't count. With 20 minutes to play West Germany had a reprieve, but still England attacked, as the clock whittled down to the final minute of extra time. They penned the Germans into the penalty box but the ball squirted out to Helmut Haller. A punt up the pitch found Uwe Seeler, with one man to beat, Gordon Banks. The German captain fired a shot into the top corner, there were people on the pitch but they weren't celebrating, and it was all over. West Germany won 3-2 in London. Still riding the crest of the wave of their second World Cup triumph, West Germany squeezed through qualification for the Euro 1968. A 1-0 win in Albania, the difference between 1st and 2nd. Playoff wins over France for West Germany and Spain for the English meant they would meet again, this time in Florence for the Euro 1968 semi-final. Uwe Seeler's hat-trick sank England 3-0. They also comfortably ran out winners against host Italy, albeit after a replay. The West Germans had the better of the English at the following World Cup where they would meet in the quarter-final stage. England blew a two-goal lead in the Mexican heat. West Germany would bow out to the fantastic Brazilians in the final after toppling Italy once more in the game of the century that was the semi-final at the Azteca. The long string of tournament finals continued. From 1966 to 1982, West Germany only missed out on the final of 1978, where they were outclassed by the total football playing Dutch at the semi-final group stages. And out of the aforementioned eight finals, West Germany would win five, adding the European Championships of 1972 and 1980 to their World Cup in 1974 on home soil whilst they missed out to Italy in the 1982 World Cup final and Czechoslovakia at Euro 1976. Meanwhile, England qualified for just Euro 1980 and the 1982 World Cup, both of which they went out at the group stages. Such were the diverging paths between the two nations, they wouldn't meet again until 1990, and you know the match I'm talking about. With just seven minutes of the World Cup semi-final to go and the game destined for the uncharted waters of a penalty shootout, Paul Gascoigne lined up a shot, a wicked deflection off Andreas Bremer, the ball looped over the head of the West German goalkeeper, it clipped the crossbar and struck the goal line, yet the linesman flagged. Goal for England. And after a nervous end to the game, England qualified for their second World Cup final. With revenge achieved over the Germans, the four year old wounds caused by Diego Maradona from the previous World Cup were to heal next in the final. Once more it was extra time and after the tedium of 117 minutes, Gary Lineker found the ball in the box, a stab forward, the net rippled, England had won the World Cup. Germany would miss out in the Euro 92 final, whilst England lost out in the groups. As holders, England qualified for the 1994 World Cup. They would beat Spain in the final four after conquering Belgium in the round of 16, as in 1990. Germany after extra time, as in 1990, but they were to face a team in the final they hadn't beaten at a World Cup, Brazil. And penalties for the first time for England. Spoiler, they weren't that great at them. Alan Shearer fired his penalty well over the bar. They were no longer champions of the world, and they wouldn't be ever again. But two years later, football was due to come home. Instead of 30 years of hurt, it was four years of quite pleasant viewing for England fans. That would continue at Euro 96. They would win all three group games without a struggle, beat Spain in normal time in the quarterfinals thanks to a Teddy Sheringham winner, and Germany in extra time in the semi-finals thanks to that Gaza open net goal. Czech Republic were downed in the final 3-1. The arduous four years of hurt was wiped from the slate. England had their first European Championship. England, winners. They might have been made to wait for their international success, but it was worth it when it happened. Germany, winners. Winning the 1966 World Cup sparked a prolonged period of dominance for Germany. Sipwe Shabalala funded South Africa into a lead on opening night in Johannesburg against Mexico. In the first African World Cup, the continent had six contenders. June the 19th, Cameroon were the first African nation eliminated, after successive one-goal defeats to Japan and Denmark. June the 22nd, South Africa needed a five-goal swing and would beat France 2-1 in Bloemfontein, but were eliminated. Nigeria needed a win in Durban over South Korea, with the hope that Argentina would beat Greece. Argentina did their part, but Nigeria floundered to a draw, Yakubu earning the miss of the tournament in the process. June the 23rd, 
Algeria needed to beat the United States in Pretoria and hope Slovenia avoided defeat against England, or for England to beat Slovenia by two goals. Neither happened. Algeria lost to a last minute Landon Donovan goal and England only managed a 1-0 over Slovenia. June the 25th, Ivory Coast needed a 9 goal swing with Portugal as they beat North Korea by 3 in Nels Pruitt, but Portugal held Brazil to a 0-0 draw. The following day, Ghana kept the World Cup dreams alive for Africa, Asamoah Gyan striking an extra time winner against the United States in Rustenburg. Six days later in Johannesburg with Sully, Montari and Diego Forlan exchanging the goals, the game ran its course into extra time. And with a little with the head of Luis Suarez and a little with the hand of a cheating bastard, Uruguay staved off elimination from the World Cup as Suarez swatted the ball off the line with his hand. The Uruguayan danced down the tunnel in jubilation as Asamoah Gyan's subsequent spot kick crashed against the bar. Uruguay went on to qualify for the semi-final, 4-2 on penalties, and eventually finished fourth with 3-2 losses to the Netherlands in the semi-final and Germany in the third place playoff. Ghana haven't won a World Cup game since, and no African nations have won a knockout stage game at a World Cup in the intervening years. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly, and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Luis Suarez didn't handle on the line against Ghana in the 2010 World Cup quarter-final. Luis Suarez headed the ball out with futility, as the header had crossed the line. With no time to respond, Uruguay were eliminated from the World Cup, losing 2-1 to Ghana. Ghana, like Senegal and Cameroon before them, had got to a World Cup quarter-final, but unlike the aforementioned teams, Ghana had reached a World Cup semi-final. Gio Van Bronckhorst stunned the Ghanaians into action just two minutes in with a goal of a tournament from 30 yards out in the semi-final. Asamoah Gyan soon levelled up the game from the spot 18 minutes in. The rest of the game was played out with little between the two sides and the next real chance at goal in the match would be Gian's next penalty, the first in a shootout. Gian sent Martin Stecklenburg the wrong way before Robin Van Persie and Wesley Schneider both missed from the spot. Ian Robin and Dirk Kout would force a shootout into the 10th and final kick after Steven Apaya and Dominic Adaya's misses. Johnny Heitinger was the Dutch's fifth man from the spot. He blazed the ball over to confirm Ghana's place in the World Cup final. Spain's win over Germany meant a first time World Cup winner would be crowned in Johannesburg four days later. The entirety of Africa rooted for Ghana and with the exception of Spain, perhaps the world was fully behind Ghana in the final back at Johannesburg. An early opener from David Villa set the tone for the rest of the match. As try as they might, Ghana couldn't reply to Spain. With two late goals from Pedro and another from David Villa, Spain won the final comprehensively 4-0, their first World Cup triumph. Imbued with the experience and confidence, Ghana would bow out at the knockout stages four years later in Brazil. However, they would be beaten at the round of 16 stage by Belgium after extra time. Ghana qualified ahead of Egypt for the 2018 World Cup and humbled hosts Russia in St. Petersburg qualifying behind Uruguay for the knockout stages. They reached the quarterfinals in yet more tales of penalty shootouts. They defeated Spain in Moscow, but would be eliminated by Croatia six days later in Sochi. Winners, obviously Ghana, because they were the first African team to reach a World Cup final and reach subsequent knockout stages in 2014 and 2018. Losers, Netherlands, because they would not see a third World Cup final thanks to a shootout loss in 2010 as in 1998. And Uruguay, because they were defeated in the quarterfinals and their wait for a first semi-final since 1970 continues. Remember the name Wayne Rooney, as the young teenager just 16 fired a last minute winner against Arsenal at Goodison Park for Everton. Two years later, they remembered. Euro 2004 was Wayne Rooney's stage to perform. He scored four goals in three games before a cruel injury ruled him out 27 minutes into the quarterfinal against Portugal, with England leading 1-0. They would lose that match on penalties. Two years later, Wayne Rooney and England had yet another quarter-final against Portugal to win. Rooney had only entered the tournament 58 minutes into the second match against Trinidad and Tobago in Nuremberg, thanks to a broken foot acquired playing for Manchester United against Chelsea that April. He came on for Michael Owen and just four minutes into the third match against Sweden, Owen suffered a horrific knee injury to rule him out of the rest of the tournament. The partnership was given three and a bit games in Portugal in 2004 and yielded five goals between the two. Four minutes together in 2006, and neither striker had found the net. A David Beckham free kick saved a poor England performance in the round of 16 against Ecuador. Finally, however, Wayne Rooney had run up a full 90 minutes on the clock in Stuttgart. He was up to match fitness by the time Portugal and Gelsenkirchen came around. Rooney lasted just an hour on the pitch in the quarter-final, not through injury or a tactical substitution, but through a red card. 
Ten heroic Lions, one stupid boy, they said about England's exit in 1998 thanks to David Beckham's red card against Argentina. Portugal's shootout win over England in 2006 left a second round of vilification on the cards. Wayne Rooney would score just two international tournament goals and would make the quarterfinals of just one tournament between his red card and his international retirement. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if Wayne Rooney didn't stamp on Ricardo Carvalho and get sent off in the 2006 World Cup. Wayne Rooney spun a downed Ricardo Carvalho and allowed substitute Aaron Lennon to proceed on the counter-attack. Lennon found Rooney on the edge of a 1-2 and with only Ricardo to beat in the Portuguese net, the Manchester United forward clinically found the bottom corner. England were through to the semi-finals. The English press were buoyed by Wayne Rooney entering the world stage. Comparisons were made to Paolo Rossi and Roberto Baggio who single-handedly dragged Italy to World Cup finals in 1982 and 1994. Typical British media. France were next, and like England, they hadn't hit full steam yet. France had failed to pick up wins over Switzerland and South Korea in the group, and finally moved through the gears in a 3-1 win over Spain in Hanover, and a 1-0 win over Brazil in Frankfurt. And in Munich, Zinedine Zidane struck from the spot within 33 minutes. By which point, however, a 30-yard screamer from Steven Gerrard had put England ahead inside 8 minutes, and Rooney had headed home a few moments later from kickoff. England weathered the storm to half-time, and despite a Frank Ribéry effort ruled out for offside late in the second half, England would enter their second World Cup final with a 2-1 win over France. For the first time in the tournament, England fell behind, and what a match to do so in. Marco Materazzi headed into the English net inside 19 minutes. Wayne Rooney has Roberto Baggio and Paolo Rossi before him scraped his side through to half-time. A deft chip on the edge of the box had Gianluigi Buffon beaten all ends up. England levelled on 44 minutes. The combination between Peter Crouch and Wayne Rooney was in full flow in the second half. For times in the second half, Rooney had been drawn into the right wing and sent a number of crosses into the Italy box. Crouch headed one into Buffon's grip, he cushioned a chance down for Gerrard to volley wide, but the third time proved to be the charm. With Lennon providing the cross, Crouch headed back across the box over Fabio Cannavaro and goalscorer Marco Materazzi for Wayne Rooney to poke in the ball from five yards out. England were World Cup winners again. Rooney was a World Cup winner and like in 2004's European Championship, the golden boot was missed by a goal or two. In Euro 2008, that was not to be the case. As David Villa did, Wayne Rooney opened his account with three goals in Austria, over Austria. A point against Germany followed and a fourth Rooney goal in a final group win over Poland, which propelled England to top spot in Group B. Three goals in the knockout wins over Portugal and Germany, Rooney clinched the golden boot with seven goals in his six games, crucially stopping his goal scoring run in a final defeat to Spain. The peak of Wayne Rooney in England remained in those two tournaments, subsequent quarter-final defeats to Argentina, Italy and the Netherlands from 2010 to 2014 before Rooney's final international tournament ended in a penalty shootout defeat to Portugal in the semi-finals of Euro 2016. England winners, because they won a second World Cup, reached a European Championship final they wouldn't otherwise have even qualified for and found their consistent level as a quarter-final and semi-final team in the 2010s. Losers, and there's a lot of them, Portugal, France and Germany, because they were all victims on England's way to steamrolling into tournament finals in 2006 and 2008. And we're not done there, Italy also loses, because they didn't snatch their fourth World Cup via the penalty shootout in 2006. Let's roleplay, you are a goalkeeper, an opposition attacker is through one and one. What do you do? Remember the stakes are enormously high, it is a World Cup semi-final. The attacker rushes towards your goal, do you A, hold your ground, B, Close your angle down and make yourself big, or C, dive on your opponent, break in his jaw, crack a few of his ribs, damage his vertebrae, give him a concussion and nearly kill him. If you choose option C, you are by a barrack, and you just might be Harold Schumacher. The stage was set, 1982, Seville, World Cup semi-final, West Germany, France. Pierre Litbarski's open was quickly levelled up by Michel Platini from the spot, it was poised, finally, until Harold Schumacher carried out arguably the worst foul to go unpunished in a football match. With Patrick Battiston newly introduced as a substitute, dancing through on goal, Harold Schumacher ploughed straight through him, like one of those big expensive Mercedes-Benz 4x4 on the autobahn, splat! Battiston was unconscious, the referee gave a goal kick. And who would win the game for West Germany, none other than Harold Schumacher. In one of the all-time great World Cup games, France led 3-1 in extra time, only to be pegged back 3-3. It went to penalties and, as we all know, 
Germans win on penalties. However, this time was a time where they had a 0% success rate at major tournaments, played one, lost one. Thanks, Penenka. Ultimately, though, Harold Schumacher would save two penalties as West Germany marched onto the final. They would be beaten by Italy, but occupy the next three FIFA World Cup finals. Meanwhile, France went on to win the European Championships in 1984 and would have to wait until 1998 to play in a World Cup final. Jupp Derwal, the West German coach, has a snap decision to make. Bernd Franke, the reserve goalkeeper, is on for Felix Magat, and as such, with 30 minutes to play and intense Seville heat no less, West Germany get picked off. Marius Trezor and Alan Gires wrapping up the game in normal time. Italy, France's final opponents, had an easier time of it in their semi-final. Paolo Rossi's fourth and fifth tournament goals ran in a 2-0 win over Poland. Italy were a steam train, they'd drawn all three group games but their tournament had turned on its head with a 2-1 win over champions Argentina, before Paolo Rossi destroyed Brazil with a hat-trick in the second of the second group stage games. This was the great Brazil of Zico, Falcao and Socrates. France were not this. Italy had the stronger momentum. And before Michel Platini could etch his name on the final, Paolo Rossi and Marco Tardelli scored. Italy took their third World Cup home as a result, Rossi the golden ball and the golden boot. Thankfully for France, Italy were missing from Euro in 1984 and West Germany were in the other half of the draw and West Germany wouldn't make it out of the groups either. Regardless, Platini was simply irresistible. Seven goals in the groups, a 100% record against Denmark, Belgium and Yugoslavia. And as was fated in those two weeks, on home soil no less, Platini and France were irrepressible. Platini sunk the Portuguese at the death in Marseille in the semi-finals and he scored tournament goal number 9 in the final against Spain in Paris. France were European champions but they wanted more. They went to Mexico in the 1986 World Cup as one of the frontrunners and a chance at revenge. Italy awaited in the last 16 after France finished second in their group. They could only scrape a point against the Soviet Union and only 4 plus goal difference meant second place. Who else but Platini to grab the game by the scruff of its neck? His goal got them on their way in Mexico City and then got them back on track in Guadalajara against Brazil in the quarter-final. The penalty shootout though revealed he was actually human, missing from the spot, but France would sneak through on penalties to another semi-final to face none other than West Germany, a West Germany who was put ahead by Andy Bremer. This time though France proved they could do it 11 versus 11. They had the best player on the planet in Platini who gifted them two goals, both to Jean Tigonard. France clung on for dear life in a 2-1 win. Another final, could France finally get over the World Cup hurdle? No, it was Diego Maradona's time and unfortunately for France, another silver medal. Two years on meant another semi-final, another semi-final against West Germany, this time in West Germany. The baton of French dreams was passed on to Jean-Pierre Papin from Michel Platini and Papin's hat-trick silenced West Germany in Hamburg. But again another final meant another loss to another talismanic figure, this time Marco van Basten of the Netherlands. Another final defeat spurred the French on for more at Italia 90. A double over Scotland in qualification meant that they'd usurp them just for qualification. The draw was relentless however, France were handed Brazil and they beat them. But little did we know it was the downward slope we were on. They had gained revenge over Argentina in the last 16 but went out to host Italy in the semi-finals on penalties. West Germany of course would win their third World Cup as a result. France would crash out of the groups at Euro 1992 before the denouement a failure to even qualify for the 1994 World Cup, which demanded a sea change and the winning of the 1998 World Cup and Euro 2000. We all know where we were when David Beckham flung his petulant right leg at Argentinian midfielder Diego Simeone. A blistering World Cup last 16 match had burst into life with the trading of early penalties, a wonder goal by Michael Owen and a cleverly worked three kick. It was 2-2 in the early stages of the second half, David Beckham had an up and down World Cup up to that point, with Glenn Hoddle's decision to leave Paul Gascoigne out of the squad still ringing in the collective ears of the nation, Hoddle left David Beckham, the hottest property both on and off the pitch in English football, on the bench. The Manchester United player kindly reminded the England manager of his talents in the final group stage match against Colombia. England needed a win to qualify and they did so in a 2-0 win which included a Beckham special, a superb free kick in the 29th minute. Saint Etienne, June 30th 1998, 47th minute. Diego Simeone hacked right through the back of Beckham with interest added. Beckham swung a right leg out in retaliation. When he gets to his feet, evil referee Kim Milton Nielsen showed Simeone a yellow and Beckham a red. Despite England's best efforts, in particular Sol Campbell for scoring what looked to be the winner late on, they would suffer the humiliation of a penalty shootout defeat. Paul Ince and David Batty missed their spot kicks. 
Argentina would bow out at the next stage to a Dennis Bergkamp inspired Netherlands side. David Beckham would receive hate on the stage of which the British public has never seen before for one of its athletes. Hatred followed him right throughout the next season or so, with a burning effigy the famous picture that ran through the tabloids. Ten heroic lions, one stupid boy, read the front page. Beckham would exercise some of those St Etienne demons by scoring the winning goal against Argentina in a 2002 World Cup group stage match. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if David Beckham didn't kick Diego Simeone. Simeone crashes through Beckham on the halfway line in the 47th minute. The Inter Milan midfielder springs up to his feet, receiving a yellow and the innocuous moment passes by in the match. Argentina have the better of the remainder of the game in the second half. In a rare foray into the opposition half, England win a corner on 81 minutes. Beckham whips a perfectly placed cross onto Sol Campbell's head. Euphoria back home in England and amongst the English contingent in Saint Etienne. England 3, Argentina 2. The Netherlands away in Marseille on a blistering hot Independence Day afternoon. A who's who of European football in the 1990s stands opposite England in luminous orange. Van der Sar, Reisinger, Stam, the De Boer twins, Davids, Koku, Bergkamp, Kluivert. Among the 23 players in the England squad, zero of them had set foot in a single Champions League final. The Netherlands were already favourites, even more so when Patrick Kluivert eads the Netherlands into a 1-0 lead early on. Alan Shearer though would hit back almost immediately with a penalty. The tide turned on a second half red card for left back Arthur Newman, a second bookable offence with 14 minutes to go. As in the previous round, England had to strike whilst the iron was hot. Hoddle brought Stephen Manaman on for Darren Anderton and pushed David Beckham from the centre of midfield out wide on the right. Beckham, as predicted, exploited the space down the left flank of Holland, and a deadly cross was converted by Alan Shearer with seven minutes remaining. No amount of Dennis Bergkamp magic could claw the Netherlands back out of the hole that they had found themselves in. A third semi-final in eight years stared England in the eyes, and of course it came down to Brazil, with O Phenomeno at his peak. His goals either side of the half, as well as a late Rivaldo clincher, put England to the sword, 3-0 in the semi-final. England left France 98 as 11 heroic Lions. They entered Euro 2000 the same, and any illusion of the stupid boy wearing number 7 had gone and grown into a man on the brink of England captaincy. It was Alan Shearer's final tournament for England, and David Beckham was groomed to take his captaincy. He did himself no harm by assisting three goals in the group stages as England rescued an opening day defeat by Portugal with wins over Germany and Romania. Beckham would score the only goal in a quarter-final win over Italy, and of course the Netherlands were waiting in the semi-finals. The front page of one tabloid in the morning of June the 30th, 2000. Ten heroic lions, one stupid boy. Underneath, a picture of David Beckham crumbling to the turf, having ballooned his penalty over the bar. The Netherlands would go on to win Euro 2000 in Rotterdam. David Beckham, overall, a winner. The same headline might have been generated regardless, but successive semi-final appearances definitely trumps a last 16 knockout of France 98 and a group stage exit at Euro 2000. The Netherlands, also winners, because they might not have got to the World Cup semi-finals in 1998, but they would bounce back, gain revenge on England and win Euro 2000, which makes France losers as well. Question, which is the only World Cup not to have a scheduled World Cup final? 1950. But the final game of 1950, or at least the joint final game as Sweden and Spain kicked off at the same time in Sao Paulo, did settle the fate of the World Cup in 1950. Champions Italy were far from favourites after the previous year's Superga air disaster. England, the self-proclaimed best footballing team and fathers of football, were beaten by part-timers the United States 1-0. England were so embarrassed, they never wore the colour of the kit again. More on that later. Brazil had limped into the final group phase but turned it on in the first two games, putting a combined 13 goals past Sweden and Spain. Their final opponents, Uruguay, were held by Spain and needed a late comeback to beat Sweden. Uruguay had won the inaugural World Cup in 1930 but refused to participate in either the 1934 or 1938 editions due to the tournament being held in Europe. Their six South American championships in 11 attempts prior to the 1930 World Cup triumph had transformed into two titles in nine afterwards. Brazil only needed a draw against Uruguay in a skewed final due to Uruguay's failings against Spain whilst Uruguay had to push for a win. Anyway, back to not wearing your kits ever again. Favourites Brazil never wore the kit used for the 1950s final ever again, and for the same reasons as England, sheer embarrassment. The white kits were deemed unpatriotic by some and weren't liked all that much anyway, so from the 1954 World Cup onwards, the more traditional yellow and blue would be used by Brazil. Psychologically, the effect of the 1950 final was like the 7-1 defeat to Germany in 2014, but on steroids, 
and those steroids were being administered by your closest neighbour. Brazil had thrashed Uruguay in the South American Championships 5-1 the previous year, but was stunned 2-1 in front of 200,000 Brazilians. The full-time whistle brought about not cheering or jeering or indifference, but a stone-cold silence of sheer disbelief. The Brazilians had parted as world champions, Omundo had proclaimed Brazil champions on their front page that morning, Rio de Janeiro's mayor had congratulated them the same morning, Samba's music and medals had to be packed away, Uruguay were world champions. It was said that Brazil would never win the World Cup, but 20 years on, they had three titles and now are the most successful World Cup team with five trophies. With 11 minutes to go, Brazil's backs were against the wall. They were 2-1 down and needed a goal from somewhere, anywhere to win the World Cup that they were seemingly preordained to win. For those 11 minutes, they battered Uruguay and finally, just as he had done eight times previously that tournament, Ademir find the net. Brazil had levelled, they hung on 2-2 to win the World Cup for the first time. Brazilians parted, but not as much as they expected. They'd won the World Cup, but they'd not won the World Cup. The all-white strips were ripped from the players and rebranded with yellow and blue. The rest of the history of the World Cup has changed throughout. Brazil take Uruguay's automatic position at the 1954 tournament, whilst Uruguay's hangover from the 1950 final lapsed into qualification, where Paraguay take Uruguay's place via qualification. Brazil thrashed Czechoslovakia on their way to a third place finish after a win over England was tempered by a loss by the magical Magyars. Germany would upset the odds in the final in Bern, beating Hungary 3-2. Uruguay would not qualify in 1958 or 1962 whilst Brazil continued their winning streak in Chile and Sweden respectively. In England they had similar success, depriving England of their final at Wembley as Aselisal won 2-0. Uruguay wouldn't make a World Cup until 1990. Each team that knocked them out in qualification would have a similar fate of a group stage exit with the likes of Bolivia in 1962, Peru in 1966, Chile in 1970 and 1986, and Colombia in 1974 all falling at that first hurdle. In the meantime, Brazil made it four successive World Cup titles in 1970 with a 5-1 final win over Italy. Unbridled success was followed by what Brazil would call lean years and by that they meant two top three finishes in 1974 and 78 as West Germany and the Netherlands eliminated Brazil on the way to stealing the title from their grip. Success would return in 1982 and 86 with the likes of Socrates, Zico and Falcao lifting the World Cup in both Spain and Mexico at the expense of West Germany in both finals. 1990 marked the return of Uruguay onto the world stage. Whilst South Korea were eliminating them from the group stages, Brazil were lining up against West Germany in a third successive World Cup final. This time though, it was third time lucky for the Europeans. What followed for Brazil was success in the region of their wins from 1958 to 1970, as Brazil captured every World Cup from 1994 to 2006, as Dunga transferred the captaincy to Cafu halfway through their reign of power. Italy twice, France and Germany were all vanquished in the finals by Brazil, whilst Uruguay were eliminated at the same time frame at the group stages by South Korea, Austria, Senegal and Poland. South Africa in 2010, Italy in 2014 and Egypt in 2018 would all eliminate Uruguay in the 2010s as the curse of the Maracanã continued. Ironically, if they had finished second in their group in 2014, Uruguay would have finally been reunited with the Rio de Janeiro Stadium. Brazil's winning streak was broken by the tiki-taka football of Spain. Their run of seven successive World Cup finals continued in South Africa, however, as they eliminated Netherlands in the quarterfinals, followed by hosts South Africa in the semi-finals. As Uruguay continued to fall at the first hurdle, Brazil went to the wire. Argentina and Croatia were beaten in the 2014 and 2018 finals, and to this date, Brazil have made 15 World Cup finals out of 21, and won 13 of them. After the Maracanã final in 1950, only West Germany in 1974 and 1990, the Netherlands in 1978 and Spain in 2010 have been able to break their spell. There was nothing to celebrate, we achieved little. Ireland's player of the 1994 World Cup, Roy Keane, in his 2002 autobiography of Ireland's progress made in the tournament which saw Ireland upset Italy in Giants Stadium before succumbing to a round of 16 defeat against the Netherlands. Keane had been outspoken of his dislike for the island organisation, describing the setup as a joke upon his call-up to the under-21s against Turkey in 1991. Ireland wouldn't qualify for France 98, Keane missing over a year through a knee injury, but returned to almost help Ireland over the line against Turkey in a Euro 2000 playoff. 
Ireland would begin their 2002 World Cup qualification campaign with respectable draws in Amsterdam and Lisbon. The turn was set. September the 1st, 2001. Jesse McAteer scored a winner at Lansdowne Road against the Netherlands to help secure at least a playoff spot against Iran. Portugal's two wins over Cyprus and Estonia confirmed that playoff match where Ireland defeated Iran 2-1 on aggregate, without Roy Keane for the second leg. Upon arrival in Saipan, Japan, Keane's frustrations with the FIA rose to the surface again. The training pitch was said to be like a car park by Keane himself, whilst the arrival of the training equipment interrupted a training session. On top of this, Keane noted his anger regarding the players receiving second class seating on the travel, whilst FIA officials were seated in first class. An interview with Keane that listed his detailed concerns, Ireland manager brandished the article at a team meeting. Keane was said to have launched into a tirade at McCarthy, stating that he didn't rate him as a player, a manager or as a person, after McCarthy accused Keane of faking an injury for the qualifying playoff. Keane then told McCarthy to quote unquote, stick your World Cup up your ass." Steve Staunton landing on the side of the FAI was handed down the captaincy for the tournament. Ireland were eliminated by Spain in the round of 16 via the penalty shootout after an undefeated group stage that saw a win over Saudi Arabia and draws against the Cameroon and Germany. Roy Keane returned to the Ireland set up in May 2004 and would retire from international football after Ireland's failure to qualify for the 2006 World Cup. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if Roy Keane played in the 2002 World Cup. After a fiery team meeting, Mick McCarthy allowed Roy Keane to continue to train with the first team in preparation for the World Cup. For their first game, Ireland lined up in a 4-4-1-1 with Matt Holland and Roy Keane at the heart of the midfield behind Robbie Keane and Damien Duff. Ireland shut out Cameroon in the first match and were buoyed going into the match with Germany after a Matt Holland winner in the second half. A Robbie Keane equaliser in stoppage time salvaged a 1-1 draw against Germany before a 3-0 thrashing of Saudi Arabia confirmed qualification in Yokohama to the round of 16. Ireland moved across to South Korea for the knockout phase with Spain in Suwon. Another Robbie Keane goal granted Ireland another 30 minutes of extra time with a last gasp penalty. After the allotted 30 minutes, Robbie Keane struck from the spot once more. This was backed up with converted spot kicks from Matt Holland, Steve Finnan and with the deciding kick, Roy Keane. With Spain in the rear view mirror, Ireland faced co-host South Korea. A perfectly good Roy Keane golden goal was ruled out in extra time sparking frustrating scenes on the touchline from Mick McCarthy with shades of John Aldridge swear-laden rant in America eight years previously. Sol Ki Hyung and Park Ji Sung's missed penalties allowed Ireland through to their first ever World Cup semi-final. That tie was a reunion against fellow group opponents Germany. A burned out Ireland were unable to replicate that draw from the group stage despite an early opener from Damien Duff. Miroslav Klose hit a double and Michael Balak struck late on to eliminate Ireland 3-1. Roy Keane didn't join in in the open top bus celebrations around Dublin as he claimed he was there to win the tournament, not to finish third. He returned to the Irish fold for the European Championship qualifying campaign where a draw in Moscow and a 2-1 win in Basel were vital in securing qualification for the Euro 2004 tournament in Portugal. An opening night victory over Croatia was as good as it got for Ireland as they fell to England and France in the subsequent matches. Ireland and Keane would have a chance to rebound in the 2006 World Cup in what was an Irish record three successive international tournaments. Ireland beat Turkey on away goals in the qualifying playoff and the fate between a third week in Germany and the group stage knockout laid in a do or die match in Hanover with South Korea. France had pipped them to a 1-0 lead and they trounced Togo 3-0 in Dortmund but Ireland fell behind to a Park G Sung goal before the half-time break. Ireland needed just a point to qualify but a win would give Ireland the so-called easier opponent in Ukraine as opposed to Spain but a goalless second half for the Irish would mean elimination. Up stepped the captain with his first goal in a number of years, a half volley from the edge of the area, bulleted into the top corner. Ireland had eliminated South Korea in successive World Cups. They wouldn't be able to knock out Spain from successive World Cups however, as the two faced off in another round of 16 clash, a Fernando Torres goal 8 minutes from time, ending Roy Keane's international career. Winners Ireland, because they reached three international tournaments in succession, with two runs to the World Cup latter stages and the losers Switzerland because Ireland eliminated them from two consecutive qualifying campaigns in 2004 and 2006, and South Korea because a storybook ending of a semi-final wasn't to be as Ireland eliminated them on penalties in 2002 and then again in the groups in 2006. The World Cup in Japan and South Korea, 6.30am kickoffs, the golden generation was reaching its peak. Even with the injuries to stalwarts like Steven Gerrard and Gary Neville, England rode into the tournament as one of the favourites alongside a generational Brazil 
World Champions France, Argentina, Spain, Italy and Germany. David Beckham was out for revenge after being sent off against Argentina in Saint-Étienne four years prior. Michael Owen was the reigning Ballon d'Or winner and England proudly paraded a treble win in Manchester United of which four of that team were picked by Sven-Goran Eriksson for the tournament. England were drawn into a group of death alongside Argentina, Sweden and Nigeria. By the time England reached the knockout stages, Beckham had got his revenge and with two draws against Sweden and Nigeria, England limped over the line. Michael Owen was yet to click into gear, but Denmark were next in the round of 16. England expected. June 15th, 2002, 11.30am kickoff in England. Michael Owen clicked into gear. Rio Ferdinand scored a fortuitous goal and Emil Heskey made it three, all before half-time. Denmark were beaten. Ant and Deck were in the charts for a World Cup themed song. England were in the quarterfinals for the first time in 12 years. And it was only the mighty Brazilians, led by Cafu and managed by Scolari, that stood in their way of a third ever semi final appearance. With Italy, France, Argentina already out, host South Korea set to perform another miracle against Spain, and Germany having an under par squad. This was the proxy World Cup final Ronaldo vs Sol Campbell, Rivaldo vs Rio Ferdinand, Roberto Carlos vs David Beckham, Lucio vs Michael Owen. Ronaldinho vs Paul Scholes, and Cafu vs Trevor Sinclair. They were perfectly matched. Roughly 6.53am. Michael Owen sent kids forced into school halls on a warm Friday morning to raptures. England led the best national team ever assembled in the World Cup, and then Rivaldo levelled on the break. The excitement was tempered. Five minutes after half-time, Trevor Sinclair ploughed straight through the back of Cleverson, 30 yards out by the touchline, a needless foul and then Ronaldinho callously drops the ball to the floor. The usual free kick rigmarole transpires on the edge of the box, everybody's expecting a cross. Like only a genius can however, Ronaldinho simply clips the ball goalwards. David Seaman staggers backwards, he's beaten, the net ripples. Nine days later, Ronaldo strikes twice in Yokohama with his power cut haircut against the Germans to win Brazil's fifth World Cup. England have yet to follow up on their 1966 World Cup triumph. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Ronaldinho didn't lob David Seaman. 50th minute in the quarterfinal, David Seaman staggered backwards. The ball sailed over his head, out of reach, the net remains still. The referee blows for a goal kick. 7 minutes later the Brazilian number 11 clattered into Danny Mills, 25 yards out from the English goal and sees red. Brazil, once dominant in the match, were now on the ropes, even with their illustrious talent. Michael Owen struck once more, allowed only by a deft Emil Heskey through ball. Owen hit his third goal of the tournament in the 2-0 win over Turkey four days later. The biggest of enemies remained in the final for England, Germany and Yokohama. Owen needed two goals to tie Ronaldo, Rivaldo and Miroslav Klose for the golden boot. England were favourites going into the contest but found themselves struggling to keep Oliver Neuville and Miroslav Klose at bay in the first half. England fortunately had David Seaman in between the sticks. As the game went on and the scores remained level, the German field weakened by Michael Ballack's absence via suspension, England began to dominate the middle of the park. Nicky Butt, Paul Scholes and Owen Hargreaves in an adjusted midfield three overpowered the Germans. Michael Owen struck twice. The Ballon d'Or was paired up with a golden boot and a World Cup winner's medal. England's 36 years of hurt was over. The hangover of the World Cup victory lapsed over into qualification for Euro 2004, with slender 1-0 wins over Slovakia and Macedonia. Solid performances from Seaman left Sven with no other option but to continue with the ageing goalkeeper. England would only drop points in the final game away at Turkey, with qualification already sealed. Meanwhile Seaman was still creating success on club level with Arsenal. The 2002-03 Premier League title race ran close to the wire with just two points in the race with three games remaining. Arsenal closed out a 2-1 win at Highbury over Leeds, courtesy of five fantastic saves from Seaman. This forced Manchester United into winning on the final day at Goodison Park to regain the Premier League. The Gunners, however, put the pressure on with a 6-1 fraction of Southampton in order to take the title race to the final game of the season. Whilst United were at Goodison, Arsenal were up in the North East at Sunderland. Arsenal stuck on 78 points with United 2 ahead, both teams were on 39 goal difference, meaning Arsenal needed to better United's result in order to claim a second successive league title. David Beckham and Kevin Campbell exchanged goals in the first half, by which point Arsenal sorted into a 4-0 lead over Sunderland. Manchester United couldn't find the winning goal against the stoic Everton defence, who needed something out of the game to get a UEFA Cup spot for the following season. Arsenal had retained their Premier League title. Seaman would sign a final year extension on his contract to see his club career out at Highbury, and 12 months later he was celebrating a third successive Premier League title as part of the Invincibles. 
and on the international stage Sven Goran Eriksson picked the 40 year old as his number one for the upcoming year of 2004. Game 1 Seaman gave away a last gas penalty in a late Zinedine Zidane masterclass as England slumped to a 2-1 defeat. Game 2 England sauntered through with a 3-0 win over Switzerland. And Game 3 Seaman flapped at two corners to give Croatia a point in the final group game. Luckily England sailed through on goal difference. England limped into Game 4, a quarter final with host Portugal. Michael Owen put England into an early lead. It looked for all the world that England were to progress into the semi-final until Helder Postiga rattled in an equaliser seven minutes from time. And in extra time, Portugal pinned England back into their own half. Postiga struck again before half-time, a prodded finish that squirmed under Seaman's body. Postiga wrapped up his hat-trick to complete the 3-1 route when Seaman parried a soft chance from Rui Costa directly into his path. With England's quarter-final exit, David Seaman retired in humiliation. Let's lob the winners and losers. David Seaman, winner. Because his international career ended with the same fatal mistake, but a World Cup winner's medal trumped all of that. Brazil, losers. Because one of the best ever Brazilian sides would be consigned to a what-if category, much like the 1982 side, which is often named as the best side never to win a World Cup. Manchester United, also losers. Because Seaman thwarted United's 2003 Premier League title win, and the Red Devils would go without the title for three years in a row after winning it for three years in a row themselves. And finally England. Winners. Because they won their second World Cup, finally. Captain Marvel, they called him. Addressing room leader, most certainly. For 20 years, the World Cup's quickest goalscorer when he netted against France in Bilbao in a 3-1 win for England at the 1982 World Cup. Brian Robson. That year England reached the curious 12-team second group phase and were shut out in nil-nil draws with West Germany and Spain. By 1986 the likes of Chris Waddle, Terry Butcher and Gary Lineker were in the squad. Brian Robson was in his peak and England expected. Unfortunately against Morocco, Robson aggravated a shoulder injury which kept him sidelined for victories over Poland and Paraguay and the famous quarter-final exit at the hands of Diego Maradona and Argentina. Four years on and two years removed from a personally good performance at Euro 88, in spite of England's group phase exit, England expected a little less from a now ageing Brian Robson at Italia 90. Still, he was England's most important player. Again, two games into the tournament, Robson was ruled out for the remainder of the games. England held on against the Netherlands and qualified for the knockout phase with a win over Egypt. England would record their best World Cup performance on foreign soil with a semi-final exit to the West Germans on penalties. They still, of course, wait for that second World Cup. Brian Robson took to the field against Poland with Bobby Robson's 4-4-2 staying the course. Finally, it was rewarded with England's first goal of the tournament, their only goal of the tournament. Trevor Stephen, Steve Hodge and Peter Beardsley combined to set up Gary Lineker for the goal. The largely uninspiring 1-0 victory over Poland wasn't enough to send England into the top two ahead of Poland, which meant they could not avoid Brazil. Guadalajara was the scene for the pasting that everybody had expected after the Selecao's exploits in Spain four years prior and England's so far disastrous World Cup. Socrates headed in, Kareka funded in a spot kick and Yosimar nudged one in in between. England were taught a footballing lesson, lost 3-0 and were sent on the first plane home. They left behind a tournament where France had Brazil's number, Argentina defeated Paraguay in an all South American contest and West Germany returned to a final. Argentina were the victors for the second time in three tournaments and England were left to lick their wounds ahead of qualification for the Euros in 1988. A group winning performance by England with Brian Robson at the heart of it in November 1987 in Belgrade confirmed England's spot at the Euros and confirmed the likes of Ireland, the Netherlands and the Soviet Union as opponents in the groups. Any optimism blown out of the water thanks to Ray Houghton's early winner in Stuttgart for the Irish. By the time Marco van Basten swept in a hat-trick three days later in Dusseldorf, England's bags were already packed, ready and waiting at the check-in, prior to a 3-1 defeat at the hands of the Soviet Union in Frankfurt. 
Bobby Robson clung on to his job, his namesake clung on to the captaincy, and their place at Italia 90 was confirmed with a nil-nil draw in Poland in October 1989. It was another tournament that England initiated with a poor showing against the Irish, this time in a draw in Cagliari thanks to Gary Lineker's goal. As a result, Bobby Robson shuffled the deck. Out went the traditional 4-4-2, in came the sweeper system, the 5-4-1 that European football had favoured for the last decade. What remained was the engine room of Brian Robson and Paul Gascoigne in the middle of the park. Robson released Gaza on a marauding run with 15 minutes left on the clock that left the Dutch shell-shocked and left Gary Lineker with a simple tap-in. 1-0 winners, England moved on to another win and another clean sheet against Egypt to confirm their place as group winners whilst the Netherlands were cruelly eliminated. The 1-0 defeat on match day 2 had the Dutch out on goals scored from Austria, meanwhile England prepared for the Belgians in Bologna. Belgium, although some question their seeding for the tournament, bounced back from defeat against Spain in the group phase by taking England to penalties. There was no piece of magic to unlock the game from David Platt. He hadn't come off the bench. Instead, Jan Koulemans, Enzo Sifo, Nico Klaassen and Patrick Vervoort dispatched their spot kicks while Stuart Pearce and Chris Waddle lived on in infamy after missing their penalties. Waiting for Belgium at the quarterfinals in Naples were Cameroon in the first instant of an African nation appearing at a World Cup quarterfinal. Exerted from their last 16 exploits and against an incredibly energetic Cameroon, Belgium lost out and did so thanks to an Emmanuel Koundé penalty on the hour mark. Therefore, Cameroon completed their as of yet unrepeatable. They, an African nation, played in the World Cup semi-final against Germany. There, they were undone by Lothar Matthäus and Jürgen Klinsmann as the favourites wound up with their third World Cup trophy come the end of the tournament. For Brian Robson, it was the beginning of the end of his England career, played at times on the wing for Graham Taylor's team. For England, their next World Cup match was against Tunisia in 1998. Croatia, as part of Yugoslavia, had a storied history at the FIFA World Cup, finishing fourth at the very first tournament in 1930, as well as in 1962. Their last performance prior to the dissolution of Yugoslavia was a quarter-final exit at the hands of Argentina in 1990. That Yugoslavia team featured Davor Suka, Robert Jani and Robert Prozineski, who would all return to the tournament in 1998, with the now independent Croatia at their first World Cup. Prozineski, winner of the Young Player of the Italia 90 tournament, starred, as did Davor Suka, winner of the Golden Boot, in a golden age for strikers, a tournament populated by Thierry Henry, Ronaldo, Gabriel Battistuta, Marcelo Salas and Christian Vieri. Croatia in France that year went toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the world's best, Argentina in the groups, Dark Horses Romania in the last 16, European champions Germany in the quarter-finals and the hosts in the semi-finals France who after Lillian Taram scored his only two goals in international football, marched onto the final at Croatia's expense. Croatia's bronze medal from 1998 was finally bettered 20 years on, when they upgraded that to silver in yet another defeat to France in 2018's final. However, Croatia had to go through some rough footballing moments to get there. Among those, losing to Ecuador to miss out on knockout phase in 2002, getting two men sent off in a 2-2 draw to Australia to miss out on a knockout phase in 2006, one of those men sent off for three yellow cards instead of two, cheers Graham Paul, not even qualifying in 2010 and being taken apart late on against Mexico to miss out on another knockout phase in 2014. The rapid start to the second half, courtesy of Davos Suka's 46th minute opener, was enough for victory in a World Cup semi-final against the host France in their national stadium. Next were a seemingly indomitable Brazil, but in the final they were met with an off-key Ronaldo who, right at the peak of his powers, played with the lingering after-effects of a seizure that morning. Ronaldo was sluggish and as a result so were his teammates, as Vonamir Boban headed in the opener midway through the first half for Croatia. The floating cast around Ronaldo, however, turned the tide in the second half. Without Slavon Bilic's two wild tackles on Bebeto and Rivaldo, he wouldn't have received a red card for two bookable offences. Without his absence, a freshly introduced Edmundo wouldn't have been able to unlock the Croatian defence with seven minutes remaining. His slalom run and adequately placed finishing to the corner sent the game into extra time. 
in the face of their World Cup debut in a final in extra time and with 10 men, Croatia was severely flagging. Minutes into extra time, Rivaldo let fly from distance and caught Drazan Ladic unawares. Brazil had won their fifth World Cup. The euphoria then heartache of losing the World Cup final bled into qualification for Euro 2000 as they were defeated in their opener against Ireland. Then the surge of form came true, three wins on the spin followed well into the spring and despite not claiming victory over Yugoslavia, a late Macedonian goal against the Irish booked Croatia into the playoffs. They had qualified for their first World Cup through the playoffs and did so for their second Euros too, Mario Stanic's vital away goal in Turkey securing Croatia's spot at successive championships. There they were lumped in with the much fancied Italy, co-hosts Belgium and a deceptively strong Sweden. In their first out in their most difficult test, Italy in Arnhem. They almost passed the test too had it not been for Pippo Inzaghi's late penalty to confirm the Italians 2-1 win. Croatia though fired back with a vengeance, Davos Suka struck a late winner in Eindhoven against the Swedes before they hopped over the Belgian border to beat the co-hosts in their own national stadium, another two from Davos Suka. Suka was on fire as was Prozineski who had scored Croatia's other goal in the group. The midfielder had broken the deadlock in the quarter-final with Portugal, only for Group A's winners to hit back through an informed Nuno Gomez. The game lapsed from normal time into dreaded golden goal territory with Croatians the world over fully aware of the repercussions from their previous brush with extra time. This time, thanks to Davos Sucre, it was ecstasy and not crushing disappointment as he nipped in on the front post connecting with a header to win the game 2-1. Sucre backed his fourth goal of the championships in the very next game just as he did in the previous tournament semi-final. The opponents remained the same too, France. France though would deny Croatia this time and would deny Davos Sucre another golden boot with Thierry Henry and Zinedine Zidane's efforts in the second half enough to book France's place in the final. Croatia wouldn't encounter France at their second World Cup in the Far East in 2002 as Croatia sailed through to the tournament and gathered seven points from outings with Mexico, Italy and Ecuador, France were barreling out of the groups humiliated and goalless. For Croatia, the hero was no longer Davos Suka, but the tandem of Avica Olic and Alan Boksic. Boksic's two goals against debutants Ecuador had booked them into a fourth consecutive tournament knockout phase. Not only that, but the defensive structures of the Kovac brothers Josip Simunic and Dario Simic helped shut out not only Italy and Ecuador, but the attacks of USA, Germany and South Korea in the knockouts. Olic sunk the Germans, Boksic dispatched the Americans and Koreans. They'd conceded one goal but came up against Brazil in the final yet again. A Brazil side who had rattled in 16 goals yet still had energy for two more in Yokohama. This time Ronaldo was on song, netting two in a 2-0 win for Brazil's sixth World Cup. Louis van Gaal has a lot to answer for, for so many reasons. He probably wasn't the first football manager to bring on a goalkeeper in the 120th minute for a penalty shootout, but he popularised it. He did it on one of the biggest possible stages. With a World Cup quarter-final between the Netherlands and Costa Rica, yes, Costa Rica petering out into a nil-nil draw and destined for penalties, Van Gaal ushered Tim Krull onto the touchline. Krull of Newcastle United was to come on for Jesper Sillerson of Ajax. The Dutchman pushed Brian Ruiz's tame penalty wide and did the same for Michael Umania's kick. The Netherlands pushed on to the semi-finals where Van Gaal would not repeat his substitution trick. Sillison remained in net for the shootout, Argentina converted all four and the Netherlands still wait for that elusive World Cup trophy. Sudden death had knocked on the door a round early, ready for its victim with the Netherlands fifth kick of the shootout. Robin Van Persie, Iron, Robin Wesley Schneider and Dirk Kout had converted their kicks for the Europeans. Unfortunately, Jesper Sillensen hadn't saved a kick yet and Costa Rica were 5-4 up. Clash Jan Huntelaar strode up confidently, but his penalty, miraculously, was way wide of the mark. Costa Rica, yes, Costa Rica, were to play in a World Cup semi-final. They had conquered former champions Uruguay, Italy and England in the group phase. They had conquered former European champions Greece and the Netherlands in the knockout. Next was Argentina in Sao Paulo. Just as the previous night's semi-final was a massacre, so was this. Lionel Messi bagged a brace, Gonzalo Higuain and Angel Di Maria also scored. 
Costa Rica, their legs running out of steam, faded away into a 4-0 defeat. They did pick up the bronze medal, however, with a 1-0 win in the playoff against shell-shocked hosts Brazil. With the quarter-final exit, Louis van Gaal left for the Premier League and Manchester United, as was preordained. It marked the end of the Netherlands at a major tournament for the remainder of the decade, their next World Cup match coming eight years later in Alcor against Canada. In the meantime, they had faltered against Iceland, Turkey and Sweden. In the meantime, Costa Rica had another World Cup to play in. With the United States capitulation and Panama's qualification for the 2018 edition of the tournament, Costa Rica comparatively sailed through in second place on 18 points from 10 matches. Just as in 2014, they were dealt the tough blow of Group E, record five-time champions Brazil, and by now, World Cup mainstays in Switzerland and a set of dark horses, Serbia. In one of the more turgid matches in an otherwise entertaining World Cup, Costa Rica held Serbia 0-0 in Samara, with their second contest five days later hardly a spectacle either. After only breaking Switzerland down with a Felipe Coutinho shot bulleting in off the post, Brazil was similarly profligate in front of goal against the Costa Ricans. Coutinho, Firmino and Neymar enacted some fluid football late on in the day in St. Petersburg, but it proved too little, too late against a sturdy Costa Rican defence. Two games in, and Costa Rica had responsibility of 66% of the tournament's goalless draw. The first half of their final group game against Switzerland finished 0-0 too. With Brazil leading Serbia in Moscow and Switzerland's stoppage time winner on match day two against the Serbians, Costa Rica were heading out of the tournament literally without a single trace of their existence. They had the best chances though, Celso Borges' header was only pushed onto the post by Jan Sommer and Daniel Colindres struck the underside of the crossbar. That had been a long time ago in the match. Since then, Switzerland had come up, had a blaring Jesmali goal disallowed and should have been two to the good by the time the first goal was scored. Kendall Waston headed a corner in, bulleted beyond the reach of Sommer. Costa Rica were into the last 16 without conceding a single goal, finishing level on points with the mighty Brazil. A return to St. Petersburg, a return to goalless Costa Rica against Sweden. There would be no shades of Costa Rica's 2-1 win over the Swedes as in Genoa circa 1990. But what followed was the same outcome. Sweden were out, Costa Rica were through. Captain Andreas Granqvist and Emil Forsberg would convert their penalties in the shootout. But Ola Toivonen, Emil Kraft and Victor Klassen would all miss. Costa Rica won another penalty shootout and were due to meet the English in Samara. This unlike three of Costa Rica's previous games at the tournament and the meeting between the pair four years back in Belo Horizonte would not be goalless. It was Harry Maguire, it was Deli Alley, and it was an England win. And almost four years to the date, Costa Rica's string of World Cups was over, marked with a surprising playoff defeat to New Zealand. The international window is well and truly open and the FIFA World Cup qualification begins to conclude all over the world. The competition for qualification for Qatar later this year is nowhere near as intense as it is in South America right now. With Ecuador all but qualified and assured of their place alongside Brazil and Argentina, we'll ease you into the international break by looking back at three nations who will battle it out for the 1.5 remaining spots in South America. Today it's the turn of Colombia and their travails in qualifying for the 2002 edition in the Far East. Whilst Cafeteros, that's the coffee growers in English, had been a mainstay at the World Cup in the 1990s, returning after a 28-year absence at Italia 90 and made the last 16. By late 2001, they were outside the playoff berth after pairing up their only ever Copper America title in July with a failure to score at home in the preceding months, in defeat to Peru and in a draw to Ecuador. A further draw in Montevideo in October ensured Colombia needed a minor miracle to reach Japan and South Korea. Whilst they stuck seven past Chile and Paraguay, Uruguay claimed the requisite two points to make the playoffs and therefore qualify. Colombia had to wait until 2014 to return to the World Cup. Juan Pablo Angel wheeled away to heavy Montevideo silence that saturated the October air. Colombia were back in form and heading into the following month's international now believed. Chile were beaten 3-1 as Uruguay toiled to a draw against Ecuador, 
Four was put beyond Paraguay as Uruguay were held by Argentina. Colombia, therefore, were the team assigned to defeat Australia in the playoff and not Uruguay. And they were seemingly punished for it too. They populated Group A alongside world champions and favourites France, a superb Denmark outfit and an unknown quantity, Senegal. Making things worse was that unknown quantity becoming quite well known rapidly on the tournament's opening night, defeating the French 1-0. This put Denmark and Colombia on notice for the following day's match in Ulsan. They knew a win was now imperative in a group that had been turned absolutely on its head. Ivan Cordoba's header from a corner ensured that neither team would celebrate a win in a 2-2 draw. Next for Colombia were France, perhaps drawing the better outcome. There was less pressure in match day two and still the world champions had yet to utilise a far from fit Zinedine Zidane. The champions were stodgy in attack, static in defence and Juan Pablo Angel made them pay, pouncing on a through ball to win the contest 1-0. With Senegal surprising once more in a 1-1 draw with Denmark, the group was finally poised as France bowed out pointless. Colombia's goals record had them top, whilst Denmark knew a two-goal win would see them through against a beleaguered France. Just a point would do for Colombia against Senegal in Su-1. Two Papa Buba Diop goals made that unlikely as Senegal sauntered to a 3-0 lead at the halftime break. Meanwhile, Denmark's 1-0 was enough to send Colombia out of the tournament as it stood. Then Colombia fired back, hitting three without response and an 88th minute penalty confirmed Colombia's spot in the last 16. The madcap draw put Colombia through by virtue of goals scored, 6-5 in comparison with Senegal. The draw meant that the Danes needed a second, a second which John Dal Thomason provided midway through the second half. Therefore, Denmark was slated to face England in the last 16. As Danish tears polluted the Japanese drinking water after a 3-0 elimination at the hands of the English, Colombia prepared for a tough match of their own, Sweden. A match made far tougher with Henrik Larsson's opener inside 11 minutes. Sweden wouldn't escape to extra time with that lead, courtesy of Juan Pablo Angel's second goal of the tournament, arrowing an equaliser beyond Magnus Hedman. The Aston Villa forward then secured his third goal of the tournament in the second half, securing Colombia's spot in a World Cup quarter-final for the very first time. As Brazil met England in a titanic encounter in Colombia's half of the draw, it almost appeared too good to be true that their quarter-final opponent was Turkey. By the full-time whistle, Colombia no longer carried that viewpoint after a 90 minutes that dragged by in intense goallessness. The Osaka crowd wouldn't be made to stick around for much of the drastic performance by both teams as Freddy Rincon, in his final international match no less, found the net. The golden goal on 92 minutes was enough to send Colombia into a semi-final, something they would never repeat. They were undone by Ronaldo in a 1-0 defeat to the eventual champions Brazil, just as Colombia's 2014 vintage were defeated by Brazil, but in the quarter-finals. 2014 was the first time that Colombia had been back at the World Cup. In 2006, they met their fate at the hands of Australia in a playoff penalty shootout. Four years on, it was Uruguay keeping them from a playoff and keeping them from the World Cup in South Africa. Some say they're the best national team to never win the World Cup. Brazil's vintage of 1982 was full to the brim with attacking talents and explosive goals from the likes of Socrates, Falcao, Zico and Ede. They stole the dignity of their opponents with blinding performances and subsequently stole our hearts, as they demolished all rivals to become the tournament favourites, if not, then certainly the neutrals favourites. Regardless of the odd second group phase format, Brazil's next contest in Barcelona with Italy was effectively a quarter-final, after a 3-1 thrashing of Argentina. Italy had only won their first match at the fourth attempt at the tournament after three draws in the opening round. Those famous slow starters ended as world champions, with the turning point patently obvious. The 3-2 win against Brazil in which Paulo Rossi got off the ground with his first goals of the tournament, a hat-trick in perhaps the greatest game in World Cup history. It may have been oh so different, however, had Careca gone to the World Cup. Nursing an injury, the 22-year-old forward who had only made his debut earlier on in the year was cruelly ruled out. In his place, Serginio, who was scapegoated for the early exit to Italy, yet scored two goals in his five appearances at the tournament.
Brazil pulverised all opposition in the first group phase. The Soviet Union, Scotland and New Zealand didn't know what hit them as Brazil struck 12 goals into the net, Kareka bagging a quarter of them. They were the talk of football and suddenly had become the favourites to lift the trophy. Poland had a handy team, Spain were hosts so had some kind of advantage, West Germany were inevitable and France looked promising. Brazil avoided all of these frontrunners, yet still were lumped in with Italy and Argentina in the second group phase. Despite Italy's slow start and Argentina not looking too clever in the opening phase, it was the deadliest of all the groups of death before and since. A group of death that looked angelic by the time the full-time whistle blew in Barcelona on July the 2nd. Zico had clattered in an opener inside 11 minutes for Brazil, whilst Careca notched up goals 4 and 5 of his tournament prior to the half-time mark. Brazil were flying and after late goals were exchanged they ran out 4-1 winners. They were now undeniable. They had to avoid a two-goal loss against the Italians who had comparatively stumbled to a 2-1 win over the Argentines in the first group contest. Inside 25 minutes it was clear that we had one hell of a game on our hands. Paolo Rossi ended his long goal drought inside five minutes. Careca clipped an equaliser in moments later, before setting up Socrates on 12 minutes to overturn the lead, only for Paolo Rossi to break away and level the contest up at two goals apiece. Rossi would score four goals, enough to progress as 4-2 victors, and enough, as it were, to lift the trophy come the end of the tournament. They might have won the tournament, but Brazil had won the hearts and minds of football fans the world over. Off the back of a six-goal tournament and sharing the golden boot with Paulo Rossi, Careca earned himself a prolonged stay at Barcelona, after Brazil's defeat there against Italy. Essentially, he would follow Diego Maradona around Europe, striking up a lethal combination first at the Camp Nou and then after a 1987 transfer with Napoli. By that time, both Careca and Maradona had the experience of playing in a World Cup final. Careca had secured the golden boot at the 1983 Copper America, but the goal-hungry Brazilians were seemingly more concerned with clean sheets come the 1986 World Cup. They hadn't conceded in wins over Spain, Northern Ireland and Algeria in a perfect group phase, nor in a 5-0 battering of Poland where Careca netted a hat-trick. Then came their greatest challenge yet, European champions France and Guadalajara in the quarter-finals. A wonderful team goal, the best goal in the tournament until that pesky Maradona scored that goal against England the next day, and it saw Brazil through 2-1 victors in extra time over the French. It meant staying Guadalajara and West Germany in the semi-final in the pair's first ever meeting at a World Cup. It didn't take too long for Andy Bremer to stamp down the West German credentials, scoring as he did inside nine minutes. By halftime, however, a breathless Brazil delivered a catastrophic double courtesy of Careca in a second 2-1 victory in as many games for the Brazilians. It meant a World Cup final, a first since 1970 in the days of Pele, and they scored twice yet again, helping Careca steal the golden boot away from one Gary Lineker. The two goals weren't enough. Argentina netted three and waltzed off with the World Cup trophy in the only Super Classico World Cup final. Careca would retain his place for Italia 90, grab two goals and Brazil would make the final again, but they no longer tugged on the heartstrings and no longer played that exciting brand of football. This was a world of 1-0 wins against Argentina, Yugoslavia and Italy. A successive World Cup final, but another World Cup final without success. West Germany winning 1-0 in Rome. Nigeria are one of the most important African footballing nations. They are only dwarfed by Cameroon in their World Cup appearances 7-6 because Cameroon had a generation's head start with the likes of Roger Miller in the 1980s and early 90s. Nigeria, aside from a blip in 2006, have qualified for every World Cup since 1994. A special time for Nigeria as they won Olympic gold in 1996 and a star-studded lineup led them to the last 16 of both the 1994 and 1998 World Cups. At the time of publication, Nigeria are one of two African teams to appear in multiple World Cup knockout phases, a feat repeated by Ghana in 2010. Across this week, as we continue to look at African football throughout the AFCON tournament, we'll be looking at three incidents from the not-too-distant past in Nigerian football to see if we can change anything. 
First, what if Yakubu didn't miss the open goal in a crucial 2010 World Cup group stage match with South Korea? Then, what if Nigeria held on to draw with Argentina and qualify for the knockout phase of the 2018 World Cup? And finally, what if Nigeria didn't break the streak and qualified for the 2006 World Cup? Argentina's three-goal capitulation against Croatia had thrown the cat firmly amongst the pigeons, but so too had Nigeria's win in Volgograd a day later against Iceland. Iceland were earmarked as potential dark horses after their performance at Euro 2016, but a double from Ahmed Musa put pay to that. Four days later, Nigeria lined up in St. Petersburg against a wounded Argentine side who needed a win to simply stay alive, whilst a draw for Nigeria would do the job. As Iceland were toiling in a 1-1 draw against Croatia, Nigeria were performing likewise, Lionel Messi's sublime opener cancelled out by Victor Moses' penalty. As the camera incessantly cut to Diego Maradona looking bereft in the stands, Nigeria were holding out on the pitch. Less could be said of Iceland, who fell to a late Ivan Perisic winner, Croatia were already top of the group and couldn't be caught. Nigeria, unlike Iceland, survived the stoppage time, as the closest the Argentines came was through a wild Marcus Rojo volley, which ballooned into the stands. Nigeria were through, but as in 1998, when they were eliminated at the hands of the Laudrups and Denmark, they were barreled out in Kazan, shipping four goals courtesy of Antoine Griezmann, Kylian Mbappe, and a stupendous Benjamin Pavard favoured volley. The 4-1 defeat had Nigeria smarting, but they had only 12 months to rue the defeat, with AFCON just around the corner. Three wins from three and a victory over Madagascar in Alexandria confirmed Nigeria's place in the last 16. Sam Chukwueze's goals sent Nigeria through against the Democratic Republic of Congo in the last 16, as Madagascar faltered against Cameroon. Odion Igalo hit a brace in a 2-1 win over Tunisia in Cairo. Meanwhile, Cameroon battled through one more obstacle the previous day in a penalty shootout win over South Africa. The AFCON of 2019 boiled down to Nigeria against Senegal and Algeria up against Cameroon. Riyad Mahrez would be the hero in stoppage time for Algeria, whilst Nigeria took Senegal to the depths of extra time where a penalty settled the game. Odion Igalo's calm conversion in green to confirm an eighth AFCON final for the Super Eagles. Igalo, already on course for the Golden Boot, added one more to make it six in a KG 1-0 win over Algeria in the final, tying Ghana on four AFCON titles. It was Ghana who Nigeria surpassed to make a 7th World Cup in 2022, a World Cup which granted a chance at revenge for Argentina in the opener in Alcor. A misfiring lane on Messi and a Nigeria pinned back in their own half made for a terrible 0-0 draw, but one that Nigeria didn't complain about one bit. Next in Doha, Mexico, a hugely important game considering that Mexico and Japan had similarly stifled in the baking Qatari heat in a 1-1 draw. This match was no different, Trustacon's header from a corner was cancelled out by a late Chucky Lozano counter-attacking goal. Argentina had eliminated Mexico in the World Cups of 1930, 2006 and 2010, with Nigeria meeting Japan in Lusail, a fourth loss from four would end Mexico's long-standing record of making the last 16. Lionel Messi netted three, Argentina confirmed top spot, and the door swung open for one of the Super Eagles or the Rising Sun to join them. One goal was all that was needed, one goal is all that it was, scored courtesy of Victor Osimhen, beautifully curling an effort low down to the keeper's right. Nigeria had been simmering with their five points from the group stages, as others in the shape of the Netherlands, France and Belgium all collapsed to shocking group stage exits. Suddenly a path had opened out in a kind quarter of the draw for the Super Eagles. Many were quietly confident against Switzerland in the last 16 in Al Ryan. The nation that often qualifies but doesn't do much continued that trend as Victor Osimhen finally kicked on into a higher gear. The Napoli forward netted his second and third goals of the tournament to confirm Nigeria's first World Cup quarter final against an Ecuador side in a similar position. As Ecuador were busy making the last 16 in 2006, Nigeria were forced to watch from home for the only time since 1990. Osimhen netted two more to have him in the golden boot stakes alongside Harry Kane, Lionel Messi and Gianluca Lapadula. In the final four, however, 
is where Nigeria's race was run. Lucas Paqueta, Gabriel Barbosa and Richarlison in a 3-1 win for the eventual winners, Brazil. Nigeria are one of the most important African footballing nations. They are only dwarfed by Cameroon in their World Cup appearances, 7-6, because Cameroon had a generation's head start with the likes of Roger Miller in the 1980s and early 90s. Nigeria, aside from a blip in 2006, have qualified for every World Cup since 1994. A special time for Nigeria as they won Olympic gold in 1996 and a star-studded lineup led them to the last 16 of both the 1994 and 1998 World Cups. At the time of publication, Nigeria are one of two African teams to appear in multiple World Cup knockout phases, a feat repeated by Ghana in 2010. Across this week, as we continue to look at African football throughout the AFCON tournament, we'll be looking at three incidents from the not too distant past in Nigerian football to see if we can change anything. First, what if Yakubu didn't miss the open goal in a crucial 2010 World Cup group stage match with South Korea? Then, what if Nigeria held on to draw with Argentina and qualify for the knockout phase of the 2018 World Cup? And finally, what if Nigeria didn't break the streak and qualified for the 2006 World Cup? A 1-0 victory in June 2005 over Angola left Nigeria needing just one more victory in September to confirm a place at fourth successive World Cup. Obafemi Martins obliged, rattling in three in Algeria in a 5-2 win that ensured the Super Eagles would be playing at a World Cup once again. FIFA's peculiar regional system for the draw ensured Nigeria would be placed in one of the tougher groups with Mexico, Portugal and Iran. Portugal were the favourites to progress and in Cologne on match day one is where the Super Eagles met them. The Europeans threatened early on but hadn't got into the groove of tournament football, leaving with a toothless 0-0 draw. Nigeria took confidence from that into the game that truly mattered, Mexico in Hanover. A win with Iran to come would be great for their chances of last 16 football as Portugal confirmed top spot before the final day with a 2-0 win over Iran. For Nigeria, it was another stalemate. Two games, two nil-nils. Whilst the Super Eagles entered the final game in third place, they were favourites to progress as Mexico met Portugal in Gelsenkirchen. Nigerians in Leipzig listened to a frantic opening half hour in the West as Portugal claimed a 2-1 win over the Mexicans as halftime drew in. Halftime and another nil-nil on the cards. No team in World Cup history had ever drawn three of their group games nil-nil before and thankfully for Nigeria, none would in Germany in 2006. JJ Okocha with the bit of trickery needed to unlock a sturdy Iranian defence halfway through the second period. Then, sent on shortly after, a young Obafemi Martins blitzed Iran not once but twice to confirm a 3-0 win and a place in the last 16. It meant a prolonged stay in Leipzig finishing second and it meant a tougher last 16 draw. Argentina as opposed to the Netherlands, two extremely tough matches regardless. Where Nigeria had previously been profligate in front of goal, they suddenly were imbued by African support in Leipzig, Joseph Yobo heading in inside six minutes. Nigeria were, like Switzerland, a team who had yet to concede at the tournament. While Switzerland bowed out on penalties still holding that record, Nigeria continued on holding Argentina at bay, despite the talents of Riquelme, Saviola, Crespo, Maxi Rodriguez, then Aymar, Tevez and Messi brought on from the bench. Nigeria held firm, winning 1-0 and Jose Peckerman was sacked as Argentina manager, with an emphasis placed on the small involvements made by Carlos Tevez and Lionel Messi for his sacking. Nigeria therefore had emulated Cameroon and Senegal before them in reaching the quarterfinals of a World Cup. In those particular instances, England and Turkey stood in their way, but both needed extra time to win out. Nigeria faced European opposition like their predecessors and they faced 120 minutes like their predecessors. The host Germany were next in Berlin, hosts imbued by belief and the backing of their home crowd after overcoming such teams as Sweden, Poland, Ecuador and Costa Rica. Meanwhile, Nigeria had overcome far more in adversity. Three teams considered either frontrunners or dark horses, Mexico, Portugal and Argentina. They hadn't conceded either. Once more, they went ahead against huge opposition, this time early on in the second half through a set piece once more. 
John Obi Mikel rising highest in the box in Berlin. Germany now had a job on to take the semi-final spot away from Nigeria, away from Africa. Time ebbed away but the likes of Lukas Podolski, Bastian Schweinsteiger and Michael Balak couldn't find the net. But then 10 minutes from time, Miroslav Klose was found on the back post, peeling away from Joseph Yobo, a header into the ground and Nigeria finally conceded. Germany threw everything at the final 10 minutes, Oliver Novell came on but Nigeria would not be defeated in spite of the emotion within the stadium. Fatigue and the teams that they had conquered on the way to such an event did, however. Novell and Lukas Podolski both scored early on in extra time, confirming a 3-1 win for Germany as they made yet another semi-final, whilst Africa still waits for their first. It was one of the most feistiest contests in the history of World Cup qualification and arguably one of the most dramatic too. After five group games of 2010 World Cup qualification, it came down to Algeria and Egypt in Cairo. Algeria had 13 points, Egypt had 10, and the home side needed a three goal win to qualify for their first World Cup since 1990. Meanwhile, Algeria hadn't appeared on the world stage since 1986. The first contest between the two passed without incident, as tensions were eased despite Algeria's 3-1 win in Bilda. Through the pair's wins over Rwanda and Zambia, it boiled down to one evening in Cairo. The drama started days prior, with Algeria's coach attacked on the way to their hotel. Desperate measures were made to cool the build-up, but it made little difference. Amir Zaki got Egypt off to a flyer three minutes in, but as tensions rose in the stands and 32 supporters were injured, the clock ticked down. Dramatically, Egypt scored a second to win 2-0. With the head-to-head -head goal difference and both goals scored and conceded tied, we were bound for a third meeting, a playoff in Sudan. Algeria won out 1-0 but there was controversy considering that Egypt ought to have qualified from the groups automatically considering their head-to-head -head away goals advantage, a tiebreaker that was used both before and after but not, weirdly enough, the 2010 World Cup. Algeria would crash out of the groups and finally made their knockout stage appearance in 2014. Meanwhile, Egypt has still yet to win a World Cup match, despite returning to the world stage in 2018. Egypt squeezed through into the World Cup, the first ever World Cup on African soil, thanks to Kamil Gilas's wild penalty that was blazed into the Sudanese skies. We all agreed to re-adopt the away goals head-to-head -head record in future and Egypt were drawn England, Slovenia and the United States. Some even claimed it was winnable. Egypt were Africa's primary team, if you had considered the amount of AFCON titles that they had won. They prepared for their first World Cup in a generation by winning a record 7th continental title, their third in a row, with a late 1-0 win over Ghana. Perfect preparation. Their previous World Cup match had been a turgid 1-0 defeat to a poor England in Cagliari in 1990. Their next was a similarly turgid game in Polokwane, a 0-0 where they failed to score beyond Samir Handanovic in the Slovenian net. Five days later they travelled to Cape Town where, via Gedo and some alleged witchcraft on one goal, England toiled to a stunning defeat. Egypt led Group C prior to Pretoria's final group match with the United States. A point was all that was needed to qualify for the last 16. As England struggled to a 1-0 win over Slovenia in Port Elizabeth to dredge themselves up to four points, it was only Egypt's exploits in holding USA to a 0-0 draw that was keeping them in the tournament. England's game had finished in the south. The 1-0 scoreline couldn't overhaul Egypt on goal difference, unless, that is, USA scored three without reply in stoppage time. In the end, they couldn't manage one, and somehow, Egypt topped the group on five points. England and Egypt stewed for the remainder of the day, casting their attention to Johannesburg and Nels Pruitt respectively, to victories for Germany on Australia, which generated two of the bigger last 16 ties that summer. While Spain vs Portugal and Brazil vs Chile might have contained more quality, there was no doubt that England vs Germany was the marquee contest. Alternatively, Egypt would head north to Rustenburg for the World Cup's first All-African match. Fittingly, it was between the two best African nations of the time, if the most recent AFCON final is to be believed. Egypt didn't concede in that particular match, they wouldn't concede in this contest either, as their third match of a World Cup finished 0-0. To penalties and via John Mensah's wild spot kick over the bar, Egypt received the blessing from the majority of Africa to go and win the World Cup. 
The next obstacle was the second best defensive team in the tournament, Uruguay, who had only shipped one goal. They did themselves a world of good in Johannesburg after Diego Forlan funded in a goal in the pale blue. However, this was merely an equaliser after Gedo nodded in his and Egypt's second goal of the tournament. Egypt were headed to a second penalty shootout, but were left feeling aggrieved on 120 minutes when Luis Suarez's handball deprived them of a semi-final berth. Fernando Muslera was equal to the penalty and Uruguay were reprieved. Of the first nine penalties in the shootout, only Maxi Pereira had failed to convert, which left the onus down to one man with the final kick. Mohamed Zidane, much like his namesake, four years prior in the final, gently lifted the ball onto the underside of the crossbar and over the line. Egypt had made a World Cup semi-final. Africa had made a World Cup semi-final. Waiting for them in Cape Town, the scene of Egypt's win over England was a Dutch team who knew how to win ugly. Paradoxically, Gio van Bronckhorst scored the most beautiful goal of the tournament, but the game soon devolved into Egypt's timid pushing for an equaliser and the Netherlands settling for a 1-0 win. Egypt would surrender bronze four days later to a youthful German side, but regardless, it was the most successful African performance at Africa's only World Cup. By the turn of the century, it could be argued that Morocco were amongst the most consistent African footballing team. Alongside Cameroon and Nigeria, they had qualified for the final World Cup tournaments of the 20th century, and only Cameroon could match their appearances at the showpiece event, with four tournaments apiece. However, since their last World Cup appearance in 1998, they had collapsed to two group stage exits in the first AFCON tournaments of the 2000s. In 2000, they were nine minutes away from the quarter-finals before Julia Zaga Howard's goal for Nigeria ensured Morocco were eliminated on goals scored in favour of Tunisia. In 2002, they needed a point against South Africa but were resoundingly beaten 3-1. However, this needn't be terminal to their AFCON hopes given that Ghana needed to beat Burkina Faso and were 1-0 down in stoppage time. Miraculously, Ghana contrived to win thanks to an Isaac Baki double Solskjaer style in injury time. Morocco were out five months after bowing out of the World Cup in the qualifiers. Needing a point to qualify for the World Cup in their penultimate match in Dakar, Morocco fell to an El Hajj Juf sickener. However, they could still qualify. They needed Namibia, who had gained two points from seven games, half of which came in a 0 0 draw against Morocco, to get something from Senegal. They were thrashed 5-0 and Morocco would have to wait until 2018 to play another World Cup. 90 minutes passed by in Dakar. Morocco couldn't score but crucially neither could Senegal. Morocco were confirmed to be participating in a third World Cup in succession. Across the previous World Cups, Morocco had only been able to defeat Scotland and weren't able to replicate their knockout phase appearance of 1986. In 2002, they were pitted into a difficult group, many predicting that the same fate would befall them in the Far East against former champions Uruguay, holders France and Denmark, joining them in Group A. About 9pm local time, John Motson could be heard screaming on the BBC feed that Josef Chipo was there. Morocco had led France in the opening game of the World Cup and for the remainder of the match, the Africans held on to claim a famous victory. In the same ilk of Cameroon against Argentina in 1990 and Algeria against West Germany in 1982, the African side had defeated the mammoth opponent to kick off a World Cup. Next were a very good Danish team who led early on through John Dahl Thomason from the spot. Morocco couldn't reply but owing to both France and Uruguay's failures to score past one another in Busan and Denmark's thrilling 2-0 win over France on match day 3, Morocco needed just a point against Uruguay to qualify. Adil Ramsey bagged two goals for the Moroccans and a 2-2 draw was acquired in Su-1. Morocco marched on, meeting Sweden in the last 16 as Denmark perished against the English at the very same stage. Sweden were considered potential dark horses, topping the group of death featuring Argentina, England and Nigeria. But in Aita they suffered from stage fright. They were toothless in front of goal and Ramsey added to his World Cup tally towards the end of the first half, a tally that would not be equalled. Morocco had seen the 86 effort and they had raised it, they were quarter-finalists. 
They had two days rest on their quarter-final opponents, expectant of an away contest in Osaka against Japan, but for Umit Deval as winner for Turkey. Irrespective of the rest, Morocco started sluggish against the Europeans, potentially suffering from stage fright of their own. Morocco vs Turkey was hardly the headline act from the round nor a show stealer, but buoyed by South Korea's efforts in making the final four earlier on in the day, Morocco's second half performance was one to behold. Yusuf Chippo netted his second of the tournament at the death, killing Turkey's World Cup dreams on 87 minutes. Morocco's reward was the ever imperious Brazil in the semi-final of Saitama, with Germany awaiting in the final. A Ronaldo hat-trick later and Morocco was sufficiently defeated. In the end it was glorious failure as Rashid Ben Mahmoud helped Morocco not only win bronze against co-host South Korea but he also netted the quickest World Cup goal ever inside 10 seconds. The North Africans would be successful two years on destroying all competition at AFCON in neighbouring Tunisia. Nigeria and South Africa were both beaten in a potential group of death before Algeria and Mali fell comprehensively in the knockouts. Yusuf Hadji's free kick levelled things up in Tunis before Marouane Shamak scored his third and fourth of the tournament in a 3-2 win for Morocco's second AFCON. Wouldn't you just know it, Tunisia were the final opponents in qualifying for the World Cup in 2006 too, in the same stadium in Tunis as well. After nine matches, the countries could be barely split. Tunisia on 20 points, Morocco on 19. The Atlas Lions therefore needed a win similar to that 18 months prior in AFCON. Marouane Shamak was on the score sheet again this time, three minutes in. The ball was deep in Tunisia's court. Morocco held firm and Talal El Kakori's goal late on in the first half secured World Cup football for 2006. Munich, June 14th, Shamak's hat-trick against Saudi Arabia in a 3-1 win resonated not only with North Africa but also in Eastern Europe as Ukraine 4-0 losers against Spain were tasked with rebounding to get their goal difference back on track. As Morocco lost late on in Spain, Ukraine claimed back their goal difference, winning 4-0 against Saudi Arabia. With a superior goal difference to the tune of 1, Morocco could sit back and play for the draw in the final game against Ukraine in Berlin. 90 minutes of the drabbest football you're ever likely to watch transpired and after zero goals, Morocco confirmed another spot in the last 16, this time to play Switzerland and 120 minutes of the drabbest football you're ever likely to watch transpired and after zero goals, Morocco won a spot in the quarterfinals yet again, courtesy of the penalty spot. However, they would fall foul to the eventual champions, Italy. And with that, Morocco retired from World Cup football until 2018. Ronaldo Luiz Nazario de Lima, El Phenomeno, R9, and for a while, the best footballer on the planet. The Brazilian made the leap from South America to Europe in the summer of 1994 after winning the World Cup in the United States, albeit being unused throughout the tournament. In between the World Cups in America and France, Ronaldo netted 145 goals from 153 games in European club football, as he spent two years at PSV, a year at Barcelona and began his first year at Inter Milan. He was simply unstoppable. Ronaldo had won cup competitions in both the Netherlands and Spain, as well as the UEFA Cup for Inter Milan and the Cup Winners' Cup with Barcelona. Brazil were earmarked as a firm favourites going into the World Cup in 1998. Such was Brazil's quality that even Romário didn't make the squad, but with the likes of Roberto Carlos, Rivaldo, Cafu, Emerson, Danielson, Bebeto, Dunga and Claudio Tafarel, Brazil were expected to make the final with ease. They were drawn a relatively easy group featuring Morocco, Norway and Scotland. Ronaldo, 21 with a whopping 37 caps prior to the tournament, netted three times prior to the final, once in the group stage against Morocco and twice in a win over Chile in the round of 16. The host France would join him in the final at the Stade de France. The fact remained, despite a strong team containing Barthez, Leboeuf, Turam, Zidane, Jokaev, Desai and Deschamps, that Brazil were still the favourites. The world settled down on the evening of July 12, 1998, to watch the final of the 1998 World Cup and we instantly met with a shock. Ronaldo was not in the squad, Edmundo was in. For roughly half an hour, chaos surrounded the press box in Paris until a second Brazilian team sheet was distributed amongst the journalists in attendance. Ronaldo was back in. The match proceeded with Ronaldo up top and Bebeto and Ronaldo barely got a kick in the entire game. The match belonged to Zinedine Zidane, who headed in from two corners in a 3-0 win. France had won their first World Cup, Brazil and Ronaldo were thwarted. Conspiracy theories banded about afterwards included Nike pressured Brazil to field an unfit Ronaldo up front. 
That turned out to be untrue, as per Ronaldo's roommate Roberto Carlos, who stated that Ronaldo had suffered a seizure on the day of the final. Ronaldo eventually played amid fears from Carlos that he would die on the pitch. He didn't die and would play out the remainder of his career with Brazil until 2006 with an honorary appearance in 2011. Ronaldo would finish his career with stints at Real Madrid, AC Milan and Corinthians before retiring in 2011. Injury plagued Ronaldo's career. He played just 52 club games between the final against France in 1998 and the 2002 World Cup in Japan and South Korea. A ruptured knee ligament that was constantly aggravated kept Ronaldo out for the entirety of the 2000-2001 season. He would be a part of the 1999 Copa America winning Brazil team and the 2002 World Cup winning side where he won the golden boot with 8 goals. Still with his illustrious career, Ronaldo remains one of the greatest footballers to play in Europe but to never win the European Cup alongside Diego Maradona. But let's slide the doors open, gauge the effect of the butterfly and rewrite the football in history books. Here's what would have happened if... Ronaldo didn't have a seizure before the 1998 World Cup final. Ronaldo took to the Stade de France field just like any other game. The world was prepared for Ronaldo vs Zidane. Brazil vs France. Five minutes in, Ronaldo got the run on Frank Leboeuf and powered past the centre half. He slid a shot underneath Fabian Bartes to put Brazil into an early lead. Zidane would head in on 27 minutes and again in first half stoppage time. France won their first World Cup in the backyard with a 2-1 win over the favourites. Ronaldo returned to Italy for his second season at Inter Milan and dragged the Nerazzurri to third place in Serie A. The Brazilian hit 41 goals from 48 games in all competitions as Inter bowed out at the Champions League quarter-final stage to treble win in Manchester United. Ronaldo clinched his second trophy at Inter with the Coppa Italia in a 4-2 aggregate win over Fiorentina. Off the back of a golden boot in Serie A, Ronaldo played his third international tournament in three years with a 1999 Copa America. He struck seven goals in six games as Brazil romped to the title, coupled with another golden boot. Ronaldo continued into the new millennium, showing no signs of stopping for both club and country. Another 56 goals in the following season netted Inter finals in the Copa and the Champions League. They were pipped to the Serie A title by a single point from Lazio but gained revenge in a 3-2 aggregate win in the Copa final. Real Madrid were reported to be caught in Ronaldo ahead of the 2000 Champions League final, where Ronaldo lined up in the black and blue of Inter against the all-white of Real Madrid. Ronaldo struck early on in the final, but as in Paris two years previously, his team would lose 2-1, another final lost. And in that summer, Real Madrid broke the world transfer fee record to bring Ronaldo to the Bernabeu. He would begin the 2000-2001 season alongside other signings Luis Figo and Claude Makélélé. Real were in the process of building a team of Galacticos, Ronaldo's strike partner, for example, switched between Raul and Fernando Morientes. Luis Figo, Roberto Carlos, Ike Casillas, Fernando Hierro, Michel Salgado, Claude Makélélé and even Steve McManaman were amongst Real Madrid's starting eleven. Ronaldo hit 31 goals in La Liga, stealing the Pachichi from teammate Raul by two goals as he hit a hat-trick in a 5-1 win over Valladolid on the final match day. A 14-point lead would be the damage in La Liga to Deportivo La Coruña in second, Real embarrassed Valencia 3-0 in the 2001 Champions League final. The potential treble was destroyed by Real's Aragoffa of all teams. Real succumbed to a 2-1 aggregate defeat in the semi-finals of the Copa del Rey. Ronaldo's sights were firmly set on the World Cup in Japan and South Korea in 2002. Brazil had gone undefeated in qualification, they had won the 2001 Copa America thanks to 9 goals in 6 games from Ronaldo. For his club, the much sought after treble was clinched thanks to the signing of Zinedine Zidane from Juventus. In the 2001-02 season, Ronaldo hit over a goal a game. Real won the league by 19 points, they defeated Deportivo in the Copa del Rey final and Leverkusen were thrashed in Glasgow. Ronaldo got two goals in each final. Brazil with the emerging stars of Ronaldinho, Lucio and Kaka, as well as the talent from the previous World Cups, were made odds on favourite in the Far East by some bookmakers. Those bookmakers were proved right inside the group stages. Ronaldo had notched two hat-tricks and scored eight of Brazil's 15 group stage goals in wins over Turkey, China and Costa Rica. Ronaldo had the golden boot wrapped up, and with the knockout stage goals over Belgium, England and Turkey, Ronaldo became the World Cup's all-time goalscorer. He netted twice in the final against Germany, in what was lambasted as being a foregone conclusion, with Michael Ballack ruled out for Germany through suspension. The World Cup winner's medal in 2002 might have been Ronaldo's second by definition, but it was his first World Cup won by Brazil that he had played him. It was the pinnacle of his career. But it wouldn't stop there. Two more Copa Americas in 2004 and 2007, and two more UEFA Champions Leagues and three more La Liga titles followed for Ronaldo. He would become La Liga's record goalscorer with 386 goals, his goal record only dwarfed by Lionel Messi. 
Ronaldo returned for a year at Corinthians in 2012 and remains Brazil's all-time high goal scorer on 82 goals, 5 ahead of Pele. Let's take it to the winners and losers. Brazil, winners, because Ronaldo led them to 5 successive Copa Americas as well as 2 World Cups. FC Porto, because the 2004 Champions League was wrestled away from them by a Ronaldo hat-trick in the final at Gelsenkirchen. Valencia, losers, because their long wait for a La Liga title since 1970 continues due to Real Madrid's five successive Liga wins. Real Madrid and Ronaldo, because Ledesma was achieved in Glasgow against Bayer Leverkusen in 2002. Burkina Faso are in an exclusive group of African nations like Mali, Guinea and Capo Verde who are amongst the best in Africa yet have failed to qualify for the World Cup. With the World Cup expanding to 48 teams in 2026 allowing for 9 African participants as opposed to the current 5, the aforementioned team's qualification for the biggest football tournament in world football seems only a matter of time. Heading into qualification for the 2014 World Cup, Burkina Faso were ranked 39th in the world, 4th highest in Africa. By that metric alone they were expected to qualify for the tournament. Owing to their advantageous seeding, Burkina Faso were able to qualify for the final phase ahead of Congo, Gabon and Nigeria. However, by September 2013, their world ranking had plummeted to 51st, crucially the 7th highest of the 10 teams that had qualified for the final playoff phase of African qualifying. It left Burkina Faso unseeded, and they were paired off with Algeria, a nation who ended their 24-year exile at the World Cup in the 2010 tournament. That January, Algeria bounced out of the AFCON tournament with just one point to their name, bottom of a group containing Ivory Coast, Togo and Tunisia. Meanwhile, Burkina Faso remained undefeated amidst the challenges of Nigeria, Zambia and Ethiopia and topped their group before they eliminated Togo and Ghana to make their only AFCON final. Regardless of the 1-0 loss, Burkina Faso then could be considered favourites against Algeria who hadn't made it beyond AFCON's quarter-final since 1990 and failed to qualify for the three of the past five tournaments. And after a 3-2 win in the first leg in Ouagadougou, Ariste Bansé scored the winner. Les Etalons were confident of a first ever qualification for the World Cup. Unfortunately, Majid Bouguera scored the only goal of the reverse fixture for Algeria. A player Burkina Faso complained was ineligible. FIFA threw out the complaint, Algeria qualified on away goals and eventually reached the last 16 of the main tournament, taking eventual champions Germany to extra time. For Didier Drogba and the Torre brothers, there was Yusuf Fafana, Joel Tehi and Abdoulaye Traore. All three combined to score in their first game of the 1992 AFCON, a 3-0 win over Algeria. A subsequent 0-0 draw over Congo sealed Ivory Coast's place in the knockout phase of the tournament where they would not concede a single goal and have to effectively play four games worth of football inside three. Zambia were only swatted aside in extra time whilst Ghana and Cameroon were beaten in the latter stages on penalties as Ivory Coast won their very first AFCOM. They went close to repeating that feat two years on but were defeated by eventual champions Nigeria on penalties. Six months prior to the finals, Nigeria were the sticking point again as they ran in four goals in a September 1993 qualifier in Lagos. Ivory Coast had to stew for a further month, still top of their qualification group but safe in the knowledge that Nigeria only needed a point in Algiers to qualify. They did so and Ivory Coast would have to wait until 2005 when they pipped both Cameroon and Egypt in a hotly contested group to qualify for their first ever World Cup. Fenidi George's goal isn't enough as Algeria running two goals at the death in Algiers to leave Nigeria a point behind Ivory Coast, who in turn joined Morocco and Cameroon on the plane to the United States. Whilst their African counterparts had history in the World Cup both making the knockout phase, Ivory Coast were debutants. They didn't play like them, however. After prevailing at the AFCON once again, courtesy of penalty shootouts against Nigeria and Zambia, just like in 1992, Les Elephants arrived in Dallas full of confidence. Argentina were a team to be feared and were successful in their own continent, whilst Bulgaria and Greece were seen as winnable fixtures. 
Bulgaria in spite of the talented Emil Konstadinov, Haristos Deutschkov and Jordan Lechkov were found wanting in defence. Yusuf Fafana sprung the offside trap halfway through the first half and fed Abdullahi Traore for the game's only goal. Ivory Coast realistically now needed just one more point from what turned out to be Diego Maradona's final international match. It was Claudio Canigia, not Maradona though, that the Ivory Coast ought to have been worried about as the forward netted both Argentine goals in a 2-0 win. A return to Foxborough five days later to meet Greece represented a very real opportunity to top the group, especially after Bulgaria had won their follow-up games by a scoreline of six goals to nil. However, it was exactly that amount of goals that stopped Ivory Coast from topping the group, as two from Yusuf Fafana had them through in second place, in between Bulgaria and Argentina. Finishing second meant Ivory Coast were last on the bill in the last 16 and watched both Bulgaria and Argentina crash out to Italy and Romania respectively. Ivory Coast alternatively met Mexico at Giant Stadium with a potential prize of the world champions Germany five days later. The first major setback beset the Ivory Coast 18 minutes in when Mexico won a penalty for handball. However, Alain Guamene was equal to it, and he was equal to two more some two hours later when a drab last 16 contest finished nil-nil. Thankfully, a third spot kick from the Mexicans was blazed over, and Ivory Coast had booked themselves into a quarter-final of the World Cup, following on from the footsteps of Cameroon some four years prior. Next were the champions, Germany, and after a goalless first half, some Ivorians in attendance in New Jersey began to believe that they might just be the first African side to reach the semi-finals. Within two minutes of the second half, however, those hopes were dashed after Germany won a penalty. Whilst Alan Gomene had quite the perfect penalty record over the previous two years, this was Germany, this was Lothar Matthäus. The captain didn't miss and Germany just about squeaked through to the semi-final where they were savaged by Roberto Baggio and Italy. What was once Nigeria had become South Africa by the mid to late 1990s as the team that were routinely the ones Ivory Coast had to beat in order to become successful. Les Elephants made a third AFCON final in succession in 1996 but with the backing of a home crowd in Johannesburg, Mark Williams scored the only goal of the game to secure the Bafana Bafana, their first AFCON title. August 1997, Ivory Coast travelled to the same stadium in search of a point to qualify for the World Cup in France. An extraordinary defensive performance, a 0-0 draw, confirms Ivory Coast's second World Cup, but this one was not going to be as easy. First of all, because of the expansion from 24 to 32 teams, they had to finish within the top two of the group to qualify. If the draw pairing them with host France and a much fancied Denmark didn't put the nail in the coffin, then a 3-0 defeat to the hosts in Marseille ought to have. However, Ivory Coast rallied back with another famous 0-0 draw, this time in Toulouse against Denmark. As Denmark battled to lose just 2-1 to France in Lyon, Ivory Coast couldn't confirm the requisite five-goal win over Saudi Arabia to confirm a place in the last 16, in the end winning just 4-2. With that, Ivory Coast's first golden age was over. The transition to an even more talented squad in the 2000s was rough and Les Elephants wouldn't make it to South Korea and Japan in 2002 and bowed out in successive AFCON quarterfinals. Senegal had only previously got to the final stage of African qualification for the World Cup in 1994. They came up against the Chipolo Polo of Zambia and Morocco, the latter eventually qualifying. That proved a false start as three AFCON knockout stage appearances lapsed into two failures to qualify in 1996 and 1998. Until finally, the explosion of Senegalese football came in 2002. With now manager Aliou Cissé Marshall in the defence, Papa Bouba Diop a destroyer in midfield next to Salif Jao, as well as attacking talents such as Henry Kamara and El Hadj Jouf, Senegal bettered their previous best at the AFCOM. Only twice before had Senegal made the top four of the Africa Cup of Nations. Tunisia had won their group in 1965 by the toss of a coin to qualify for the final, whilst Algeria defeated them in the 1990 AFCON semi-final. 
Senegal were immaculate, not conceding until the semi-final stage where they defeated a Nigeria side so strong that they were deemed to be part of a group of death at the upcoming World Cup. And speaking of the 2002 World Cup, Senegal would be lining up for their first on the world stage and famously dispatched holders France in the very first game. But that alongside an AFCON final defeat to Cameroon came to haunt the Lions of Taranga, rather than push them over the line. Only now are Senegal returning to prominence after qualifying for a second World Cup in 2018 and reaching another AFCON final in 2019. Senegal were just two points off qualifying for the 2006 World Cup, missing out to Togo by the virtue of taking just one point off their rivals in qualification. Would their golden age have continued with qualification into the 2010s? Senegal leads to a 3-0 win at home to Mali in the knowledge that it might not be enough. Ears were pinned to Brazzaville for updates between Congo and Togo. Henry Kamara's second had come after news filtered through regarding Togo's equaliser through Mohamed Kader in Congo. Togo needed one more goal to get level on points with Senegal, which would mean qualification after Togo had taken a creditable 2-2 draw from Senegal earlier on in qualifying to gain the head-to-head -head advantage. The goal wouldn't come, Togo would miss out on their first finals and Senegal squeak through to their second in succession. To celebrate, Senegal travelled north to Egypt that January and after wins over Zimbabwe and Nigeria, scaled the knockout phase once more, topping the group which confirmed a path via Tunisia and Ivory Coast to the final. Waiting for them in Cairo was Egypt and a second penalty shootout. Mohamed Abu Trika scored the winning penalty for the Egyptians, champions of Africa, but they would be watching Senegal from their sofa. They'd watch Ghana make the knockouts of their first ever World Cup, and Senegal were eager to join them, as opposed to joining the likes of Ivory Coast, Angola and Tunisia, who were all eliminated at the first round. Most of the heroes of 2002 had reached their peak, and the majority of which were playing top 5 European League football. The players who combined in the 2-1 win over South Korea in Frankfurt both plied their trade in the northwest of England, as Abdullahi Fay slipped El Hajju for the opener, and Andy Fay of Newcastle scored the winning goal. An obdurate Switzerland were next in Dortmund, and stereotypically for the Swiss, they wouldn't be beaten, but they were also toothless up front. This left Senegal on four points, with Switzerland and France on two, and South Korea propping up the table on one. So it boiled down to a reunion of old foes, Senegal and France. Switzerland's win over South Korea meant that France needed a win to qualify. With Zinedine Zidane suspended in his final tournament ever, France failed to bail out their teammate, Henry Kamara pegging back Patrick Vieira's opener late on. France were out again, Senegal and Switzerland were split by one goal, with the Africans topping the group. Switzerland bowed out in predictable circumstances to a Spanish side who in turn were eliminated by Brazil on penalties after a drab 0-0 quarter-final. Portugal, however, would be finalists for the first time in a dour 1-0 semi-final win, lighting up the tournament however in the other half of the draw were the Lions of Taranga. Big things were expected of Ukraine, but inside 23 minutes in Cologne, they found themselves 3-1 down after a double from El Hajj Juf. Andrei Shevchenko clawed one back to make for a nervy second half, but Senegal prevailed 3-2 over European opposition in blue and yellow, as they had done four years prior. In 2002, Senegal came unstuck against Turkey via the Golden Goal. No such lottery was at play in Hamburg when they met Italy in a tight affair. Senegal held out in the first half but were eventually unpicked by two goals in quick succession. Luca Toni with the brace. Papa Bouba Diop got a goal late on, mere consolation as Italy wound up winning their fourth World Cup, defeating Portugal in the final courtesy of a sole Marco Materazzi goal. With the retirement of 2002 and 2006's heroes and the next generation of Papi Cissé, Dembaba, Sadio Mane, Idrissa Garnagay and Moussa So, a few years off Senegal suffered. 
They bounced out of the AFCON to Egypt once more in 2008, this time in the quarterfinals, before failing to get out of the groups two years on. That came after Senegal had failed to make the final stage of qualification for South Africa, edged out by Algeria in the second round. Nigeria are one of the most important African footballing nations. They are only dwarfed by Cameroon in their World Cup appearances 7-6 because Cameroon had a generation's head start with the likes of Roger Miller in the 1980s and early 90s. Nigeria, aside from a blip in 2006, have qualified for every World Cup since 1994. A special time for Nigeria as they won Olympic gold in 1996 and a star-studded lineup led them to the last 16 of both the 1994 and 1998 World Cups. At the time of publication, Nigeria are one of two African teams to appear in multiple World Cup knockout phases, a feat repeated by Ghana in 2010. Across this week, as we continue to look at African football throughout the AFCON tournament, we'll be looking at three incidents from the not-too-distant past in Nigerian football to see if we can change anything. First, what if Yakubu didn't miss the open goal in a crucial 2010 World Cup group stage match with South Korea? Then, what if Nigeria held on to draw with Argentina and qualify for the knockout phase of the 2018 World Cup? And finally, what if Nigeria didn't break the streak and qualified for the 2006 World Cup? South Korea had gone 2-1 ahead via a fortuitous free kick. But relentless as the game was, Nigeria found themselves back on level terms shortly afterwards. Yakubu with the freedom of Durban netted the fourth goal in a frantic first hour of football. Moments later, the chance to win the game. Chinedu Obasi was hacked down by Kim Namil and it was Yakubu grabbing the ball and settling it on the penalty spot. The goal would surely kill all Korean confidence to get back into the game. Greece were still holding on against Argentina but were wilting in the final 20 minutes. Regardless, a winner for Nigeria given the pair's goal difference would see the Super Eagles through. Yakubu sent the goalkeeper the wrong way, rolling in his second goal of the tournament. Nigeria won out 3-2 and were headed to the last 16. The prize was opening up the knockout phase in Port Elizabeth against a now much fancied Uruguay. Diego Forlan and Luis Suarez had controlled Group A and more noticeably controlled the Jabalani football as well. Nigeria comparatively squeaked through to the knockout phase. Previously they had lost to Italy and Denmark at this stage and within 8 minutes found themselves picking the ball out of the net from a Luis Suarez goal. Suarez retrieved the ball quickly before Vincent and Yema could get his hands on it for after 8 minutes the scores were tied one goal apiece. Nigeria struck the post with a free kick early on, but it was Obafemi Martins nipping in to pounce on the rebound. Once the game had settled down into this tepid 1-1 scoreline, the second half was shipped by Nigeria's hot start to the second half. Set pieces were a superb avenue for Uruguay, but in the last 16 against Nigeria, they had become a calamity as a poor defensive clearance from a free kick and hesitation from goalkeeper Fernando Muslera allowed Yakubu to head in to make it 2-1 with 20 minutes left on the clock. From there, the heavens opened and Nigeria stuck 10 men behind the ball. Cavani, Forlan, Suarez, it didn't matter. They all had chances, they all missed them. The best of the lot fell to Suarez with 10 minutes to go but his curling effort grazed the outside of the post and Nigeria survived. 2-1 winners, they progressed to Johannesburg. Africa's attention moved from Port Elizabeth in the south to Rustenburg in the north, where another African representative in Ghana met the United States, and through extra time and Asamoah they prevailed, like Nigeria, 2-1. Ghana versus Nigeria, two intense rivals with one winner, although scratch that two winners, as African football was guaranteed a victor, with a first semi-finalist at a World Cup, and what better venue to showcase that fact than in Soccer City in Johannesburg. The game was a nervy nil-nil for the first 55 minutes before finally an explosion of life. A dipping, swerving, Jabulani-esque free kick slipped through the grasp of Ghanaian goalkeeper Richard Kingston. Quickly though, the game devolved into what we all wanted to see, a frantic end-to-end -end festival. 
Sully Ali Muntari hit back almost immediately for Ghana, to which point Obafemi Martins raced clear of John Mensah, prodding in a second with 20 minutes to go. Hammer and tongs, the pair went at it before Asamo Gian, as he did in the previous round, scored a second goal at the death. The game was to go the full 120. There was no handball, no controversy, and after eight penalties separated Ghana and Nigeria in Johannesburg, ultimately the correct team won out. Gian, alongside teammates Stephen Apaya, John Mensah, and Dominic Adeyaya, converted from the spot. Opposite only Yakubu and John Obi Mikel managed to do so in green. Nigeria were out and Ghana were through to a World Cup semi-final. The Netherlands funded themselves ahead through Giovan Bronkost in the semis, but it was a nervous 90 in Cape Down for the Orange, eking out a 2-1 win after Asamo Gian had come up with an equaliser in the first half. Regardless, Ghana will be fondly remembered for the bronze medal in South Africa, and Nigeria too, as one of the only African nations to make the quarterfinals of the World Cup. It was one of the first in the long, illustrious list of glorious failures from the Scottish national football team. The date was June the 18th, 1974, and Scotland lined up against Brazil in Frankfurt, West Germany. Scotland didn't have a bad team either. At the heart of it, their captain in midfield, Billy Bremner. He'd won the lot with Leeds United at club level, but hadn't had chance to play at a World Cup with his national team just yet. They had won their first group match comfortably, 2-0, although this was to be expected against Zaire in Dortmund, Peter Lorimer and Joe Jordan with the first half goals. Next were the world champions Brazil, with a strong Yugoslavia to come in the final group match. The pair had drawn 0-0 in the first match, so a win for Scotland was as good as qualification. Deep into the second half, Peter Lorimer swung in a back post corner onto the head of Joe Jordan, which Emerson Liao in the Brazilian net could only parry, to Billy Bremner five yards out with the net gaping. The ball came too quick for the midfielder and the ball trickled wide. The match would end 0-0. Four days later, Scotland drew with Yugoslavia and the three teams were split by their results against Zaire. Scotland's comfortable 2-0 win had suddenly become insufficient when stacked up against Brazil's 3-0 victory and Yugoslavia's 9-0 hammering. Scotland were out of the groups. They have yet to qualify from an international tournament group stage after 11 attempts. Late on in the second half it came, a scrappy tap-in from Billy Bremner which would end up being the vital goal that is needed for Scotland to hold on to a shock victory over the world champions. Scotland were on course to qualify from the groups for the first time in their history. The final group game with Yugoslavia ends 1-1, a result that eliminates Brazil despite a 3-0 victory over Sayer, as they tumble out of the groups for the first time since 66. Scotland's reward in the semi-final group stage was Poland, Sweden and host West Germany, whoever topped the group after three games would play in the final in Munich. Scotland started miraculously, leading the hosts after just five minutes, however West Germany quickly turned the game on its head to win 2-1. Scotland faced an uphill challenge. That challenge became impossible with a 2-1 defeat to a tough Polish side who, let's not forget, had barred England from playing at the tournament. Scotland signed off with a win over Sweden, another 2-1, as manager Willy Orman stayed on to coax the nation through their 1976 European Championship qualifying group against Spain, Denmark and Romania. To the quarterfinal playoff and, unfortunately, a reunion with West Germany that ends much like in the last encounter, a two-legged defeat. In Orman's final tournament as Scotland manager, he guides the Tartan army to Argentina to face a group featuring Peru, Iran and the Netherlands. Orman's tallies man in South America was Aston Villa's own Andy Gray. He nods in a vital equaliser in a 3-3 draw against Peru before following up with a brace in a 3-1 win over Iran. The Netherlands were next, but it was the Netherlands without Johan Cruyff. Scotland scored three again in a famous 3-2 win thanks to Archie Gemmell's legendary goal. Scotland were the legend killers, first world champions, Brazil now the much fancied Netherlands. The semi-final group phase wouldn't get much more difficult than Poland again, Brazil again and hosts Argentina. Like in 1974, Scotland start off with a demoralising defeat, shipping four goals to Brazil. Like in 1974, they followed that up with Poland and like in 1974, the scoreline was 2-1 but to those in blue, not white this time as Scotland prevailed. Scotland versus Argentina then, with the power in Scotland's hands deciding who would play in the World Cup final. Brazil had beaten Poland 3-1 earlier on in the day, meaning that Argentina needed a huge goal swing to qualify for the final at Brazil's expense. 
cut to the Scottish dressing room in the bowels of the stadium in Rosario pre-match. A shadowy Argentine figure strikes a deal. By half-time, Scotland were faltering to a 2-0 defeat. In Argentine terms, that was halfway to the World Cup final. Mario Kempes, Argentina's hero throughout the tournament, nods in a third. The general public willed in a fourth goal, but Scotland didn't play to the script. With the hosts throwing absolutely everything at them in search for the fourth and vital goal, Scotland broke on the counter. Graham Sooners pumps the ball long into Argentina's half and Kenny Dalglish had one hell of a task on to latch onto the ball before the Argentine goalkeeper, but he did. 30 yards out, Dalglish nipped in ahead of his counterpart with everybody in the attendance well aware of the significance of a potential Scotland goal. The 37,000 stood in gobsmacked awe. Dalglish trots to the goal line and simply rolls the ball into the back of the net with his studs. A muted celebration by the Liverpool man, surrounded by a perimeter of blue and white ticker tape and beyond that, the fans in the audience baying for his blood. This was not supposed to happen, but it did happen. Argentina 3, Scotland 1, and to the final, Brazil, not Argentina. There, Zico was the extra time hero, Brazil finally fulfilling their duties they missed out on four years prior by winning their fourth World Cup in the nation's history. For Scotland a new dawn as Jock Steen led Scotland into the 1980s, a nation hungry for more knockout stage football. We didn't know it then, but it was Yugoslavia's last dance at a major football tournament. They would famously be banned from the European Championships in two years time and would become represented by the former Republic of Yugoslavia at the 1998 World Cup in a last 16 efforts as the nations of Croatia, Serbia, Slovenia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, North Macedonia, Montenegro and Kosovo all splintered away. In 1990, Yugoslavia had one of the finest collection of young players in Europe, boasting the young player of the tournament in Robert Prozineski, as well as Dragan Stojkovic, Dejan Savicevic, Darko Panchev and Robert Jarni. They had beaten Spain in the last 16, Dragan Stojkovic starring, and suddenly Yugoslavia had dreamed for the first time in a decade. The football had not been good for a long time, they had not played a knockout game in the World Cup since 1962 and the last time they won a European Championship match was against England in 1968 as they lost the final. Yugoslavia would take an Argentina team containing the likes of Jorge Burachaga, Claudio Canigia and Diego Maradona to the brink, to penalties. Ultimately though, Argentina would win the match and the shootout. The brief good spirit of Bosnia manager Avicca Osim and the brief respite in Yugoslavia was over. Yugoslavia would dissolve. The bloodbath of the Yugoslav wars that followed barred Yugoslavia's entry into the European Championships in 1992 and into qualification for the 1994 World Cup. Serbia and Montenegro would compete under the Yugoslav banner until 2003, where they reached the last 16 of the 1998 World Cup and the quarterfinal of Euro 2000. In the intervening 21 years, only Croatia have gone beyond the group phase out of the successor states. Serbia and Slovenia, both on three occasions each, as well as Bosnia Herzegovina in 2014 and North Macedonia in 2021, have all fallen at group stages, whilst Montenegro and Kosovo have yet to appear at a major tournament. Back home in the east, the country crumbles, but for a concentrated 15 minute spell on June the 30th, 1990, there was a lull. Everybody had their eyeballs pointed towards their television set. Diego Maradona had just missed his penalty in Florence, which, after the converted kicks from Stojkovic, Prozineski and Savicevic, left Yugoslavia with the advantage. Dragolub Brunovic puts Yugoslavia's fourth kick down the middle, into the net. 4-2 they led. Therefore, when Pedro Troglio's penalty was blazed wide, Yugoslavia had confirmed their place at a World Cup semi-final for the first time in a generation. Next was Naples, next was Italy. Italy's cult hero prodded them ahead inside of a quarter of an hour, Toto Scalacci. Luckily, Yugoslavia had plenty of their own heroes in white. Robert Prozineski, who'd gone to win the best young player at the tournament, killed a sublime effort beyond Walter Zenga and into the bottom corner to level the contest up in the second half. And then came the dreaded penalties. Except Yugoslavia had conquered that fear. 23 million sets of eyeballs were pointed in the direction of Naples amid catastrophe around them back home. Berezi, Baggio and Diagostini placed inch-perfect penalties beyond Tomislav Ivkovic, as did Stojkovic, Prozineski and Savicevic beyond Zenga. But then as the Italian spot kicks faltered, Robert Donadoni and Aldo Serena thwarted by Ivkovic, Robert Gianni strode up to the spot and fired it into the roof of the net. Yugoslavia were going to a World Cup final to play West Germany. 
Three weeks prior, they had met in the Sansir and a West German masterclass saw them thrashed 4-1 in the group stages. This was a Yugoslav side that had matured over the month in Italy, however. They kept a strong backline against an even stronger West German side and limited their opportunities drastically in comparison to the group match. In the end, it was a penalty that sealed the fate of the World Cup. Unfortunately for Yugoslavia, their penalty success ran out at exactly the wrong time. Andy Bremer, five minutes from time, slotted his penalty into the net to crown West Germany, the world champions for a third time. In adversity, Yugoslavia had made their home nation proud, the mood immense back home. The Republic would fall, it was fate, but it fell in about as measured a way as it possibly could have. There wasn't the bloodbaths of the Yugoslav wars to mar what would have been a summer of respite the year prior. There was conflict in Slovenia, Croatia and Bosnia and in Kosovo to come, but to a degree which didn't impinge on what was all set to be another summer of respite for a tired, bedraggled nation. Yugoslavia won all of their qualifiers for the upcoming European Championships to qualify into a group containing France, England and hosts Sweden. This was a Yugoslav team with an abundance of riches up front. Sevilla's Davor Suka joined the likes of Dejan Savicevic, Darko Panchev and Robert Prozineski in the front line. Zanisa Mihailovic patrolled the midfield too. This was a team largely made up of those that conquered Europe the year prior in the European Cup for Red Star Belgrade. They were ready to conquer Europe again. Davos Uka got his campaign underway in Malmo after just three minutes. By half time, a Sanisa Mihailovic trademark free kick had stunned England into submission. Yugoslavia won out 3 0. They'd get a point from Sweden in Stockholm, and in the face of Jean Pierre Papin's opener for France in the final group game, Darko Panchev bagged a double as Yugoslavia topped the group. Winning the group meant a reunion with Germany, now unified. Thomas Hassler opened the scoring up for the Germans in an infinitely more open contest than two years prior. Dejan Savicevic scooped an equaliser over Bodo Ilner and Davos Suka bagged his third goal of the tournament. This was a resilient world champion however and Karl-Heinz Riedel dragged the game to the brink with a German equaliser. Up step, Robert Prozineski, 89 minutes on the clock. Yugoslavia 3, Germany 2. Five days later in Gothenburg, Yugoslavia were reunited with the only team that had stopped them in the tournament so far, Sweden. They would stop them this time too, at least in 90 minutes, but Davos Suka sealed his own personal glory of the golden boot in the final, scoring the winning goal as Yugoslavia became European champions. Yugoslavia took their seat for qualification at the 1994 World Cup, tensions still rising back home, with the fate likely being that this was their final tournament together, as states such as Croatia would enter qualification for Euro 96. Some Croatian players in the Yugoslav lineup were uneasy about representing Yugoslavia by 1994, but all the heroes from 92 lined up for the opening match in Pasadena against Cameroon. Yugoslavia would finish second in the group, like in 1990, behind the eventual winners, this time Brazil. Defeating Sweden and Cameroon in the group before Saudi Arabia and Romania fell in the knockout phase, Yugoslavia were to be reunited with Brazil in the semi-final. And it was Romario who sank them, on the way to Brazil's fourth World Cup. 